most people don't realize how small Park City proper truly is. And our city limits start and stop at the white barn. And they stop here, just right here at, uh, at 40, and then they go up past the montage a bit. So we only have 17 square miles in the city. So it is critical that we work really closely with the county. So Melina, can I take it on there? Yes, I will echo that. Um, we hear all the time from, and I, I would say that Park City would likely agree, of people that live in or kind of the average person. So it's really important that we work together. Um, we've worked together on many land deals through the years. Um, we've worked together on traffic and transportation, um, an assortment of other things, including housing. Um, who here has been to any of our joint meetings that we've been having the last few years? That's great. We started having more regular joint meetings about two years ago. Um, two years ago, we meet at least quarterly so that both of our councils can ensure that we're on the same page surrounding major issues. Um, most of the time, we have been spending on those subjects I mentioned before, in particular on housing and how we can collaborate with some of those issues that are impacting everyone jointly. I often get questions about the composition of our council and how long our terms are. And ours is a bit different than the county's, so we thought this might be a good time to clear up that confusion. The Park City Council has five council members. They all run for four-year terms, and the mayor runs for a four-year term. We're elected separately. There's some councils in the state that choose their own mayor from within the council, but ours is a bit different in that we run independently. There's three council members that run one year. In fact, last year we had three seats on the ballot. And then we have this year off and the county has their elections. And then we will have um, two council seats in my seat on the ballot in the following year. What's that? 25, I guess. So. And one point of confusion with, with municipal elections, um, they're nonpartisan and everyone kind of runs against everyone else as far as the council seats. Um, the county is different where we are partisan, so you have to declare a party when you run for office within the county, um, either Republican, Democrat, or you can run as independent, libertarian, whatever your party association is. Um, because of that, there's an entire party system that comes into play within the elections um, with the caucus and convention parties uh, or convention processes for at least the two major parties to get on the ballot, um, which can instigate a primary. And then um, the primary can have no more than two candidates for each political party versus a municipal election that can have many, um, many different different candidates for that. So within our election this year, every council person has a seat. They're not running, all running against each other like within the county. Um, so this year there are three seats that are up for re-election. And every one of those this year is a contested race. I think from both parties minus one, there's one seat that there are just two Democrats, but the rest of them have both Republican and Democratic candidates currently. Can everyone hear or is it too low? Too low. Too low. Okay. Well, speak up. Speak up. <coughs> I'm not touching it. <laughs> All right, try that. Quite frankly, I prefer the city's system over the county's system. To me, whether or not the roads get plowed or how often they get plowed is not a partisan issue. And so for us to run nonpartisan and at large, so we don't rec uh, represent only one area of the city, I think gives us a broader perspective than, than your system does. But not to be critical here. Yeah, and yeah. just <laughs> and just to be clear, this is um, how the state operates, or, or has um, indicated that counties operate versus cities. So it's not something that the cities have has chosen versus the county. It's it's a statewide system that the counties are must be partisan um, offices, whereas municipalities are considered to be nonpartisan. But I would agree with you that when it comes to what we do daily and what we spend the most time on, which really are things that have to do with health, safety, and welfare for our community, that um, there are issues that there's much more alignment, I would say, cross party in my experience than there is um, conflict. 
Even though we're a small town, Park City proper has about 8,500 residents, and that doesn't fluctuate a lot, hasn't fluctuated a lot over the years. But 70, 70% of our housing stock are second, third, or fourth, or fifth, or whatever homes for people. Even though we have only 8,500 residents, it's not unusual, as those of you that have sat in traffic in Park City know, many times a year our population or the number of people in town swells to 40, 50, 60, sometimes 80,000 people. And so we have to be able to have the infrastructure and the services in place that we can accommodate all of the visitors that are in town as well as our residents. It's a constant um, challenge for our council to protect the um, quality of life for our residents and, and the, the integrity of our neighborhoods as we balance that with our visitors that pay you know, for a tremendous, through their resort sales tax and other taxes, pay for a tremendous amount of the services that we offer. <clears throat> And going along with that, um, I have a unique perspective. I worked for Park City Police Department within Park City Municipal for about a decade. And it's really interesting to that point with traffic in particular for these events, as, as you know, both with our workforce, the influx of workforce daily during the winter in particular, as well as our tourism and days like today. Um, I didn't know that I was going to make it because although I left my house, um, I live in Pinebrook, I left 50 minutes before I needed to be here, um, I was racing in at the last minute because every single off ramp is backed up um, because of the snow that we've had, I'm assuming is a huge factor of that, as well as kind of the daily influx of tourists and workforce. So with that, it's really important that our law enforcement who do traffic mitigation work really closely together. And I will tell you that within this county, there is a lot of collaboration taking place between Park City Police Department, Summit County Sheriff's Office, Utah Highway Patrol, and also our neighbors over in Wasatch County and Heber City. Um, that there is collaboration and um, both a desire and a willingness to work together on both major crimes as well as things like traffic mitigation or special events like Sundance or World Cup or some of these other things that we have. I was really excited this morning when a member of the Wasatch County Council, I'm gonna point him out back there, came and introduced himself to us. He's, he wanted to know more about Park City and how the city operates and the county operates, so he chose to join us. So thank you for doing that this morning. You know, we, we regionally need to work not only with, within Summit County, but within Wasatch County as well. And you're gonna hear some examples of that as we go on today. I do wanna mention uh, building on Molina's comments about our, the police that has to happen in our county. Last October, I had the privilege of going to San Diego as our Park City Police Chief Wade Carpenter was sworn in as the president of the International Association of Police Chiefs. Huge, huge honor, yeah. Um, especially for a town of our size, that he would, he would rise to that level. And by doing that, he has, he has served within that organization for many years and brings back international best practices here so that um, our, our police department is always kind of on the front edge as, as we're moving through with best, best practices. Okay. <clears throat> um, I will say it, it was a beautiful ceremony with Chief Carpenter last um, September, October. October. And with that, our former sheriff, also Sheriff Justin Martinez, was appointed to be a U.S. Marshal um, recently as well. Um, so we, we have a, a quality and level of law enforcement leadership within this county that I would say is pretty unparalleled for a county of this size. And even our current sheriff, Sheriff Frank Smith, has extensive experience with the federal government and working with federal crimes as well as overseas. We have, we have some extensive experience within our law enforcement community, both with, um, with safety, with traffic, with domestic violence experience, all of those different areas that we expect because we, we as a society do expect a lot from our law enforcement. We want them to be ready at any moment to go and address a school shooting or something, an active shooter event, while having the care and the sensitivity and the training to work with um, an individual that has intellectual disabilities or is experiencing autism or has some sort of issue that they need a more sensitive touch. And I will say our, our law enforcement collectively have extensive experience in 
training with both of those things so that they can address that. And that's been very intentional um, from the top down, making sure that the experience that we need to handle whatever comes in this county um, and, in, and in the city, that we are well prepared for that. And we are. <laughs> One of the things I love about this city, and Melina, I'm sure you share this sentiment out in the county, is the amount of intellectual capital that we have here among our residents. We have people that are retired or semi-retired from really big, impressive jobs that have expertise that we need for different city initiatives uh, that we're working on. So over the last couple of years, I've appointed several task forces and um, they've done just some amazing things. I'm excited about it. Um, I think probably my favorite one, and. Hervé is here from that task force, uh, was our disruptors task force. I love just like the name, I think. And uh, they looked at all sorts of different transportation solutions other than buses, other than widening roads. They looked at everything from gondolas to airport transportation, a, um, a bus that would come up from the airport. They looked at tunnels. They looked at eight different, eight different things. And so it was really a thorough thing. It's important to me to be able to do my job that I hear from residents all the time. So twice a month, I do open office hours where you can call and make an appointment to come in and talk to me about anything that's on your mind. And uh, you get a 30 minute, my undivided attention. Uh, they're easily found on the city's website. So if you've got something if, that you'd like to talk to me about, if you want to volunteer for something, if you um, just want to you know, brainstorm about some things. Come on in and see me. I'd love to have you come in. And also within the county, there are a lot of opportunities to contribute. And you can live in a municipality like Park City or the other five municipalities on the east side of the county or within the unincorporated area if you want to participate. We have boards and commissions that we are constantly, I think we have something like on the county side, 40 boards and commissions that we fill with volunteers from the community that want to give back and participate and lend their intellectual capital and expertise to issues that we are solving from mos mosquito abatement to um, high valley transit to I mean, everything in between, two planning commissions, many, many other ways to contribute. So I would encourage you, if you are interested in applying or in just seeing what opportunities are out there to go onto the county's website, you can get not sign up to get notifications anytime there is an opening on a border commission. I believe Park City System is, is the same. Um, they have many opportunities as well. But we do rely heavily on the experience and the expertise of the community as we move forward because we, we can't make the best decisions without the input from the community. So I encourage you to participate. Um, we also are available for, to answer questions or to have conversations if you have ideas. All of our contact information is located on the website. People, people will call out of the blue all the time. Um, if we don't answer, leave a message and we'll get back to you. But we want to know your thoughts and what's going on um, and what you're concerned about. Great. So I know you have a full, full day. And we're probably at the end of our time, Miles. So I'm going to say thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for braving the snow to get here this morning. I know that it wasn't easy. And, and truly, this shows the dedication of the people of our community. And so I just thank you for being here today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, sometimes I wonder, you know, people always ask, where are all the leaders? <laughs> They're here. You're here. Um, this program is put on by the Leadership Park City program, which is now in its 30th year. And as part of that, we decided to do the Leadership 101 for the general community because the Leadership Park City program can only take a maximum of 35 people a year for their year-long program. So we wanted to reach out to the rest of the community, and we do several things during the year to reach out. This is one of them. We have a, a forum, a public forum in March, which will be advertising, which will be very interesting, that the community is invited to, and that'll be free, um, but there won't be any food. 
So we, we want to thank the hospital because they do give us this room for free and the use of their facilities, but we do have to pay for the food. So, and if you look around, you see all these chairs, I could tell you that um, over a hundred people um, signed up to be here today. And so you might see them drifting in and out during the day. We know it's uh, pretty brutal out there in, in the traffic, but no problem there. And when I heard Melina talking about the mosquito abatement board, I always wonder who serves on the mosquito abatement board. I never heard anyone volunteer for that job, but it probably, it's good. During the day, we have a very tight schedule with a lot of speakers. And so I have this <laughs> a bell here. So um, if we have to shoo someone off the, off the stage, including myself, I'll be ringing the bell and looking at my watch so that we give everyone sufficient time. Um, I'll start off uh, after the mayor and after the Molina to talk about <clears throat> um, our past, honoring our past. And as I look around the room, there are some people that remember the past here. So I'm going to start right into doing that. And let me look at the time, make sure I'm on time here. I think I am. Yep, perfect. So again, it's the 28th year of doing this program. Uh, we, we didn't always did it, do it here because this, this wasn't here 28 years ago when we started. But we're so proud of uh, the hospital and what they've done here with the Blair Education Center. So I like to start at the beginning, and that's what I do here. So um, this is a picture of chaos, and then the earth cooled, and, and then in three slides, there's Park City. So I covered four and a half billion years in three slides. And you probably realize that Park City was voted the best town ever by Outside Magazine. That might have been in 1960, I don't know when, but we keep putting that up there. We're gonna hold on to that, that title as long as we can. And it is a great place. And you know, you look out there today and see that powder, it's pretty amazing here. But let's, let's pay homage. We weren't the first people here. Uh, the Ute Indians were here before we were, and it is certainly put it correct as these days to give credit to the fact that there were people here before the early settlers, the miners, and so forth. But I can tell you, they never really lived here year round because they didn't have central heat. Um, so they just came up here as hunting grounds during, during, the, uh, during the summertime. But they were certainly here for, people say, maybe thousands of years. We're not quite sure of, of the, the exact lineage. But if you look at the history of mostly the city, the internal city here, going back to the 1880s, now you might remember, or maybe you do know, that silver was discovered here in around 1869 or 1867, somewhere 1847, I don't know. It was a long time ago. Well, maybe Pat will correct me later on here. But uh, it, was, it was discovered up at Flagstaff Mountain, or which is now Deer Valley. And, um, you know, so it started to grow. So at one time, there was a population pretty similar to what it is here today. Now, of course, the rest of the county didn't have what it has today, so it wasn't as crowded. But it was estimated there were about 10,000 people living in this area way back in the 1880s. And you can see that there were a lot of years here that were not that good. This was not all... You know, I guess the realtors always taught me that trees don't grow to the sky. And even though we've been having these boom years for the last 15 or 20 years, there are a lot of really depressing years here in Park City after the mines closed, there's a boom and bust economy. And it's just sort of grown back. And now as Nan said, the city itself is pretty stable at around 85 to 8,700 people. And we like to romance the past here and spend a lot of time talking about our history. And it is romancing the past, but if you look seriously into what the past really looked like, it was not very romantic. It was heavy industrial work, mining. It was dirty. It was hard. Uh, people didn't live very long doing it. And uh, we're still dealing with a lot of the consequences of that economy. And I always wonder, maybe 100 years from now, will people be looking back at us and looking at lifts up the mountain when we're growing pineapples up there and say, what the heck were they thinking? I don't know. But you can see what it looks like in the Ontario mine. That's the 1,300 foot level. Uh, some of the old timers or the miners that were here uh, told me that there's probably 1,500 to 2,000 miles of tunnels under this area. That was all dug through hard rock. 
not all of it with uh, mechanized material, a lot of it by hand. So it's pretty amazing what people did with very uh, few tools. The big change, I guess, happened in uh, 1869 when the Transcontinental Railroad was joined up at Promontory Point, and it was the railroads coming in, like the rail trail, which was the railroad, the Union Pacific Railroad Spur coming into the mining that really set this place up for the industrial mining that took place here. Some of you know Crescent Road, and there used to be a railroad up there. So the railroads really sort of mechanized this area early on and took, took the ore out of here. And it was mostly a kind of silver mix ore. So they had silver, they had tin, they had lead, and uh, a lot of other things that came along with that, arsenic, zinc, mercury, cadmium, things that you don't want in your drinking water. Um, but this was not pick and shovel mining. So people have this, this sort of romantic image of sort of the, the guy with the burro and the, the pan, you know, like the 49ers out in California. That was not this. This was deep mining. They dug deep here. And there were a lot of problems with that. But it took a lot of money. And so most of the money to do this came from the East Coast. And this was heavy industrial mining. And really, uh, you know, it was once explained to me by some of the Again, old timers, although as I look at myself, uh, I'm probably 20 years or 25 years older than most of them were when I called them old timers now. But um, this was the height of technology. This was sort of like the Silicon Valley in terms of technology in those days. This was the Cornish pump. This was brought in here because the deep mines here were heavily watered and still are a lot of water underground. In order to get to the ore, they had to pump that water out of the mines. So this was uh, huge, you know, and they, they brought this out in pieces from the East Coast and uh, set it up and pumped millions of gallons of water out every month. And here's what it looked like. I mean, if you can see the, the pictures there, there were seven mills here. So this was not a place that uh, you would put on your tourist brochures. Uh, it, didn't, it didn't fit into that category. You can see the train down in the bottom here coming into town. There were two railroads that came into town from different directions. And we use both of those lines now, not the lines, but the, the beds as, as trails nowadays. Again, looking at the, at the town in the early days. Um, these were some of the first towns, the, the mining towns in the West, to have electricity and telegraph. So these were like the, the, you know, the height of industrialization when the country was expanding westward. And of course, there was snow here then too. And they didn't have the plows going day and night to, to clear that snow out of here. But people got around and they enjoyed it, I think. Uh, I always uh, laugh about here because, you know, we have a Historic Preservation Commission. We're a National Historic District here, and um, th that's a great thing that we had that designation. But people always talk about what's authentic. Well, I can tell you what was authentic here, false fronts. So there's a little dichotomy there. I mean, these were shacks, and they put something in the front of it to make it look big and impressive. But there were shacks with, with some boards in front called false fronts. And there were stores here selling all kinds of things. There's guitars, you know, they're selling guitars way back in the 1880s and uh, jewelry and tools and all kinds of things. And of course, like many of the towns in the West, there were major fires. And the big one here was June 19th of 1898 when a good part of the town burned down. It started at the top of Main Street and uh, the wind was blowing and pretty soon everything was these shacks and pretty soon about everything burned down. You can see there were some old pictures from those days when the whole downtown was gone in, in, in just about six or seven hours. Um, the, uh, the fire department down here, and I, I love the fire department, but I think their motto back then was, we never lost a lot. Of course, they never saved a building but they saved every lot that was there uh, because they really didn't have the equipment. I mean, these were hand pump carts and they would get out there and, you know, it, it's a little like TSA nowadays. Um, no, I shouldn't say. <laughs> it gives you that sense of security when you know it's not that secure. Anyhow, the miners' hospital, this was the heart of the mining companies, were really the heart of uh, the miners of the labor movement. 
in this country. They, you know, they were organized because they had no, no benefits. It was hard. A lot of them died of silicosis and other diseases of the lungs from work in this. It was dangerous or explosions. Uh, a lot of deaths. If you go to our cemeteries here, you'll see some of those, the, the, the major, you know, 20 or 30 people dying in an explosion. So they got together and they organized and built their own hospital, the Miners Hospital, and uh, they built it in 1904. So it's we celebrated the 100th anniversary a while back, and it's still there. But what a lot of people don't know is it was moved. It wasn't where it is now in the park. It was up where Shadow Ridge is, up by the ski area. And for years, it was a hospital. And then it turned into like a boarding house and a ski flop house. And there are t stories of ghosts and everything. I don't I, Yeah, I don't know. But anyhow, the whole building got jacked up and moved in 1979. Um, Something else that, that happened uh, a long time ago, 1982, uh, there was a book brigade. When they moved all the books, they were, the library was on Main Street, where the city hall is now, and they all got moved down to the Miners Hospital at that point, hand over hand. Hundreds of people handing it hand over hand. So self-help has been a big part of the history of Park City. And of course, that's what I said. You know, you think about how glorious things look now, and it's not that it's black and white, but I mean, think this town was in bad straits in the 1950s. There was a book written in the 19, early 1970s. I first saw the town in 1972, and uh, their book was already had been written about 100 great ghost towns in the West. Park City was named in that. It was never a ghost town. That's not true. I mean, some of you know ghost towns like Bodie, California, some other towns. This was never a ghost town. But I don't think there were more than a few hundred people living here then because there was no economy. Silver had, had tanked out. The mines had closed. People who had to get a job had to leave. And so there was the old timers, the people who had worked in the mines and retired. But things were not in good shape here, as you can see with the, the city hall. Didn't look anything like it looks today. And, uh, you know, people would always come to me and say, uh, um, oh, I could have bought the whole town here for $10, you know. And I said, why didn't you? And most people, if they're honest, said, because it wasn't worth it. And that's true. China Bridge, you've heard of China Bridge. There it is right there. <laughs> you know, I hear China Bridge and people start thinking like the Golden Gate or something. This was like a boardwalk over Sweet Alley because people didn't want to walk across where Chinatown was in those days. It was a heavily racist town because after the Transcontinental Railroad, a lot of people who worked on, on the uh, railroads were Chinese. They moved to places, a lot of the camps like Park City, and there was a lot of racism, and people who lived up on Rossi Hill didn't want to walk through that. So they built a, a little bridge across it so they can go right to Main Street. Coalition building, some of you have heard that or have seen the, this was down at the, the bottom of Main Street where Lower Main Street is now. That burned in the 1980s, early 1980s. And the relics of mining are still around, and we're trying to save, when I say we, the city, and, and friends of ski mining history and other groups are trying to save as much of it as they can. But a lot of these buildings were never built to last the kind of winters we have here without all serious work to keep them together. Skiing came early on because so many of the people who moved here were from Europe and some of them from Scandinavian countries. The only way to get around originally was sort of on that we didn't have plows and stuff in those days. So people would get around on their long skis and didn't take long for the kids and other people to, to get into ski jumping. This is right here at Creehall Hill uh, over Old Town. Um, and so ski jumping really didn't start here, but you know, you've heard of Alf Engen maybe, and that's not him, but it started early on. And then of course, it was the mining company itself that started the ski area. And it was called Treasure Hill in those days, it opened 60 years ago right now. This is our 60th anniversary. And I have a lift ticket uh, that I have from the first year that someone gave me, and it was $2.50. Yeah. So that'll get you a straw and a stir. <laughs> Anyhow. Uh, in, in the early days, uh, the, since the mining company did it, and I won't go through all the history, I don't have time to do it, but it's pretty interesting. They applied to the federal government for a grant, an economic development grant, because the town was in such bad straits. And so they got it. And some of the uh, old timers again told me, they said, you know, uh, we figured if we could dig thousands of 
miles of tunnels under this town, we could put a lot of fat butts in chairs and take them up the mountain. So that's the way it was explained to me. That's Jim Santy driving the train there. So in the early days, they actually used the skier subway. And if you go to the museum, you'll see that. And uh, it was pretty interesting because you could actually get on the skier subway and uh, right, right here and where Thames Canyon is, and you would go through the tunnels underground, and then you would go up the hoist and get out and ski on Thames. Uh, it, it worked for a couple of years, maybe three years, but it was about a, from what I heard, I never took it, it was about an hour ride and things were dripping on you. And people, even when we tried to re, redo it, we did for a few years, we did a, a mining tour and people thought it was gonna be like Disneyland. And then when they actually got into a cage and went 1800 feet in a little cage down, a lot of people freaked out and we stopped doing it. Uh, but, you know, those relics are still around, and then there's the ski era, you know, 60 years of it now here. We were not the first ski area. Sun Valley really was the first ski area. Alta was the first ski area in Utah, but this goes back quite a long way now. And all the changes, I, for those of you who have been around that long, you might remember when there was a big fight between snowboarders and skiers. Still ours. I remember having a bumper sticker, you know, short skis suck on my car, that was a big thing. Uh, but our economy is based on tourism. You know, that's what we've done all these years successfully. Probably will be more successfully than we ever anticipated. So tourism is about 67% of our budget here and the other 33% other things. But visitors spend well over, you know, 500 million, probably closer to a billion dollars now a year in our economy here. What I like to point out to people is that we, we have kind of an industrial uh, sense of nostalgia here because residents long for this sort of leave it to beaver past that we portray in all of our literature, but uh, they, you know, we tend to ignore all the changes that are taking place around us on a daily basis. And, and there's a psychology to that, and I can tell you, we sell a dream. That's what we do in Park City. We sell a dream to people, and they don't move here to deal with reality. They're moving here to escape reality. And so we have this uh, dichotomy all the time. You see it in every public meeting now. It's pretty interesting. You'll hear more about it there. If you long for the good old days, there, that's, you know. All right, so I came first time in uh, April 1972 and uh, took some pictures. Uh, this is the way the town looked in 1972. How many of you would be building multi-million dollar homes here in 1972? None of you, that's how many. Uh, this is the way it looked. And uh, Rich Martinez, the old miner, there's a statue of him. He always said this to me, if you were nostalgic for those days, you weren't here. You just weren't here. So this is a, a dream and something we do, and uh, great. I mean, we should be doing that. But there was some life sort of before tourism. Uh, you notice there are no fancy street lights there. <laughs> you know, the, the, the residents were happy that UDOT had put in these fancy big, you know, Cobra lights over Main Street. Later on, those, those were taken out, but that's kind of the way it looked. And uh, that's the way Old Town looked. There weren't a lot of painted buildings. Uh, Poison Creek, you've heard of Poison Creek. That's Sweet Alley, folks. That's what Sweet Alley looked like, and that's Poison Creek. Uh, you wouldn't want your kids playing in that. That's why it was called Poison Creek, because it's heavy, heavy metals there. Uh, there's Lower Sweet Alley, not exactly what you call picturesque. Uh, there's the b bottom of China Bridge. Uh, and, you know, now we turn to color again. So I just want to give you a sense of where the town was and where we've been moving here, uh, you know, forward. So now we boast, you know, probably two of the best ski resorts or close to it in North America. We're certainly the largest. Uh, Mayflower, that's now East Village. I think that's what they call it now. I mean, we are the largest ski resort in North America, period. Bigger than Vail, bigger than Whistler, bigger than all of them by a lot. So I came here um, from Crusty Butte, Colorado. And that's the way Crusty Butte, Colorado looked like in 1972. Very similar to here. Uh, I think there was two cars on Main Street there, I don't know. You know, we always said you could shoot a cannonball down you know, Main Street here or Park City here in Crested Butte, not hit anything here. And, um, you know, uh, giving you a little history, this is in 1975, it's when they came out with the first 
deal here where you could wear the earphones and it was a big box you wore here with a thing and we thought that was the coolest stuff we'd ever seen. You could listen to music and ski at the same time. And so uh, that's the way we looked and of course, who knows what we were doing in those days. Um, but way back in 1980, I, I've talked to a lot of groups over the years and uh, did a lot of consulting with ski towns around the world. And I, way back in 1980, I started to talk about the silver tsunami because I, I, I wasn't pressing and I just looked at the demographics and, uh, and realized that everyone was gonna get older and already we were seeing it 40 years ago, 40, 44 years ago. Uh, and I said, and I made fun of it, of course. And I said, look at this, <laughs> look how this guy's dressed, you know, the silver tsunami. Now, uh, that's me. That's, that's how I look. I, I don't think I should have made any fun of that guy here. And, and then <laughs> uh, they used to call me, uh, they, they used to call me corporal punishment because of the way I skied. Uh, I was always crashing into things, you know. But um, my, my wife said to me, my wife said to me, um, you know that picture you always show of the silver tsunami? I said, yeah. She said, have you looked in the mirror lately? <laughs> you know? I said, uh, uh, no, you know? And I, guess what? Change happens, you know, it just does. Uh, when, when I started, and some of you here too started, everyone showed up at these ski areas, this was it. Duct tape made the ski industry, if you didn't know that. Um, you know, there's the light side, the dark side, and it holds everything together. It's like the force. But if it wasn't for duct tape, you know, we wouldn't have had it. It was all old ski gear and stuff that you bought at, uh, at thrift stores and stuff like that. So there's been these changes and the psychographics have changed. People's expectations have changed. Uh, each year I organize a city tour where I take people to other resorts. And this was uh, one of the first ones I did here 30, 31 or two years ago. And we went to Aspen. And in Aspen, uh, this was the police chief, and he, he talked to us, and we said, oh my God, you guys are driving Saab turbos in Aspen. And we had like these old scout, you know, for something like that, rusty scouts. And we said to the police chief, how come you're driving Saab turbos? And he looked at us seriously, and he said, our, our guests don't like to get tickets from scouts. And you know, we thought about that and he was right, you know? I mean, suddenly we realized that like we were way behind the times of where we should go. So we came back and the city council and we all discussed that and we said, yeah, we have to up our game. We just have to do something better than we're doing now. So, you know, it's a little over the top, but you got the picture, we had to upgrade because we realized our future was disposable income. And there's lots of places you could spend disposable income, and we wanted to be one of those places. And you could see what we've done to build the summer business. There was hardly any summer business in those days, how we got involved with the mountain biking craze uh, and so forth, how we've supported the airport and what that's meant to us as a Delta hub now and a major airport, all the hotels that have been built. These things all have added one after another. People always said, you know, you have restaurants here, we have hundreds of restaurants here. People said you couldn't get a drink in Utah, you could get a drink in Utah. So I'm just going quickly, and Sundance certainly helped put us on the map, and still does, still does. It's an amazing event that started in Salt Lake, but moved up here 40 years ago. So it's pretty interesting. See, each year we receive hundreds of millions from tourists in this town. That's what's giving us the lifestyle that we're all proud of. But you know something, people think it's just automatic. You know, we're just, you know, it snows, everyone's gonna come here and that's great. I can tell you it's not true. It takes a lot of hard work because there's many competitors. Disney Corporation is 10 times the size of all the ski resorts in North America combined. It's huge compared to what we do. We're a small part of it, Las Vegas. We we've have to fill about 30,000 rooms a night. They have to fill 230,000 every night. So there's a lot to learn from what they've done and, and we compete with them. The cruise ships, every year it seems to be a new cruise ship and people say, well, I'd rather go cruising because it's so safe compared to skiing. And I said, yeah, that, that's, that's true sometimes, <laughs> you know, occasionally. You just have to sort of point out to people what the truth is. But we do compete with all these places, the cheap flights, the warm weather resorts. Um, and then all of our competitors in the ski business, and they all do a great job. 
places like Aspen, Crested Butte, where I'm from, Jackson Hole, you know, just Sun Valley. These are all wonderful, wonderful places. This year, our city tour is going to Telluride, and so get a chance to see how they move people around with, with a gondola. Vail, of course, and Whistler, um, you know, South America, if you've ever been skiing down in, in Valle Nevado, St. Anton, our sister city in Courchevel, France. And, you know, you just can't <laughs> ski Dubai, you know? And I thought this was the, the I, didn't, I never saw this, but, you know, it's inside refrigerate. They actually have one in New Jersey, too. Um, but now, this new one in Saudi Arabia, half a billion dollar ski resort going in the desert. Go figure. You know, so there's competition everywhere. All right, let's get into, let's see, how's our time here? I want to go over. 15. Okay. What time do I have until? I better look. Let's see. I had some idea. Yeah, I have to go quick. Yep, yeah, okay. Well, you know, we, we've done America's opening here. We decided we wanted to do the Olympics. People ask why. That's why, you know, you know where Utah was, but when we started talking about the Olympics, nobody knew where Utah was. <laughs> it didn't exist, so we wanted to put ourselves on the map. We, uh, we bid for it. Uh, we didn't have any support. People thought we were crazy. Who was gonna come to Utah for the Olympics? So uh, we had a, a torch on Main Street. We, we built that. And, we had a bunch of kids sing. We bid for the, for the 19, 1998 games. We lost that, but uh, we did bid for them. There's our mayor at the time, Brad Ulch. Uh, but we started to build facilities. We built the Utah Olympic Park. We went to a lot of other Olympic games to see how they did it. We won the bid in 1995 for the, for the games in 2002. Uh, and then we took tips around the world to see how other people were doing it. So that's a, still a model I hope we follow for the 2034 games because it was good. We went to Atlanta. And again, I won't go through that's Peekaboo Street up there winning a gold medal. You know, people said, well, how did you go to like Nagano? You don't speak, you know, Japanese. How did you find the bathroom? Well, they had signs down there. It wasn't that hard. You know? <laughs> so, uh, people went to Sydney for the games there. This is, I think, the important slide. We told people right up front, here's what we want from the games and here's how we're going to do it. And I think that's important that everyone's on the same page. Here's why we're doing it. Here's the transaction we're, we're going for. Here's what you can hold us to. We posted that everywhere and we lived up to it. So <clears throat> we became the Alpine Heart of 2002. We built the Utah Olympic Park, the plaza. First, this was the first Olympic facility. <laughs> it was the roundabout. I mean, watching people in Utah <laughs> negotiate a roundabout was a world class. Did a transit center, you know, we had lots of meetings here. We trained ourselves to the press. People said, Utah, where's Utah? So we had to do a lot of that. Mitt Romney came on, worked with us there. I'm just gonna go real quick. And then of course, you never know. Right before we were gonna do the games, you know, in that September, bang, a horrible tragedy for all of us. But we went forward anyhow, I got to run a torch, I like that. And then it was the opening and suddenly it was wonderful. So people always ask, how come you were so successful here? When I say us, the whole community, Salt Lake, Utah and all, it was 50% great planning. We planned really hard and 75% incredible luck. It snowed, the weather was good and we won medals starting on the very first day. So it was a pretty interesting time. If you, you look back on those days, anyone who was here, can remember them, it was wonderful. And I hope all of you are here for the 2034 game. So I'm just going quickly here to show you some of you who were, how many of you were here for the 2000? Oh, maybe a third. That's good. Do you may remember the Budweiser horses here? Each of those horses cost a million and a half dollars way back then. So they would go down every day at four o'clock in the afternoon. We had great entertainment, you know. Not, not like a, the flying Elvises, you know, who knows where we got all these people. Uh, and, and we spent what we thought was a lot of money putting on the party, $100,000 a day. It seems like nothing nowadays. But then in 18 days, it was all over. You know, it was a once in a lifetime experience, except most of you are going to be around for the, for the next one. And some of those legacies are still here, and they're great. 
and, we, and we're benefiting from all these legacies here. You know, all these things happen because of and in conjunction with our Olympic efforts. Some of our great heroes here, I'm just going really quickly here, you know, and, and it's, it's going on. I mean, just the other night, you know, up at Deer Valley, it's just going on and on. This legacy is real here. It's part of our DNA. And then when people say, why are you doing this, the Olympics, this is why. This is who we've been and, and who we are. So many of those athletes live here. Okay, I am running over here. So, so we keep talking about it, and I'm just going to finish off here. Here's the existential question I hope you talk about today. Can we continue to grow, prosper, and change without losing our soul? Now, the soul is easy to talk about, hard to define. So I don't know. That's why we do the leadership program, is to keep the flame burning for our soul. And I'd like to thank you, because uh, I'll finish here. But I always quote Gary Snyder, who's an American poet. He said, find your place on the planet, dig in, and take responsibility from there. And I hope that's what all of you are here to do today, because it's true. If you're lucky enough to be here, you're lucky enough, folks. OK, let's go on to the next one. Thank you. So, Bill, you're going to do it? So what we're going to do now is we're going to talk about the changing face of, of Eastern Summit County, because Eastern Summit County is kind of a, a stepchild to us. So uh, I don't know if we have to change these computers around. Do we have to put your computer in? No, I just need so, the HDMI. OK, you need the HDMI, that's which is right this. Yep. Let's see if that's going to work for you. It should work great. All right, I can move this out of the way. And you have 20 minutes, which goes very quick. Let's see if this works. All right. OK, this, this is my friend Bill Coleman. Bill was on the city council that hired me 36 years ago here. And uh, so we've aged together gracefully. Yes, gracefully. Really gracefully. Yeah, right. uh, thanks for uh, having me come in and show you a few things from my part of the world. And mine is the development side of Park City. I've been in the real estate side of it and worked for the original development company. Make sure you're talking about Oh, yeah, that part. Um, and, and in doing that, uh, it, was, uh, it was interesting because there was probably about 25, 30 of us in 1970 when I got here. And we were all looking for the same kinds of things. And it came from being and, and became quickly a community of shared concerns, and it still is. Still is that same community in the sense of sharing concerns and trying to find ways to work through them. And some of the concerns then were just life and trying to be 24 years old and trying to make a, a life for yourself and decide if you're gonna even have a family. We didn't even decide to have a family. I came here on my honeymoon and until about five years later because the schools were so horrible we didn't want to put any kids in it. So my wife and a couple other ladies started a preschool just to be doing something. But you had to also do something that was going to be productive for the future. So we decided to spend money as a bunch of young guys. Uh, and, and the ladies were the ones running the show, as always, and still today. And I think that what they were able to accomplish in those very early years was to set a tone and that of shared concerns, but also kind of a separate community. And as Miles used to say, we became sort of the Hong Kong of Utah because it was not like any other part of Utah. And, and so that part of it isolated us. And it isolated us because they hadn't even finished the interstate when I got here in 1970. So there was really not an easy access up here. There was a nasty road you could get here. But from 63 to 70, it wasn't really that fun to come skiing here So uh, the, from Salt Lake. So that day skier thing really wasn't much of a thing to happen. Of course, now we, get, we, we also decided to make the town romantically cute. And uh, that was important to all of us. We overdid it. <laughs> Probably so, but it was it. But by doing that, we also found ways to create a lot of nonprofits, a lot of activities to be doing for each other, but also to take a town and make it productive and make it so we could all have lives here and raise our families here. And it's tough now, as everybody comes in these days, to say. 
how can we afford to buy something here in town? And it's, it's a problem with every ski town. Uh, you've got a real, if, if it's popular, it creates high demand. The development world follows demand. It doesn't create demand. And so it's important to see the world that way because everybody would like to say, well, developers, they're terrible. Well, they're responding to all this terrible demand. <laughs> and that's largely what's going on. And it's tough in the counties to do anything that is uh, going to not compromise that. So we start out here, and this is how I see the world. Um, I come in, you can hear my voice, can't you, over there? The, uh, I gotta, I gotta be able to see it. No, it's okay, I think I can. There, can you hear me okay now? All right, well that's good. Um, the, the area that, I mean, Miles gave a great historical background uh, for us to kind of take a look at. And he mentioned a couple of the competitions and I always kind of start up here in the north side of, I hope I don't make anybody ill in here, but <laughs> the, uh, it's Snow Basin and, and uh, Wasatch Peaks, right? At the, as you come out of the road coming around the uh, interstate into Ogden and they are huge projects that are yet to sort of happen. Snow Basin in particular, Snow Basin is it, from the same people that own Sun Valley uh, uh, Resort. And so they are, they've got a future there. It's also one that we use during the games uh, because in, in that, at that time frame, the downhill needed a home. We have originally approved the downhill homologated course um, in, um, it, it, let me get this around to where north is north here for you guys. All right, there we go. Uh, at, uh, at, at the new uh, resorts, let me get this. Okay, here's, we're kind of just hovering in over the top now of Park City. And you see the blue lines there, those were the rail lines. You're gonna hear a lot more about rail lines because rail to trails is, as, and Miles was very instrumental in making sure that we save that old rail bed that goes all the way through here. This is the rail bed that went out and goes to Colville. Well, there's other ones. We also found, we saved this one and put the sewer line through it. Uh, and there was no productive sewer here when we started. So 200 of us got together and put a bond issue together to build a sewer plant where it is today. So you can move a lot of things when there's just not that many of you, remember? Because again, we had to deal with sewage, so you take care of it. Now the daily same utility question comes with the traffic. And we've decided that, and maybe this is where politics jumps in here a little bit, but the roads in Park City are a utility, just like a sewer line was back then. And no different than you wouldn't probably take a sewer line coming out of Park City that's in a 10 inch line. You probably don't wanna push it down to a six inch line while you get through town and then pop it back open to a 10 inch line when you get out of town. That is worse than a bottleneck. <laughs> and we see it, we see it all over the place. A lot of the problems can be solved. There's a lot of politics. Should it be traffic calming or should you get them the hell out of town at the end of the day? And that's a big existential question for you guys as leaders. You could solve a lot of it with a paintbrush on 248. And you got a big road coming into town, right? And it's more than right away width. So you could have two lanes coming into town all the way on 248. You could also have two lanes coming out of town to get them out of town on 248, let alone 224. You have to take these things and deal with them, and I deal with them this way. And I get people from all over the, the Wasatch County now and Park City areas taking a look at what have we got here now? What is the situation? Well, uh, let's zoom in here just a little bit, and I can kind of show you everything on the map is a development that I track or am involved with or in the case of 
uh, the last 10 years, uh, the whole Extel development, we sold that land to them. I represented the Dutch guys from, that owned all that ground. They bought about 3,000 acres, a bunch of guys from Amsterdam, a bunch of worker guys. It was like a union. And they just came over and bought it because they wanted to go buy something in America. There's a lot of Dutch named mines here too. So they had a history to that, but they bought that and uh, it needed to get sold because they were getting old and getting feeble-minded and not remembering they even invested in it. And so the Dutch courts said, sell it. And we helped them get it sold to Extel and also the plan. But that plan started in 1986. So people that come to town now think this is all just something that's just been happening here recently. But the lake wasn't there, of course. So our plan for Mayflower had two alternatives, one with a lake and one without a lake. So that's how it had to be done then because there wasn't a certainty that Jordan L would even be built. It was the last cog in that whole central Utah project. And it's important to see how everybody that we see in the real estate business says, well, what are you guys doing for water? Well, that was one of them, uh, of course, but also it's, a, it's an issue that has been dealt with since the early 60s to take care of the water. And remember, there's only four rivers here that we deal with, really three, the Bear River, the Weber River, and the Provo River. And they all come out of the same place. We capture them in the reservoirs that are here to the east of us. But then they end up in the Great Salt Lake. That's putrefied water, technically, when it hits the lake. So you can't use it for much. So the idea was say, let's keep what we can, use it to grow stuff. It all makes sense. It all makes sense. So I want you to try to see how the development side of town really <laughs> is happening. Heber is a ski town now. And you can see what they're doing here. They've got all that area in the center is the North Fields area. You've got development all the way down Main Street. You've got a whole new town down here called Independence. Uh, you've got uh, all the areas. There's a Wasatch Back, which is the area that we deal with here on 40, but there's an also watch, a Wasatch Back Back. And that's the one that goes through Oakley, goes through Pioa, goes through Francis. And all of that area you see, most of my drawings here, are, are these are subdivisions that are proposed or work that's being done. You go through and Camus, Francis, Oakley, are all dealing with the same issues. They're dealing with other problems with the issues, just like Main Street was here that Miles was showing you. That was a state highway, Main Street was. We had to get that off the, the docket of being a state highway. We had to make it a little town street. That's what Heber's still suffering with right now. They're trying to get that traffic off of their Main Street, and they're doing a great job. You've got to look into the Envision Heber City 50, 2050 uh, plan. I'm sure you will in your processes, but it's a great plan. And it also tells, it te I, can, I can see from it what they're trying to do. And they're trying to take, get everybody off that street where you can walk. And they're also saying no parking requirements. Try to imagine parking requirements for Main Street. If every guy that built a business on Main Street had to provide parking, there wouldn't be a Main Street. So you've got to deal with those things when you're in these little towns on the Wasatch back back. And it's a fun part of seeing what has to happen to, in my world, find housing that anybody can afford. The middle has been left behind. We have a lot of affordable housing projects, but they're being left in situations where they're put into a, a, a strata of income, which is tough when you might want to have a higher strata of income and you have to now move out of your house because you just outgrew your strata of income that got you into the house you're staying in. So keep in mind how many issues are faced by these kinds of developments that you don't see every day. So I, I love the idea of what Leadership 101 is, is around, and Miles has done a magnificent job of it, but what we also don't see is I can give this presentation in great detail and I can fly you right through the canyon and I can fly you from the new airport all the way up here and you can really start to see it. But that's not what we're here to do today because we don't have the time. That takes a couple hours to kind of even make it start to have some sense. 
And I would welcome anybody that wants to go through that because what it does is it really sensitizes you to the enormous amount of activity that's out there. Yes, it's growth, but we're pretty popular now. And so it's not going away, but we have to then deal with the issues that have been created by everybody that wants to be here. And again, we probably made it a little too cute, but it's so close to that airport, we probably wouldn't have even had to do that. <laughs> we could have made it probably really ugly and we'd still be having the same problems. So um, I, I like what you're trying to accomplish. And uh, as a ski town, and those are just the ski lifts there that are in green that are around here. But when we look at that proximity to Alta, which is, this is Alta right over here, just so you have it, Alta and Snowbird. And we're on just on the back end of that canyon. That's a chimney canyon. That's why it gets so much powder. It just sucks the air right up that comes from the west like a chimney, and that's why that happens so fast. It happens so fast, picks up the moisture, and dumps the hell out of it. It's a great geological thing we're, we're, we're enjoying. And, uh, and even in the drought years, we're gonna always have something there. But we're also gonna have water coming from it. I got a lot of answers for questions at some point in time if you wanna do that, but the history and how this all works, how Extel works, how Mida works, all the things, there's a lot of misunderstandings about everything in that case. I had a meeting yesterday with Steve Farrell, who was here when we were starting all of this stuff between Wasatch County, and they wanted a little piece of the ski action. Well, they got it now. And you can see our lifts at Mayflower now from Main Street of Heber. So it's pretty clear what they're facing now too in their growth patterns. And it's gonna be fun. It's gonna really be fun. And I think that you guys are gonna have a great time doing it. And yes, there'll be all the hand wringing, but remember, this is a community of shared concerns. <laughs> That's what we're gonna be doing, but you also have to work with power. And power, the definition of power that has always stuck with me is, and it's a good one, because it is your capacity to generate effective action. It's, what, it's the easiest way to see what it is you have to become in order to produce anything. Being an activist, you know, we're all activists. So that doesn't mean anything. Having power in what you guys are gonna be doing means everything. And, and having a, an ambition for doing that. And those are sometimes con considered negative terms, not in your world. That's the world you're, you're headed into and we'll have great fun in it. That's it for me. If you want to get deep, anytime, I'll do that. Thanks, Miles. Great, I didn't even, I didn't even have to ring my bell or anything. So, thanks, Bill. Now we're going to have Mr. Pat Putt, one of my colleagues for many, many years as well. Everyone else here? Yeah. Do, do you want to do? Oh, Bob, if I can okay. do that, that would be great. I guess. Okay. So this, how does this stuff work? Do you know? Miles just asked me if I know how this works. <laughs> Daniel, do we need help here? Let's see. Can everybody, can everybody hear me? Can everybody back there see me? I can get on a stool. Which, which one are you here? Well, Daniel is helping us out. Is this you here? Just to kind of help age. Yeah. I was criticized by a 26-year-old colleague yesterday that I didn't know how to use Teams. So I asked her if she could just simply flip the calendar to find a date. And she reminded me, she said, Pat, I'm a Gen Z. I don't know how to use paper calendars. Let's see. Let me get rid of this. This is you here? Yeah. Click the one to the right, not that one. Not that one? OK, now I'm confused. You're telling me the wrong thing here. Wouldn't be the first. 
Yeah. What do I hit to advance? Here, you can use this. Oh, yeah. So side so button. You, so you just roll it back slowly. Ooh, it's not advancing now. Yeah, I guess just these then. Good morning, everybody. I'm Patrick Putt. I'm the Community Development Director for Summit County. It's always good to be in a room full of people who care enough to be involved. Um, for those of you who know me, I don't get out too much, so being in a group like this is a little bit daunting. Particularly of concern is when you find out that you're gonna file, you know, come behind Miles and, and Bill Coleman, you know, try to compete with that. Um, I'm the youngest of seven, always the last to know most everything. But does everyone here in the room understand that this is the last time Miles will actually be doing this? Is everybody, everybody got that? I just recently found that out. If you have an opportunity today to shake his hand or give him a hug and thank him for doing this, I would encourage you to do this. I was around 28 years ago, Miles, when you did the first thing. Um, a lot's been said about this program, but uh, I'm sort of a beneficiary of this and why. Because at the time, before leadership uh, existed, it was easy for people to throw stones at issues. Through Miles's and his team's work putting on this program, Miles has all kind of collectively helped us to take those stones we might have thrown and, and together kind of built a foundation on how to solve problems. And I really want to you know, recognize you for doing that, Miles. You, you've made a, a big difference in, in this community and your fingerprints are all over it. Um, thank you. And for 28 years, he's been asking me to come back and keep doing this. So I'm still kind of surprised by that as well. Um, as I said, I'm the Community Development Director for Summit County. I've been working in the area uh, for 29 years, going on 30 years as a community builder. I'm um, just a guy searching for all the answers to life's unanswered sort of planning mystery questions. We're still working on it together. Um, <laughs> I was putting together my slides today and, and I thought I would include a couple of idealized uh, images of Summit County. You know, this is why we here, why we came, why we stay, what we're trying to protect. Um, on the edge here is, is probably one of my favorite actors, Harold Lloyd. Uh, people ask me, what is it like to be a community development director on the Wasatch back? I always remind them managing change is difficult uh, I do all my own stunts and falls, uh, no nets. I wouldn't encourage you to do it at home, but uh, it's important work. Summit County, they a couple of comments were made earlier by Milena. When I was in the, in the crowd looking for the agenda today, I, I tried to find the agenda and what pulled up on my phone was a slide from a presentation I made to this group in 2019 and it was Summit County by the numbers. We, we are 1,882 square miles. Uh, Mayor Nan said, you know, reminded everybody, Park City is 17. My community is about the size of Delaware. It includes six municipalities and another half dozen, what I'm just gonna call unincorporated historic villages. Uh, back in 2019, we had about 39,000 people. That number's gone up. We have 39,000 individually described parcels in un unincorporated Summit County. Uh, 39,000 people now. We're probably closer to the mid 40,000s. And then to me, probably the most important statistic is we had about 10,000 dogs, which I think that number's uh, increased as well. The, the significant thing that I wanna like leave you in terms of Summit County, uh, for us doing the planning, we have two planning districts. Most places, most local governments have, have one. They have one planning commission. In Summit County, uh, uh, beginning in 1995, we have two. We have the Snyderville Basin Planning Commission, those areas in and around uh, Park City. But we also have the Eastern Summit County 
planning district. Each has its own general plan. Each has its own set of zoning regulations. Uh, each has its own identity. And in years past, uh, there was always a distinct difference. Some people called it a cultural difference. Some people called it just an existing landscape difference. To a large extent, that probably is still the case. But what we found, certainly in the last dozen years, what has um, been those differences are, are slowly going away as we grow in together, as that web closes in on each other, we realize that we're not as different and distinct as we once thought we were. The issues we're tackling are common. As, as a planner, that's a challenge, but as a community member, I see that as an opportunity because really we are becoming one larger, more broad uh, community. I, I always like to start with this image. I think planners should be able to describe what it is they're doing and, and why they're doing it. In about a dozen, about a dozen years ago, when I went to work for Summit County, I was joined by a long time initial adversary, soon to be colleague, uh, Peter Barnes, who's my planning director at Summit County. And we sat down early upon arrival and tried to figure out what the game plan was going to be. What's our strategy? How do we explain it to people? So we found ourselves over at Bunny's on Main Street in Colville. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Uh, the proprietor brought down the last four bottles of Guinness Stout. Mm -hmm. I, have to, I, have, I have bosses in the room and I want to assure everybody that was after 5 p.m. <laughs> they brought down four dusty Guinness bottles which we slowly worked our way through. And then that idea of trying to explain it, like if we were asked to scratch it up in the dirt or maybe draw it on a bar napkin, what would that look like? This is actually the bar napkin that we ended up with that night. And, and we ended up calling this image the green halo. This is what we're doing and why. And so this is just one. This was starting with the Snyderville Basin. We took a look at the existing landscape, the existing place. And you know we recognized that we had this incredible constellation of neighborhoods and communities that have existed for a very long time that were hung on a network of existing transportation systems. We have Interstate 80, we have SR 224, 248, 40. We hung these communities and neighborhoods on this existing system. That existing system wasn't gonna go away, right? But when we started to hang those those, those stars, those neighborhoods on, on, that, on that system, what we began to realize is that as those grew, as they developed, at the same time, the community took it upon themselves to understand the value of the spaces in between, the open spaces, the recreation, the conservation areas. So on that constellation of communities, we, we've overlaid over the years, this incredible natural system. Trails, critical habitat, recreation areas, wildlife corridor areas, represented by that green halo. Our strategy was, and what we have been working with planning commissions, our county council, our stakeholders outside our local jurisdiction, was to, number one, preserve those existing neighborhoods, enhance them when we can and you know how we can. Um, begin to rethink how that open space functions. At one point in time, the idea behind some of these open space acquisitions was to create a moat to stop development, and nobly so. Right? I got Miles nodding here, right? The old term, the big green moat. The idea isn't to take the moat away or break the moat down, but begin to maybe rethink how that moat works. Rather than a defensive 
strategy, begin to think about how you open that defensive strategy up to integrate and move those open spaces and integrate them into the neighborhoods in order to move ourselves in ways other than just cars, you know, to move ourselves for health and wellness, for recreation, to protect the natural environment, to move our wildlife. That was, that was literally the thinking. Protect the neighborhoods, bring the open space to the degree we can into the neighborhoods, and take advantage of the value of the space in between, because really it's the value of the space in between that creates and maintains the identity of our neighborhoods. We took the same strategy over into the Eastern Summit County area. The whole idea is, can we, working with our partners in the other municipalities, can we, by working with our residents in these unincorporated historical neighborhoods, can we rethink these, these places, make them as self-contained as reasonable, and thereby, thereby keep, the, keep the identity of these areas? That's what our strategy has been over the last dozen years, articulated in both general plans. And it's evolving, but we're still testing that. And I'm gonna go through some of the projects currently that we're testing with. Bill and Miles did a really excellent job of telling about the history of where we are. I'm gonna tell you where we are right now, you know. Um, as, a young, as a young planner, with his toes not touching the bottom of the pool, I remember Miles telling me one time, because he quizzed me. He asked me, like he's kind of probing, he said, Pat, what do planners do? And I think I gave him a really stupid answer, right? He reminded me, planners manage change. That has stuck with me in my entire life, right? That's what we do, is we help manage change. We don't always make the decisions. Um, we don't always end up winning what we'd like to champion in an, in an idea. But our job is, is we facilitate, I'm gonna use a pretty heavy word, we facilitate a pretty sacred public process by which we make decisions on how our communities are going to evolve and change over time. Because again, I always like to remind people that what we do in this whole community building planning business is, you know, I'm, 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 looking, I'm looking at the, the women in the crowd here. You guys will outlive us. You, you live and you're healthy. You're gonna live probably into your 80s or 90s or more. Us men, we, we don't quite, get the health thing all the time, we're gonna live maybe into our 70s. Whether we live to 85 or 65, we live our lives on the backdrop, on a stage. And on that stage, we, we live our lives, we work, we form relationships, we have families, right? It's this thing we call life. What we do together as planners is we create the backdrop, the stage, of our life, and it's really important. And to do that together collectively is important, and to, to be part of that process for me has been a, an incredible privilege. Not easy, but it's easier done together. Let me give you an idea of some of those, like you know the, the green moat, the green halo test, what we're testing it with. I'm gonna show you some projects current now on both the Snyderville Basin and on our Eastern Summit County. I figured I'd get this one first. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know if you've, you've heard of this one. Um, currently, our city council is in the middle of a formal review of a request to amend an already existing county council. County council I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. We're, we're in the middle of reviewing a formal request to amend an existing development agreement for a piece of property out in Kimball Junction. Uh, it goes back to 2008. The original approval was for a tech and research park. Um, what's currently being proposed now is to open up the uses and change those uses. Uh, the original approval going back to 2008, depending on how you wanna read the documents, 
uh, approved over a million square feet of those tech research outdoor industry uses. Uh, the proposal now is to rethink that development agreement, change that development agreement potentially for just shy of 1. Million, uh, 1.3 million square feet. Um, it would involve both a infusion of residential into that area, which wasn't previously allowed. Right now, the current proposal is 727 residential units. Of that, I think 237 of that, 727 would be workforce housing, and around 268,000 square feet of commercial. That commercial could include tech, but it could also include other commercial and retail uses. Uh, we're going through a series of public hearings. No decision's been made. It's an important project for us. The 50 acres that this proposal involves are probably strategically the most important 50 acres in the Kimball Junction area. Everybody understands that how this project functions and flows people cars is gonna be critical to the portal into the Snyderville Basin and to the Park City area. So this is an important test. And that important test is if we're going to rethink over time how our neighborhoods, Kimball Junction included, are gonna evolve and function, this is about as good a test as we're gonna see here in the very near future. <clears throat> a brand new one. Uh, the outlet malls, I still call them the Tanger Outlet Malls, that's the wrong, that's the wrong name. Uh, a proposal to rezone to a mixed use zoning, uh, that's going to involve an increase of about 53,000 overall square feet of development for a total of, I, my notes here say 268,000, uh, proposing 65 residential units second floor. The canyons has, has been over the last, certainly the 10 years, a huge, huge change. A lot of development going on in that area. Uh, when I came to the county, I think we were roughly just shy of 30% built out. The canyons now is well over 50% built out. Uh, one of the obligations under the existing development agreement is to deal with the parking, both skier and employee parking. Uh, there's an obligation. We've received an application for a parking garage to be built in the lower village, uh, multi-story, about 1,800 spaces being uh, proposed. It's located right behind the existing cabriolet. Uh, this will be going to the Planning Commission here in the next month or so. Um, the marketplace at Silver Summit. This is a piece of property directly across the street uh, to the promontory side of Home Depot. Uh, again, another mixed use rezone application. What's being proposed on those 20 acres is about 120,000 square feet of commercial anchored by a 60,000 square foot grocery store and 409 residential units, 235 of those would be workforce housing units, also includes a transit facility. Uh, this is gonna be making its way to our planning commission again within the month. We we're gonna have it at our last meeting, but the applicant, um, smashed his leg, couldn't make it to the meeting. Yeah. So that'll be coming up. Next one, nearby the crossroads at Silver Creek, another rezone request from rural residential, one unit per 20 acres to a mixed use zoning designation. This piece of property sits right at the entrance to Silver Creek off Interstate 80. Not to be confused with Silver Creek Village on the other side of the highway. This is, you know, the old traditional Silver Creek neighborhood. Uh, this proposal right now uh, involves about 78,000 square feet of commercial, small store, uh, community services, daycare, and 163 residential units. Um, also a possible DABC store. Put this on. Um, Quinn's Junction, right over here. We've received a, a, an application for uh, a Maverick service station. Uh, recently, uh, the Planning Commission forwarded a positive recommendation to adjust 
the land uses in the zone to allow for such uses to be created. Um, application soon to follow kind of shows where in the highlighted in yellow where that proposed area is. It's interesting for me because where we're sitting right now, when, a, when this piece of ground was annexed into the city, the big question was at the time, you know, do we need to have some sort of neighborhood commercial where you can, you know, get gas, you, you know, get something to eat if you're playing out at the fields here at, you know, the, um, or over at the ice rink. The decision was made at the time, no, too, too premature. The concept behind this is, is the time right? Is this the best location? If we can siphon off some traffic that has to drive into Park City to get services, can we, can we accommodate that here in the junction? Well, we're gonna find out here really, really soon, but that's soon to hit the Planning Commission as well. Um, Klein Dolly. Klein Dolly is a 29 acre piece of property off of Rasmussen Road between the Summit Center and the Jeremy Ranch School. We've just begun a conversation with the council to rethink what that piece of property might be. Several years ago when we acquired the property, we were considering maybe a, you know, a park and ride transit center out there. Roundabouts weren't built, so we held off, ended up putting the park and ride across the street. Now we're looking what those potentials are. We had our very first discussion with the council last week. We're gonna come back, you know, kind of download on everything we heard and then begin a public engagement program to begin to think what the community's thoughts are on that area. Exciting project for us. Uh, 910 Cattle Ranch, put that up there as well. 8,700 acre uh, acquisition by Summit County, just lying uh, on the other side of Jeremy Ranch up to the Salt Lake County. I always said this is like our equivalent to the Alaska acquisition, right? You know, they may have called it Seward's Folly, but I do not believe at the end of the day when they look back a generation uh, from now that they're going to be calling it anything close to a folly. They're going to think this was a courageous, bold acquisition. Let's move over really quick because I'm running out of time to Eastern Summit County. Bill touched on all the activity that's happening on the Wasatch back. I want to point out one that's really important and we're in the middle of it right now. Between Wanship and Colville is one of those little historic villages, unincorporated Hoytsville. What we're considering right now is a large area plan, a village overlay, which is a ground up approach. Develop a land plan with the original property owners, the idealized community in their mind. What would that include? Take the land plan to a broader discussion, which would include sort of the implementation strategies, you know, the zoning, how you make it work from an infrastructure standpoint, how do you phase that over time? When we started out with this, the 26 property owners said they wanted really these things. They wanted a cradle to grave community. They didn't want a closed gate, you know, a gated resort subdivision. They wanted a place that they could define as their own, including those who are there now, their kids, but residents in the future. 1,100 acres, a big <coughs> geographic area. The current proposal is a maximum density of up to four units per acre. Easy to do the math, right? We're talking over 4,000 residential units, which is for many, a lot to absorb. What we're working through now is that public hearing process, not only to analyze sort of the carrying capacity and the market associated with this, but can this be done? Can this be phased in a way over time that really creates a community with a strong sense of place? Rather than maybe allowing the future to be dictated by smaller incremental growth and luck. It's currently at the Planning Commission. We've got another big public hearing on the 29th. Uh, ultimately, the Planning Commission will forward a recommendation to the County Council. Uh, but that, for us, is a really, really, if you're talking about a big project on the east side, that's really the big project on the east side. And then to finish up uh, the Your Ranch. Uh, last year, our County Council, not the City Council, County Council entered into an agreement to acquire 834 acres 
of the Camus Meadow land from the Ur family. We're going through an engagement process again to get input from the community about their thoughts on this. Critical to this piece of property is a preservation of the Camus Meadow uh, riparian areas, those really important drain inlets for basically the water for a third of the state of Utah. And so no final decisions are made. We're working on that, but that kind of gives you a glimpse of, you know, you know, what we're managing for change. That, that's, that's where we're at right now. And Miles, again, thank you for the chance to speak to everyone here this morning. I appreciate it. It's nice to age with so many nice people. <laughs> um, we're going to hear from Matt Crower and about um, the downtown Heber City plan, which we think is really important. Um, I've always maintained that um, Heber Valley is the, um, is the most beautiful valley in the state of Utah, quite frankly, second to none. So they have uh, a lot to work on over there with the North Fields, the bypass roads, downtown, all those things. Um, and <clears throat> when we talk about the Wasatch back now, we're talking about all of us in this trying to figure this out together because we all have to live together. Matt, thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know. I'm good shot there. Well, that's coming Daniel's up. Good at this. Well, that's coming up. I got to ask, is that traffic something you face every day? Every day. Reminds me of when I lived near Atlanta. I was like, that's crazy. That's, I didn't know if I was going to make it on time. Which one are we doing? It is going to be that one right there. Perfect. And that remote is where? Uh, right there. There. All right. <laughs> All right, uh, thank you for having me. I'm carrying the, the water for Wasatch County and Heber today and happy to do so. I want to take just a moment and applaud you for a moment for spending the time and resources to be here and getting engaged and getting informed about what your communities are facing and doing. You know, increasingly people are relying upon social media for their data and their facts, of course, and that's of course, probably not the best way to get your data and facts. So congratulations to you. I applaud you for being here and being engaged and know what's going on. So I've been asked to talk about the transformation underway in downtown Hebron. I'm excited to be here and tell you a bit about that. As I tell you this story, please. You're probably just gonna have to push one of these buttons like that, is we that okay? That. Yeah. I want to begin by taking you back in time. Downtown Heber, for over 100 years, was the economic engine, the employment center for Wasatch County and Heber City. During that time, it was a place people went to shop. It was a place they went to entertain, to dine, to hang out, to be seen. There was the J.C. Penney's. There was a five and dime. There were clothing stores and a shoe store. Uh, two movie theaters. The Avon Theater, which is here on the right, opened up in the... Uh, mid-40s, it was a place to go. It was a fun place where things were happening. However, uh, as Pat indicated, things change over time. And that began to change in the 60s and slowly gain momentum in the 70s and 80s. What happened was first the I-80 construction through Parley's Canyon. It was Park City becoming a destination place. It was Highway 40 being expanded to four lanes. It was Provo Canyon going from two narrow lanes to the, what you see today, uh, four very high-speed lanes going between Wasatch County and Utah County. And what that meant was that residents in Wasatch County and Heber could now be more mobile. They could get into Utah County in under 30 minutes. And when they did that, what did they find? They found more shopping opportunities, more dining opportunities, more, more items to do and things to see. And downtown Heber, transitioned from a destination to a pass-through town where people pass through and they may stop now for a hamburger, maybe a tank of gas, maybe a bag of ice. I'm sure many of you have done that, you know, on your way to Strawberry Reservoir or to Deer Creek Reservoir. And so what we're hoping to do is to convert it back into a destination community. You know, as, as downtown saw that transformation from being a destination through a pass-through, what this graph is showing is 
in red all the buildings that were built before 1925. Orange was before 1949, yellow 1975. The main point here is there's been very little investment in the heart of downtown Heber. It's happening at the ends. And you've seen this throughout the country where the downtowns would die because the investment was taking place in the green fields nearby. And so Heber engaged an initiative called Envision Central Heber for the purpose of trying to reimagine, as Pat indicated, rethink the downtown to make it something very special again. Envision Central Heber focused on three areas. It was Main Street, Highway 40 through the heart of town, the central neighborhoods located to the east and west of Highway 40, and the Recreation and Torum District, which includes the Heber Valley Railroad area, if you can picture that in your mind's eye. Why Envision Central Heber? We had two really desired results. One was a broadly supported long-term vision and plan with enough detail to implement supportive policy investments. Essentially, we want to transition downtown to a destination, not just for visitors, but for the residents, for private investment. We want to make it appealing for people to spend time downtown, to see this as an extension of their living room, to bring their family and friends in, that come in town to spend time and, and hang out. And of course, if, the heart of down, if downtown is the heart, it's got to be a strong heart. We want to make it a, strong, a stronger heart for Heber. So what I want to share with you in the next few slides is the vision, this vision that came about because of Envision Central Heber. And this was a community-driven initiative. This is a picture of, of the central town. Highway 40 is right here to the right. One west is to the left. This is from a drone sitting over the main city park that I'm sure you're familiar with, looking due north. And you can see most of the buildings there are quite old, not had a lot of investment, but what we've done is reimagine it, re-envision it. And what we've seen here is you notice a pedestrian corridor now that will go between Highway 40 and 1 West that will hook up and connect those blocks. You'll notice Highway 40 now being landscape medians, mid-block crossings, wider sidewalks. You'll see that we're trying to get more private investment so the buildings are newer, more modern, more interesting, and more sophisticated. This is looking closer into that pedestrian walkway. Um, think of Pearl Street, Colorado and Boulder. Think of uh, Duval Street in Key West, Florida. It's intended to be an active place with dining and shopping and farmer's markets and places to hang out again and be seen. What we're also trying to do is increase the living and working opportunities on Main Street. As Pat indicated, to have that mix of residential with commercial is a critical mix to make sure it's, it's sustainable for the long term. This is the block that is actually three blocks north of the Main City Park. This is the Tabernacle. This is where Heber City offices are. The square building to the lower left is where the Wasatch County Admin Building uh, is, their functions. And what we've done is re-envision it looking at potentially buying that property and turning it into a conference center, another attractor for the downtown area to, for people to spend time and money. And what we're hoping to do is, is activate and connect public spaces on Main Street, making it more interesting. We're also trying to do is enliven the streets in the Main Street area, providing places of interest and comfort. We hired Roger Brooks, who is a world-renowned uh, urban planner who focuses on re revamping downtowns. He's talked about downtown being seen as an extension of your living room. Why? Because it's got to be seen as something that's comfortable, something that the locals will go to first, and then, of course, bring their guests and the people that are coming to town. There are, in politics, timing is everything. And for us, we are on the precipice of some great timing. Why? Because there's three events that are in our zone of influence and on the horizon. The first is this Mayflower Resort. I hope you hear more about this today. This is going to be a game changer for Wasatch County and Heber City. This is going to be a major investment. But the main point is, if you look at the red down there on the bottom, a study done by MIDA is that the People that will spend time at the Mida Resort are going to spend about $400 million per year there. $400 million. And they're indicating that they'll stay there on an average of five to seven days, five days at the resort, two days exploring the area. Our goal is to get them into Heber. Our goal is to get them into Heber to drop that money so we can benefit from that. So that's the first one. The second one is the Heber Valley Corridor. This is the bypass that you've heard about many times. The uh, project is under study right now by UDOT, completing their EIS. They will announce this summer the preferred alignment. 
Once that is announced, we'll begin lobbying the legislature to get that built as fast as we can. And when that's built, it's going to pull all the heavy truck traffic off of downtown. This is the heavy truck traffic that comes from the Uinta Basin, bringing the oil through. That will be moved over to the bypass, allowing us to make some amazing change to the downtown to bring about that vision we talked about. And the third one, which I know you know about, is the Olympics, the 2034 Olympics. This, the Olympics are now in what's called targeted discussions. I know Colin Hilton is speaking, I think, after me. He'll tell you more about this. But Heber City is going to take a more strategic role in those Olympics. We've already talked to Colin Hilton. We're going to have live sites in Heber. We are going to have fan experience events. We are going to bring the parking for Soldier Hollow closer to downtown. So as people come off the hillside, they will spend time in downtown dropping their money and hopefully spending a lot more time. So what I want to do is jump into some of the specific investments we'll be making beginning this year to bring about that vision. And we're looking at really a four block area. This is a better picture of that. I mentioned the park that's on the left. We have the town square, which has that tabernacle building where the city offices are. Then we have the two commercial blocks in between. That's where we envision that pedestrian alley that I showed you earlier. So what I want to do is dive in this just really quickly. Notice Highway 40, landscape medians, mid-block crossings, wider sidewalks. That is going under design here shortly so that once that bypass is done, we will transition to making these improvements along Highway 40. We talked about the pedestrian corridor. As Pat indicated, we are rethinking that, putting in place right now the zoning ordinances and the text amendments to make sure that will happen. We are also putting in place a CRA that we can use to use as seed money to work with investors to make these types of investments that you see right here. This is 200 South. This is the street that sits due north of our main city park. A bid went out yesterday to convert this into a festival street. This is between Highway 40 and 1 West. This is being patterned after Fort Collins, Colorado. They have similar festival streets made out of pavers. They're curbless. And this is what the design is going to feel awful lot like here. You'll notice the proposed band shell that sits halfway in the festival street as well as facing into the park. We'll have the ability to place concerts in there that will, that will focus into that pedestrian alley as well as focus into the main city park. This is that band shell here. This is the stage that faces into the main city park. This is the design. It's being designed after an old uh, Daughters of Utah Pioneers building using the same material, the same colors. Um, this is going out to bid next week. So this will be realized by early September. On the top is the band shell I just told you about. The, the orange circle are future investments that we're planning right now. We intend to load downtown Heber with 250 days of activities and events throughout the year. Why? Because we want people to see downtown as an extension of the living room, to come downtown and spend time and money. I mentioned Roger Brooks. Roger is, is under contract to design this area now. We're not sure exactly what it's going to end up being, but it will be designed in a way to support 250 days of activities. Of course, with all these changes, it means parking is going to be at a premium. And so we are working with Wasatch County and Heber Light Power to purchase these two lots to initially install an additional 126 parking stalls. I imagine in time, this will probably have some type of parking structure on it as this becomes more popular and a place for people to hang out and be seen. This is a water feature that is under construction as we speak, adjacent to the Tabernacle building. If you go in front of the Tabernacle on a weekend during the summer, you'll see 50 to 75 people out there picnicking and dining. This is to enhance that experience, so of course, to get more people in the downtown area. So those are the major investments that will be taking place in 2024. There's some fun things I want to share with you in the final two or three minutes I've got. And this is Operation Flower Pots. We are challenging all of the businesses in downtown to place flower pots in front of their businesses so that they become more friendly, more curb appeal, and more pedestrian oriented. This will be kicking off in the spring of 24. We also have our Art and Public Places program that will be going into year five next year. Year one was this mural on the north wall of the, of the Chamber of Commerce building. You see this as you come into downtown. This one was done in year two. The detail in this one is amazing. These are, are part of that overall mural. The detail is, if you're not seeing this, then I would say go find this and take a look at it. It is so amazing. This was the third uh, phase. This was done right across the street from Tabernacle Building. And the fourth phase was done just about two months ago. 
It is this here. It is uh, two brown trout on the backside of a laundromat right next to the PD uh, building that we have in downtown Heber. And we'll have, like I said, our fifth mural in 24. We also have Operation Curb Appeal, where we're going to be putting historical wraps on all of our utility boxes throughout the downtown. This box here is actually a picture taken in Pearl Street, Colorado, actually in Boulder, Colorado. We're going to be stealing a page from their playbook and putting murals, sorry, uh, historic wraps on the utility boxes in the same way they've done. And I've noticed that you guys paint your utility boxes here. We're going to copy that play and do the same thing in Heber City as well. And so, that is my story, I'm sticking to it, and you're gonna see a lot of great things happening in Heber in the very short run. Thank you. That's great, man. Thank you. Wow, what exciting stuff, you know? I didn't even know most of that was happening. That's, that is just wonderful. Uh, Jess, you coming up here? Okay. What did I do? Going this way? This way? I don't know how that works. Daniel? <laughs> we'll, get our, we'll get Daniel up here. He, he knows how to do all that. See, I'll have like 15 minutes. Yeah. 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 Which one are we the, doing? Uh, that one. Sorry. <laughs> this is uh, Jess Kirby, and um, she's going to talk about the open space. Pat talked about it a little bit, but um, it's a central part of what we do here is preserving open space because um, most people don't realize this, but unlike the Colorado <coughs> towns as they're surrounded by national forests and BLM land and things like that, most of the land up here is privately owned. So in order to keep the nice environment, we've had to buy open space. Just gonna... Thanks, Miles. I don't know if that's going to work. You think? Yes, I think we just, just going to have to push. Push that, that one. Yeah. Okay, that works for me. Okay, can everybody hear me? Good. Um, so hi, I'm Jess Kirby. I work for Summit County. I'm our Directors of Lands and Natural Resources. Um, very grateful to be here. Um, thanks, Miles, for the invitation. It is... Um, most of you probably know, but Miles is instrumental in a lot of the open space that we have in our community as well. So he deserves um, kudos um, for everything we're speaking about today. But um, he asked me to speak about saving vital open space in Summit County. Um, there was a little bit of discussion already and I'll dive deeper into that. Uh, this photograph is the 910 cattle ranch that's already been mentioned and I'll get into that a little bit more here in a minute. I'm also a class of uh, 24. There we go. <laughs> Best class ever. That's what Miles always says. Um, and we're not now. There we go. Okay, so just um, like Miles said, it is very unique that our county has almost a 50-50 split of federal and private land. Um, in Utah, it's uh, usually more on the federal side. And so we've got a great opportunity to preserve land in our community. And you all should be proud of yourselves because we're doing a really, really great job um, as we go through. And I'll show you there. We've got about 3% of state lands, 44% of federal lands, 53% of uh, private lands in our county. Um, so when you break that into what's protected, uh, it's about 53% of our county is protected in some way, and that includes uh, private, that includes federal, that includes state, and that includes um, uh, golf courses, HOA lands, stuff like that. So that's the big overview picture. Um, the rest of it is about 47% that is not protected in our county. Um, but when you look at the map, you'll see there's a heavy concentration in the Snyderville Basin, um, and that is very intentional. We've been running bonds for several years in this area in Park City, Snyderville area, and we've had great community support to put lands in the, into preservation. Um, but you'll see the rest of the county is, has been, a, as Miles said, the, our stepchild over there. Somebody said it today, where it's the eastern side of our county is a little bit of a stepchild. And so um, the future of our open space preservation is really focusing on what can be preserved as growth um, expands over into the east side and um, what we can do to mimic um, the land protection that we've done on our west side of our county. 
So who's saving lands in Summit County? Um, these logos here, I'm probably missing some, but these are the big players that are out there. Um, Basin Rec in our um, western side of the county has a significant open space, about 2,000 acres. Park City also has significant open space. Um, but most, most of you might not know, like DNR is uh, a, a conservation easement holder and actively goes after um, uh, open space preservation, the forestry department. Uh, the USDA through NRCS, I'm gonna throw out a lot of acronyms, that's what I do in my, in my job, but the NRCS is the um, Natural Resource uh, Committee for the state. Um, the US Forest Service, of course, is our UDAF, is our um, agricultural protection agencies. And then we've got cities involved, we've got Swanner Preserve, the university, and of course, our two big players in land trusts, um, uh, Utah Open Lands and Summit Lands Conservancy here in our area. Um, and I bring these two up because they are very special to our community and they need to be praised for what they've done. Um, <laughs> Wendy Fisher was in class one, uh, Cheryl was in class four. Uh, the project of the 1998 class was to create the open space um, preservation in Summit County, and it was called COOL. <laughs> Who knew that? Anybody? <laughs> a couple of you. Um, so, and now it's not called cool, it's called Summit Lands Conservancy, but conservation, or conserving our open lands, cool, um, was started as a class project out of this leadership group. And um, I think we should all be grateful for this program to have brought this because what has come from this is just incredible. And I'll show you this going on. Um, but Wendy and, and Cheryl were both very instrumental in, in getting open space and still are very instrumental in getting open space into our community. And how much? So over the last 30 years, this is the properties that those two women have put under conservation. I mean, I, like, seriously, <laughs> it's for over 40,000 acres, which equates to 6.2% of our private holdings in our county. That's a huge amount of, of land. And that also should be giving a hand to yourselves because they can't do it without the donations that all of us do um, to that organization. So. Um, and this does not include what um, the cities, what the counties have put into conservation. This is just private um, conservation efforts. Some of them are held by city ownership, but it is truly incredible. And so that's not all, right? So when you look at um, the Snyderville Basin area where that circle was, there's, we're doing pretty good with conservation. Everything that has a shade other than the light uh, gray, and I will say like these light green, those are included, that's the mountain resorts are in there. Um, we've got some state lands in there. The purple is the county ownership. Uh, the light kind of uh, sea foam is Basin Rack, yellow is uh, Swanner Preserve, and then the uh, orange is Park City. So we do have a heavy concentration of, of wanting to preserve our lands, um, put those buffers around our communities. Uh, I think Swanner is a really great example of that huge buffer, I think there was 20, maybe Pat knows if he's st still here, there was like 2,100 homes or something platted out in the middle of the meadow. And now we've got you know rangeland for our elk, we've got open space for that buffering our community, we call that view shed. Um, so that is just an overall look. And, and you'll see in there too, like up in Promontory, we, we put in um, for preservation golf courses. And sometimes that's a little controversial, but it is habitat. Um, <laughs> we all see the elk sitting out in Jeremy Ranch, right, during the winter. Um, so those areas, even though that they are developed open space, they're still considered making those corridors and preserving those connectivity for wildlife and, and for our viewshed community. So what's next and how is Summit County preserving land now? Um, thanks to you all in the room who voted in 2021 for the $50 million bond uh, because it did pass overwhelmingly and we are um, working very hard to spend that money. It's a lot of fun to spend that much money. Um, as you probably know, we are a little bit in debt right now of our uh, request for, for money, but we are working very diligently to uh, leverage dollars. And that's really the goal of this bond that we're doing. Um, we are trying not to just use our bond funds. We're trying to do a one-to-one -one and even a one-to-five on every dollar that we have in the bond um, to create more opportunity through grants, through partnerships, uh, so that we can preserve more and more land. These are the three um, properties so far that we have, um, that have we've preserved with that $50 million bond. Um, the uh, Anders Family Farm was our first one as a conservation easement brought by Summit Lands Conservancy. 
And then, of course, we've already talked about the Year Ranch um, and the 910 Ranch, which are both fee title um, acquisitions. So difference between conservation and fee title, conservation easements stay in the private hands, the landowner hands, and the fee title comes to the county and we would actually own the land. We can put our own conservation easement on it as we go. So what do these partnerships look for? Look, look like? Um, like I was saying, we are trying to focus on the east side of our county right now. Um, we have a critical meadow. You all know the Camas Meadows, the aquifer that feeds the Weber River, which eventually gets down to the Great Salt Lake. It's a critical water source for our area. We, you know, we don't have a lot of water in our county. When you go look at the Weber River, you can almost jump over it half the time. You know, and that's our major source of water in our county. Um, Summit County has the headwaters of seven different watersheds. We have a big responsibility for downstream um, beneficiaries to protect these lands. And this meadow is a huge um, piece of that. The soils in this meadow are critical. Um, they've been identified and recognized as critical soils. Um, and this map is showing a partnership between Summit Lands Conservancy and um, Summit County. We've gone after several uh, grants, the RCPP, and here's more, more acronyms, right? And the AL, ALE, which are agricultural land protection um, grants that come through the NRCS that I mentioned before. Uh, they, you know, Summit Lands, hands down, <laughs> you know, another, Round of applause for them. They have, they have um, secured $22 million from that RCPP and they've secured $19 million for four different properties. Uh, just this week was announced, um, which of which 6.2 million will be put directly to the year ranch, um, leveraging those dollars I was talking about. Uh, this map here shows those critical soils and some potential properties that we're, that we're looking at to, to put under conservation easement and some of those will be showcasing soon. So what are, where are our recent acquisitions for those fee titles? Um, there's a couple, of the big monster over there, the 910 Cattle Ranch, right outside of uh, Jeremy Ranch. It's at the very end of Jeremy Ranch Golf Course um, in between Jeremy Ranch and the East Canyon uh, State Park. And it's about 9,000 acres. It's incredibly gorgeous. Um, I encourage everyone to go out and look. And then the Year Ranch is out in the Camas Meadows um, and we'll dive deep into those. Both of them have incredible conservation values for their own reasons. Um, you know, the Year Ranch preserving uh, our rural heritage, our um, connection to agriculture or land and, you know, working the, working the land and of course the meadow and then the 910 Ranch being that high alpine forest um, that could also have been, both of them could have also put several homes on those and been developed and locked up out of, in private hands, so. So here's a couple photographs, um, some of them courtesy of the park record and some from our internal staff. But this is the Year Ranch. It's, it's absolutely beautiful out there in the morning as the sun comes up over the, the ridge and there's you know frost on the, on the fields. And there is something idyllic about seeing a cow out in the meadow. And I know it's sometimes controversial, you know, of the impacts that cows and you know, rangelands can have. But done right, it is really a great way to keep meadows green. Um, it keeps the weeds out that, you know, um, so we're really excited to do um, uh, conservation grazing out there, rotational grazing out there, um, and just some details about the property there, 835 acres, um, and the costs and what we're looking for for that bottom line. The 910 Cattle Ranch, again, it's just an expansive open space um, down there at Jeremy Ranch in the Snyderville Basin. Uh, 8,588 acres to be specific. Um, it was a $55 million ask and we do have a significant grant that we're hoping to hear from in about a week, I hope, um, that will get us to the finish line on this one. So everybody uh, pray to your gods um, <laughs> that this funding is coming our way. Um, it will definitely um, tip us over into the right direction for this property. <coughs> Um, it has five miles of East Canyon Creek, which is again our other source of water, um, the only, basically the only source of water in the eastern, or yeah, uh, western Summit County. Um, so it's a critical piece of land, not only for habitat, but for recreation, open space, view shed, all of the above. So what's next um, to continually um, actively pursue the protection of land? You know, we're just going to keep keep on keeping on. This is this is what we do. I'm following in the great footsteps of, you know, Miles, Cheryl, and Wendy. Um, we'll just keep doing that. 
Um, we do have several conservation easements that will be showcased in the next few months, so uh, keep your eyes on the paper and in the, in the, on the radio. Um, really excited about the ones that are coming down the line. Um, and then p continue public engagement because that feedback from all of you is, is what makes this happen. And um, without your votes and without your support behind the program, we can't do this. So um, please continue to reach out to us. And then just wanted to put a shout out. We are having a second open house um, for the Year Ranch, and that will be um, at, at the, Cam the South Summit Service Building in Camas on the 29th. And I'll just throw that. I don't know if we have time for questions, but put that there. There's my contact if anybody wants to reach out. So thank you. Thank you, Jess. And um, in a minute, we'll take a break. But we've come so far in, in uh, preserving open space. Uh, Bill Coleman will remember this. When we decided to buy what was then we called the Osgothorpe Ranch, now the McPowan barn and ranch. Um, that was a very, very controversial purchase for us. Um, people don't realize, but the first plan that came across my desk as planning director in those days, 1987, was for a Smith Super Center. That was what was going to go out on, on the ranch there. And, um, and Dr. Osgothorpe at the time, who's since passed away, but he didn't, he didn't like the city very much. In fact, he hated us. And um, luckily, uh, UDOT was talking about it was only a two-lane road, and every day the road was closed twice a day when the cows walked back and forth because they grazed on one side, but the milking barn was on the other side. So twice a day we closed the road and the cows went back and forth, which was very romantic uh, for about the first week, and then after that, got real sick of that. But uh, when UDOT talked about um, widening the road. Luckily, he hated UDOT more than he hated us. And he always said to us, well, if you want my, you know, my land, take out your checkbook. Luckily, we were able to put together four and a half million dollars, and that's what we purchased. So with that four and a half million dollars, we purchased that barn and that ranch, and we also purchased um, PC Hill. It was the front of the PC Hill by the high school. Now, the funny part of the story is there was, it was a dairy operation that he had there. And then for years after that, I would get calls. I guess it, I, I didn't realize, but there's a, you know, in those days, I guess it still is, there's a magazine. I'm looking for Chris, because he knows. There's a magazine for every specialty. So there's some magazine for dairy ranchers. And I guess they put in there how Dr. Osgothorpe sold us his ranch for four and a half million dollars. So for years, I would get calls, like from Minnesota, and Michigan, hey, we got a deal for you, you know? For $2 million, we'll give you 300 acres up here. And I said, well, you're just a little out of our range here. But so sometimes, you know, you do things and they pay off later on. Okay, we're going to take a 10 minute break now. It's not a lot of time. We have a lot of great speakers after that. I believe there's still some food. Uh, Paige is there. We have coffee. What else do we have, Cage? Coffee and water, some food outside, 10 minutes, there's bathrooms. Um, <clears throat> I guess you heard that maybe we're going to have an Olympics here again. And, that, <clears throat> and the guy to talk about that is right here, Colin Hilton. He and I were, he came here with the Olympics uh, uh, to do the 2002 Olympics and uh, did a fabulous job. He liked it so much here that he decided to move here after that raise his family here a little bit more. He and I worked together all these years. We were just talking. And right now, 22 years ago at the Olympics, it started February 8th, 2002. So here we are. So we have, uh, before lunch, we have you know, both Colin speaking. We're going to talk about real estate trends, sustainable tourism, and the future of our schools. So we have a very packed agenda. Thank you for paying attention. Colin, it's all yours, buddy. Well, good morning. I have to say, <clears throat> I got a big smile on my face because I had the best powder run right before coming here. So, <laughs> and I earned it. I, I skinned up uh, Utalabic Park and took our new runs down there. So, um, and I somehow made it here through the traffic, which is really bad still. But thank you. And uh, to talk a little bit about um, Utah's Olympic future, I, I do want to first uh, talk about um, 
the past and through our current day, just to give you a little context of why our community loves the Olympic and Paralympic Games and throughout the state. It's one of those things that uh, is got bipartisan support. Everybody, whether you're Republican or Democrat or independent, people like this. So we need more of these topics. Um, and we've got a really interesting history of how the games even came here. And so I'm gonna give a real brief two slides um, about, um, I think, a really interesting history. So um, thank you for all taking the time. I'm sure each of the speakers, we, I've been doing this with Miles for, gosh, almost 20 years. Uh, Miles has had me come and give a little update uh, about um, Park City, Summit County, and the history of the games being here and the legacy efforts and what our future holds. So I feel really pri privileged to be running the Utah Olympic Legacy Foundation. And I'm the foundation's based at the Olympic Park, but we also look after Soldier Hollow in the Heber Valley and the Utah Olympic Oval down in Salt Lake and Kearns. Um, all of the Olympic venues that nobody in their right mind would want to run after an Olympics. Um, they are highly subsidized and very difficult to, to keep going. But Utah had a plan. And the history is, uh, very briefly, if anybody remembers the Calgary Games in 1988, the US team did not do really well. And if anybody knows baseball, um, the US Olympic Committee hired George Steinbrenner, the owner of the Yankees, to actually commission a blue ribbon panel to determine why the United States was not performing well at the, at the Calgary Games. And to sort of sum it up, the main issue was all of uh, the athletes were having to go to Canada or to Europe to train and to uh, per, um, have adequate facilities to train and compete on. And so the recommendation to the US Olympic Committee at the time was find a place in the United States that is willing to invest in infrastructure to train in all the varieties of winter sport. And obviously skiing and snowboarding were popular in Utah, but all of the other sports of uh, freestyle aerials and moguls and um, uh, ice skating and uh, uh, hockey, speed skating, uh, a whole variety of sports that didn't have facilities for athletes and coaches to train at. Leaders in Utah were also really interested to host the Olympics dating back into the 1970s, but it really picked up in the late 80s when this report came out. And community leaders and sport leaders, elected officials got together and, and actually got a voter referendum to support uh, putting tax dollars to build original facilities of what is now called the Utah Olympic Park was called Utah Winter Sports Park. Uh, the Ogden Ice Sheet, and an outdoor speed skating oval in Kearns. And with that funding, uh, the elected officials of the state said, if we ever get the games, we want that money paid back, plus a legacy foundation. And this was all, you know, building up to 1990. So that was voter referendum, um, over 80% support of that. And the Utah Winter Sports Park was built locally. Um, I think Miles and Charlie Windsor and others were very involved with trying to find a location here. And um, in 19, uh, and so the facilities were started to get built. The Olympic Park uh, was opened in 1993. And in 1994, a whole bunch of folks actually put together what is the original uh, powers and purposes of a legacy foundation and passed at the state legislature with lots of support. And that is the basis of my legacy foundation today of my articles of incorporation and bylaws go back to a state resolution in 1994. And so I feel really proud of those early leaders who shaped this vision. Other Olympic city, host cities like Lillehammer started the environmental pillar of the Olympic movement. I would dare say our efforts here in Utah really elevated uh, the legacy component, not just building and hosting a three-week sporting event, but thinking about what you do with those facilities years after. So I have a one-page strategic plan summary. I won't bore you with that, other than to say uh, 
we, we value all ages, all ability of uses. It's not just high uh, elite athlete facilities. They're very much geared for youth development. Participation is the focus. And with our nonprofit mission, uh, you can see I won't read these, uh, but we're very much not just a facility operator, but a program administrator as well. How many kids, or how many uh, of you in the room have had kids in Park City Ski and Snowboard, just by a show of hands? So there's over a thousand kids in that program. They're actually, um, we're the parent entity and uh, they have a separate board, but we kind of do all the administrative side of that. And with a thousand kids in the program with all options, uh, all ages, all abilities, that's our focus. And uh, we're four times busier in use of our facilities today than right after the O2 games in these legacy venues. Nobody can say that. So, um, so that's, that's been uh, key efforts over the, over the time. And know that in O2, the state funds were paid back with interest and left a $76 million surplus for an endowment to operate these facilities and programs. So over time, nobody thought that would last 20 years, but it has. Um, and we're still trying to get to an in perpetuity financial status, but we do need another games to help re-endow that. Our, our legacy fund, as we call it, is at about 44 million today. Earns about 2.75 million in investment earnings, and that's what allows us to subsidize the facilities. So what were the impacts of the O2 games? Everybody will have a different perspective. These are my top bullet points. Uh, we overcame a major obstacle of hosting these games. 9-11 was five months before uh, the start of the games, and for those that may have been here, uh, it was the world coming together like I've never seen before. It was incredible, and we had a lot of um, excellent planning. We had luck with the weather, and we had great collaboration, which I'm sure you'll hear this collaboration theme is, is very important uh, in our region here. It increased uh, infrastructure improvements, not just for winter sport facilities, but uh, the Old Town Transit Center got funding from the federal government. Uh, I-15 down in the valley had a plan to get improved, but it got accelerated because of the game's date. And that'll be a theme you'll, you'll hear me talk about. It boosted athlete training in Utah, prompted major event hosting and entities like our foundation and the Sports Commission to make um, Utah much more uh, known for hosting events of all varieties. It mostly elevated the awareness and image of Utah. And I'm sure um, um, you'll, you've heard about that a lot. And, uh, at this point, we don't have to do that much now. Uh, I think everybody knows where Utah is and Park City, and, and those are sort of the issues of managing growth going forward. Um, for me, one of those great things that generated pride and a sense of community, and those efforts, I think, um, uh, really uh, made Utah think we can do anything and a lot of the communities have taken that and run with it. And I, I believe uh, the games and a lot of other factors is why Utah has grown as much as it has. So what about a future games? Uh, here are some key talking points. Uh, we're one of the rare places in the world that have all of 100% of the facilities used in O2 are being used today. I'm sure many of you have seen those images on online of venues that are built and then not used. We have had a plan, we use them, we use them as community recreation centers just as much as elite athlete training facilities. Uh, Utah loves the games um, and we have a high level of public support. Uh, most of the polling is over 80% support through the state. Um, we um, also indicators like NBC, whether it's Winter Olympics or Summer Olympics, uh, our local um, network by percentage is always number one in the country of viewership for watching Olympic and Paralympic games. Um, a 2034 game, so I think a lot of you have heard it was 30 or 34. Uh, 
I was in favor of the earlier um, uh, version, but now I'm embracing the 34 games because it provides a really interesting 10-year run-up period that I think will allow us to tie um, a lot of key visiony ideas that communities have uh, as a catalyst and a deadline uh, to be able to shoot for to get certain things done. And I'll come back to that. Uh, Utah is excited and ready to engage new generations of Utah in hosting this worldwide event. Given Utah's relative young population, I think in 2034, the percentage of forecasts is almost 35 or 40% of the population wasn't even born by the time we get to 2034. So um, we're excited to share a new generation with young athletes and young people in our communities. Uh, and that the game's costs are covered by broadcast rights, sponsors, donors, ticketing revenues, other local government incremental costs, as it was in 02, will be covered. So cost of added police, security, um, increased um, code enforcement, all those kind of local government costs. We do a, a, an agreement with the local governments to be able to pay for that incremental cost above their baseline. So that... Uh, most people in the, in the world don't believe that, right? Uh, it's true, and we did it in the past. Um, we have a games concept plan that with a one village based at the University of Utah, all of our venues are within an hour's drive of, of the University of Utah's athlete village. A lot of, um, like Milan Cortina that is hosting in Italy in 2026 and France in 2030, we'll have three to four villages spread around the country. So we're one of those unique geographical locations where everything is gonna be centered very compactly. And that's really fun for the atmosphere of, of all the people that are attending either as athletes, coaches, or visitors, uh, or locals coming or here for those events. So we're up north in Snow Basin for the Alpine events. We're as far south as Provo for our Hockey 2 venue, uh, a large cluster around the Salt Lake City area and a cluster around the Park City area. Um, Deidre and Todd with uh, Park City and Deer Valley, uh, Altera, Vale, have been wonderful to work with. Uh, we have um, all of our venue use agreements already done 10 years out. This is unheard of in most places. So we have... Um, 100% of our uh, major competition venues and major non-comp venues under contract. Yeah, I think there was a story in the last week uh, about all the hotel rooms we already have under contract. Uh, and we've got great relations with NGVs, our national governing bodies. So the timeline of what this looks like uh, from now, um, uh, well, I'll take a step back. You heard a lot of news in December, uh, end of November, early December, we were in what was called a continuous dialogue and got moved to a term called targeted dialogue. And that means they have identified France for 2030 winter games and Utah for 2034. And we're the only ones identified for those respective years. So we're in what I would call a due diligence period until an official award at the Paris games this summer at the end of July and, and that official announcement uh, will be sometime um, either July 23rd or 24th. We're hoping for the 24th to save on fireworks and everything else going on through the state. Um, but you'll see, we have to get all of like a thousand pages of materials submitted at the end of February. Uh, we're gonna have a visit in April from the IOC's, what they call the Future Host Commission. You'll see a bunch of uh, hubbub about that uh, with lots of coverage of their visit in April. And then there is uh, the executive board of the IOC puts their recommendation. Everything is lined up. It would be very strange to see it not get awarded. There would have to be some worldwide events or something that happens that we don't get assigned this. So that's the timeline. Um, I wanted uh, to highlight just a little bit of what the vision of hosting these games are. I would need a much longer window of time to explain all of these, but I did want to highlight, um, again, these three uh, components. We want to have the games elevate our communities, elevate sport, 
and elevate the game's experience. I'm gonna highlight, because of this nature of this group here, elevating communities, and just know there's a whole lot um, behind these other components. And for other um, presentations, we'll get into this a little bit more. I will highlight one of the uniqueness um, to elevate the game's experience for all the different groups, whether that's spectators or athletes. One of the unique things that uh, we feel really good about promoting is, and because we have a lot of athletes already in our communities who have been a part of our planning, one of the biggest challenges for athletes competing is having to get, answer their uh, phones with all of their relatives and family saying, I need housing, can you help me with tickets? Can you do all of these things? So we're actually gonna create an athlete's village for, uh, sorry, athlete's family village and have a whole bunch of services so that the athletes can focus on the competition. And we have a whole team of people helping the parents of all of these athletes coming from around the world. And it's obviously very synonymous with Utah and family structures and, and lots of things that will help um, the whole experience of the people coming to Utah. The United States puts on events really well. In fact, we're held to a higher standard than most of the other countries. Um, but we love the efficiency in the organization and for elevating communities, what we can do beyond hosting a sporting event. For me, in this component of elevating our communities, we wanna foster unity amongst our residents. We saw that in O2, it's our ultimate rallying call. We wanna inspire our youth in embracing what is the true values of Olympism and Paralympism, um, about courage and determination and about competing, not always about winning, and these values are the things that we as our Legacy Foundation very much uphold. We want to have sport for kids um, be ways to teach life lessons, building confidence, setting goals. Those are hallmarks of the original values of Olympism and sport, and sports kind of lost its way. Uh, many of the parents, I had three teenage boys now. Um, so those aspects, we want to get to the true grassroots meaning of what Olympism and Paralympism means, and you'll see a bunch about that. Uh, we want to provide or have the games as a catalyst to local initiatives, and uh, that is actually one of my passion areas. The games provide a date certain in the future, and, and it's a deadline, and uh, I'll pick on Chris and because I see him here from the county. You know, local government does well when there's deadlines. Many times there is uh, 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 easy to keep pushing things, but the date of a games isn't going to move. And so if we want to solve traffic issues and mitigate traffic around town, we want to use that date and to, to use it as a catalyst to really make decisions happen and, and have a pathway to do that. Uh, and we also, uh, values of the Olympic, uh, Olympic, uh, Olympic IOC is very much um, focused on environmental sustainability and not just a, a, a carbon neutral games, but carbon positive in ways that uh, we work with our local cities and counties who already have great initiatives at work. We want to elevate that. And different communities have different priorities. Air quality is the biggest one down in Salt Lake. Uh, traffic mitigation, I would dare say, is one of the biggest ones here in our region here. Today is a great example. Um, and uh, I've already been in discussions with uh, city and county representatives, and I'm just throwing these out there as possible initiatives that the games could be helpful for. Um, um, if you see, I kind of ripped these uh, uh, visuals from a recent traffic study of what traffic looks like today and what it looks like in 2050 if there's no efforts taken. So traffic mitigation efforts a big push on public transit. Behavioral change is hard. Uh, that is the biggest thing that holds us up of getting people out of their single occupancy cars. And so the games, and along with local government efforts, will be a way that we could help push this along. Um, 
we know the issue is with workforce commuters, ski visitors, and residents. And one of the, the biggest things that GAMES is looking to do, it, five minutes, 10 minutes, 10 minutes. Um, this is my last slide, Miles, and then we'll go to questions. Um, is, is to um, try to solve right now this ski traffic problem. And if we can have the ski traffic issue and systems put in place for that, we enhance that for the games. And so those, uh, the games isn't looking to, to add new infrastructure. We want to use what we have, but we want to help with key initiatives that are important to the local governments in their various regions around Utah and help elevate and be a catalyst to get those achieved. So uh, some of that infrastructure could be, uh, again, I'm excited to see the BRT bus rapid transit lanes, um, a project on 224 and maybe a 248 in the future. Um, Kimball Junction needs improvements. And when we can figure out exactly what we want there, then we help push that along. Um, expanded transit centers, park and ride lots, those are aspects that I certainly look forward to. Environmental sustainability efforts to latch on and push key initiatives that are already taking root in our communities and elevate those. Uh, preserving and enhancing the quality of life and managing growth. Do I know exactly how the games can do that? No. But we know that's important. Those are, are key aspects along with affordable housing. I don't know how the games can help affordable housing because we're having the village down at the University of Utah. But if the games can use a project that is getting built and we can put funds to that early on, I'm all over that and, and our team is. Um, so that, um, that, is, that is it for my presentation. I like the Q&A, so can we do? Uh, sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, so would love to get any feedback, comments, questions. Um, fire away. Yeah, uh, Matt. I would love to talk way more about traffic and hear a little bit more about that kind of thing. Uh, something that's in particular on my mind is the 2028 LA Olympics has said they want to be car-free venues. They want to do all parking off-site, yeah. that kind of thing. Are you guys at a stage yet where you're considering specifics on that kind of thing? And are you... Uh, interested in dreaming big on something like traffic uh, interception way out. Yep. Just so others can hear, the question was about um, interested to dig in further on traffic and what the games might do. Um, I'll start with saying what we won't do is um, do like a big parking lot at the base of UOP like we did in 02. We had 7,000 temporary car spots right at the bottom of the hill. Uh, we will scale that way back to mostly set up uh, a parking uh, or a bus drop off zone at the base there. We also had a park and ride lot out here off of Highway 40. And to me, my guess is somewhere around Richardson Flats here, we're going to have some eventual parking lot that is serving ski uh, uh, traffic somewhat like it is today. Uh, and we'll enhance that. We did not have uh, bus systems of great uh, volumes coming from the Salt Lake Valley up to Park City venues. We want to very much enhance that. And uh, again, like we have with High Valley doing that link down to the valley, that needs to be super enhanced and how we collect folks so they're not driving up the, up the road. Will we, will we be completely car free coming to the venues? I don't, can't answer that yet, but I would absolutely say um, we want to boost the local systems where they all exist and get people on those systems in enhanced ways, uh, way more than having people drive cars. Time for one more. Yeah, way in the back. Great question. Um, so yes, it's almost like 35 to 40% more events than in O2, given new disciplines like slope style and big error. Um, so those, 
what we've been doing is trying not to add more venues. So the existing venues are gonna have more uh, events. So um, in, in 02, Park City Mountain was uh, the giant slalom, slalom was at Deer Valley, and, in, and the speed events were down in um, Snow Basin. Park City will be uh, half pipe, slope style, and possibly cross events, ski cross, border cross. So we're, we'll put more events at almost the same number of venues. The Olympic Park, if you see our new runs, um, we'll be using and having three venues instead of two venues and just really have these existing facilities hosting more events. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to take your, luckily with 10 years to go, you're going to hear from Colin a lot more <laughs> over the next 10 years. <laughs> That'll be great. Now we're going to talk a little bit about real estate. This is kind of a potpourri we do here today. So we, don't, we can't dive too deeply into any one thing, but we'll give you a taste of everything that's going on here. And uh, hopefully your head is already swimming, but we've got more swimming here. This is Jamie Johnson is going to come here uh, and speak to you about real estate and real estate trends. Jamie, thank you. Thanks, also a, a graduate of our program. This, this gives me a chance to like, showcase all our graduates. That's right. Proud graduate of the class of 28. This the one? best class ever, if you okay. haven't heard that from so anyone see, else. Just, just, Perfect. Yeah. All right. Okay, so um, for those of you who were here last year, it's gonna be a little bit of a similar presentation. For those of you who are new, I am Jamie Johnson. I'm the Chief Executive Officer for the Park City Board of Realtors, the Park City Multiple Listing Service, and the Park City Board of Realtors Philanthropic Foundation, as well as the Western Mountain Resort Alliance. And so we host here out of our offices, the Multiple Listing Service, which agents use for their offer of compensation between uh, one another and to give information about your listings to the community through website um, feeds. So that's kind of what we do locally here in our office. And then with the Western Mountain Resort Alliance, we have 13 associations from the Western Mountain Resorts in our Rocky Mountains area and a little bit outside of that um, over into Tahoe. But we have um, a group that meets on a regular basis. We are working on advocacy related issues. We're working on transit. We're working on affordable housing, short term rental policies and how it's impacting all of our markets. So we get together uh, about three times a year and meet with their leadership from those associations and are trying to gather information and data in order to bring it back to our municipal leaders here to let them know what's going on in other communities and how they're addressing some of these topics. So that is another component of what we do as an association and um, is, I think, a very valuable resource to you guys in our community. I think also we are looking at bringing in national funds, or we have been bringing in national funds from the National Association of Realtors to do economic impact studies of short-term rentals, of uh, where we need affordable housing and units within our markets. And again, it's a very similar component in all of those uh, ski towns that they're dealing with the same issues we're dealing with here. We aren't the only ones. So uh, a little bit more about myself. I came here from the Greater Nashville Association of Realtors, so much larger metropolitan market. Uh, there I was their COO, and I'm also a former realtor, so I've been in the real estate industry for a few decades now. Um, I'm older than I look, I hope. <laughs> and uh, so I came here hopefully bringing lots of resources and uh, information to our association to make us the best we can possibly be, and we believe that we are the best in the state, also offering um, through real estate, the, the sheer volume and the economic impact that uh, gives our state a great resource here in the Wasatch Back. And I don't think that's working. So does this no, work? This no? Mm -mm. Do I just hit forward? Yeah. Yeah, no. Nope. But you can, I'm sure you can find it. So just uh, going forward to the next slide. We uh, have about 1,500 plus agents right now in the Wasatch Back using our multiple listing service. So about 1,200 that 
we consider here local. And then we have about two to 300 more that come up from the Salt Lake Valley or from other parts of the state in order to um, get the information from our listings. Just that one, one more, two. Right, there we go. All right, perfect. All right, we're going to get back. Um, so on top of that, not just agents. So I say that every time I go to an event or a party that I can't turn around without bumping into an agent. And um, the other day we had a realtor ski day up at Deer Valley. And I uh, jokingly, this couple came up and they're like, what are you guys doing here today? And I said, oh, Deer Valley gives us some passes to come allow our members to ski in and ski out of properties to see what it looks like. So just know that on every lift today, somebody is going to offer you a business card or tell you where they can sell you property. But that's pretty much it on every day here in the Wasatch Back, not just on Realtor Ski Day. Um, so we have that, like I said, about 1,500 plus members. We also have affiliate members. So if you have a business that supplements the real estate industry, then you can also join as an affiliate member in order to get in front of our members. Uh, we don't, we're not the chamber, so we're not just there to let anyone come into our association and get information to our members. But if you do uh, impact or supplement the real estate industry, we would love to have you as a member. A little bit about our history. We've been here since 1982 uh, in the Park City market. We keep the brand Park City Board of Realtors, even though we consider ourselves the experts in real estate and the Wasatch back. Uh, like we are seeing our geographical area is Summit and Wasatch counties. We're not trying to go down and be experts in the Salt Lake Valley or in Utah County. These are the two areas that we really want our agents to be very well versed in and to know what's going on here so that they can help the consumers and clients better here. Uh, we did merge with the Wasatch County Board of Realtors about eight years ago, I believe it is. And uh, with that, they joined us, came up here, and we still use the brand Park City because that is who we see ourselves as in the Wasatch back. A little bit about what we do for our members. So not only do we have the Park City MLS, which is where they do get the information about the listings and the data, we do a lot of advocacy. And I see a lot of my friends from the municipalities here in the room that we work with on a regular basis. Uh, if we are speaking on something or we're working on something, it usually has to do with property rights, property values, home ownership. And so we might not always agree like what that looks like uh, with the community at large, but we definitely want to protect that for our members. At the national level, we do a lot of advocacy when it comes to um, in other parts of the country, flood insurance here, we're trying to work with them now on fire insurance and how that's becoming a, an issue in our community. And we are also um, working at like mortgage interest rate deductions or things that, again, impact our consumers and our clients on a much larger and broader spectrum. Uh, also, we do education for our members and have that here locally so that they can do their continuing education courses. We provide those out of our offices and online as well. A lot of networking events and opportunities. So if you have a business or you want to bring the realtors in and you want us to see what you have to offer, we'd love to partner with you on something. Um, and then code of ethics. If you don't know this, there's a difference in just being a real estate agent and being a realtor. Realtor is the branded term from the National Association of Realtors. And because our members are required to take a code of ethics class every three years, they have that as a standard. And then we make sure that we are selling and uh, working in a very ethical way. And if you have an issue where you feel as though a realtor is not doing that, you have a process where you can go through our association and the state association in order to keep something out of litigation to hopefully work that out with our um agents and our brokers here locally. So I know you probably care more about the numbers and what we do. All right, perfect. Uh, what we're doing here in the last stitch back. So I don't know if this is gonna be way too small for you to see, but hopefully I'll be able to give you a little information uh, from here. So in, so this graph kind of goes all the way back to 2021. Uh, seeing, again, I would love it to go a little bit further back to maybe like 2019, because I think what you would see is that even though we had these spikes in real estate volume and sales transactions in the you know, COVID period, 
uh, but prior to that is about where we are now. So I would say that we're starting to even out a little bit. Um, so going back to like January of 21, you had like 80 sales uh, during the month of January in the Wasatch Back. And this is looking at the entire Wasatch Back. So this would be Summit Wasatch County looking at about 80 sales in 2021. And then in January of 24, we were right around 63 sales for the entire Wasatch Back. So we're coming back down um, to what is a norm for us here locally. Land sales are the main thing that has drastically dropped over the last four years. And uh, that's because they're not making any more of it and people are buying it up as, as, as it comes out. So it, but it has gone down. Um, condo sales, pretty average, pretty uh, stagnant across the board for the last four years. Price, this is what everybody loves about the Wasatch Back. Again, this is basically data on all 10 areas that we consider in our MLS. So there are some outer lying areas that would be in this as well that might not be in Summit and Wasatch County. There may be a few outliers in Morgan County or a couple of sales where an agent put in from Salt Lake. But in those, in the 10 areas that we represent, we would say that um, starting going all the way back to January of 21, a single family home, median sale price was around 1.3, $1.4 million. Um, that obviously has some spikes and goes all the way up here in 2023, at the end of 2023, uh, to a $2.1 million uh, median for the Wasatch back at large. So again, you're taking into consideration all of uh, Summit and Wasatch County. Um, townhomes, again, back in 2021, median sale price was around 720, and it now is up, ending up in 2024 at 1.4 for a median sale price. Yeah. <laughs> days on, uh, well, and this isn't on the slide, but days on market is another thing sometimes people want to know. How long is it going to take me to sell my property? And, you know, back in those days when the the prices were high and people were coming to town. We were seeing things fly off the market in a couple of days. I would say that you can still have that, that it can still be that case, depending on what neighborhood you live in. If you're in Old Town, you're in a great spot and it's probably going to sell within a week. I mean, and you may still have multiple offers because if you price it right, it's a prime area that they're, again, not a lot of listings. Inventory is is good, but not great. And so you have a better chance of selling right now. But days on market, again, looking all the way back for single family homes. Um, right now, you're looking at a couple of months, probably, if you're putting it on the market. Uh, townhomes are a little less because obviously people come here and buy investment properties for townhomes. So 26 days on the market is the average right now for this time of year. Uh, Let's see here, let's go to the next. This is where we are, closed sales by month. So this slide is the same one from the, the first slide I showed you, but this is just looking at Park City and Snyderville Basin. So taking out Wasatch County, taking out East, uh, Eastern Summit County, Morgan, any of the other areas that, we're, that we have. And um, so looking at this, you're gonna see that uh, the, the sales, again, going back for single family, we were at 44, we're at uh, 17 for the month of January, and then uh, 34 for condos and 21 sales in the month of January. Um, so comparing from 2021 to now, it's dropped drastically in those areas. But again, a lot of that goes back to inventory. Uh, prices in Park City and uh, Snyderville Basin, median price sold. So the yellow or the tan colored line there is the single family housing. So um, again, you can see how it's gone up and down over the last four years, but a single family home in the month of January, we were looking right at 2.4 million for these two areas. If you take out Snyderville Basin and you're just looking at 84060 from the White Barn Inn, it's over $4 million. Now, that being said, there were only four transactions uh, for the month of January and 84060, but as you can see, the prices continue to rise. We've seen over the last few years, a couple of different uh, areas where the uh, price or median sale price in a month could go even higher than this. So, um, totally can manipulate the data however you would like whenever you're looking at so many different areas and so many different types of properties. Um, 
So obviously sales data information, if you ever wanna see this information, you can go to our website, parkcityrealtors.com. A lot of these actual um, uh, charts are on that page. So you can go under statistics and media. We also produce a quarterly report, a uh, press release. Uh, we go on the radio and talk about the, the statistics and the information from those quarters. We will be on uh, next Wednesday with Leslie talking about the year at large from 2023 and recapping that. And I like the fact that I only have three minutes because I still have a little bit more to talk about and then you don't have time for questions. Um, <laughs> So we will be talking about that on the radio next uh, next Wednesday with her to recap 23 and then go ahead and look at what's happening in 24 so far. And again, if you ever want statistics or information about your area, your uh, neighborhood, we say reach out to a local realtor, uh, someone who is selling here in the Wasatch back that knows our market and knows what we do. Uh, one of the other things, I mentioned our philanthropic foundation. A couple of big things that we've been doing in the community the last couple of years is bringing awareness to the affordable affordable housing crisis that we have and working with Mountainlands on our Hats Off to Housing event, um, raising funds. And again, Epic Promise and the Prince family and different uh, individuals in our community have come and participated in that and given very large amounts of money to the HOPA project here in town. And so we're big supporters of affordable housing and trying to find ways to get uh, more individuals that work here and want to live in play here to be able to live here as well. So we're not just about all those big multi-million dollar sales that you see and uh, we are, and we do care about the community. Um, with the Philanthropic Foundation, another thing that we are doing is hosting our um, speaker series again this year. Last year, we it was called Earth, Wind, and, not Earth, Wind, and Fire, Earth, Water, and Fire, um, kind of a play off of that though. And this year it's gonna be Peace, Love, and Rock and Roll. Uh, Peace being the first one that's gonna be on March 21st at Eccles Theater. Uh, more information, again, is going to be coming out into the community. The first one is dealing with difficult people and learning how to communicate with tact and professionalism. Do you know anybody that needs to come to that course? Yes. All right. So, uh, so watch for that. Again, it's going to be at Eccles on the 21st of March. Then we have one in June that's going to be a love. It's going to be about self-love, care, and techniques that we can do for ourselves. And then rock and roll. We're going to hopefully do a big announcement here soon, but have um, someone that is in the rock industry that is going to come and he does a speech on how you can show up and be a rock star and have a rock star mentality and everything you do every day. So it's kind of an, a mental health focus for the year for 2024. And we hope that the community will come out and support that and um, be a part of what we have to offer to it, to the community. Are we done? Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. Thank you. I feel so bad rushing all these people. No, I don't. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Jamie. Okay, we're going to hear about sustainable tourism, which is uh, pretty important for us now. Morgan, are you going to do it? I'm doing it. You're it? I'm it. You, you're going to plug into this somehow? I was planning on it, if that's all okay. All right. Well, we could try to help you here. Yeah, it should just be HDMI, and we're good to go. Yeah. Okay, let's see. We could do this. Just this. Thank you. Daniel. <laughs> Should be well versed in uh, switching all the tech at this point, here? right? <laughs> cool. That's good to me. Here, I'll just set this here. Hey, y'all. So for some of the folks that I don't know, I actually recognize a couple of people here, but I'm Morgan Mingle. I work for the Chamber of Commerce and Visitors Bureau, and I'm the Director of Sustainable Tourism. Uh, considering this is a leadership one-on-one -on -one class, I'm going to talk about really full picture, the kind of work that the Chamber and Visitors Bureau does, but with my own little sustainable tourism spin to it. So let's get going. Um, you know, y'all may or may not be aware, but the visitor economy here in Park City is huge. It's a major driver of tax revenue and really helps support a ton of jobs and a ton of programs that residents really enjoy and appreciate. So everything from Parks and Rec to public transit to so much more. And so our job as both a Chamber of Commerce and a Visitors Bureau is to support the businesses 
that are here and are thriving in Park City, but also supporting the visitor economy and attracting visitors to come experience Park City as a destination, but in a responsible way. You can see in our retooled mission that it's really reflecting the point of view that we have as an organization. That mission is we serve our mountain community, inspire sustainable travel, drive equitable economic prosperity, and catalyze positive change. And so this wouldn't be a presentation for me unless I had a slide about sustainable tourism specifically. And so this is really the lens that we like to look at our work through. And we consider Park City and the surrounding area in Summit County to really be a system of systems and everything integrates in so many different ways. And when we talk about sustainable tourism, a lot of people only think about environmental sustainability and how tourism impacts that, but it really is holistic. It's a full picture. So we're looking at quality of life. We're looking at the visitor experience and making sure that we're building products that attract the right kind of visitor. We're looking at how do we manage those visitors' behaviors while they're in market? How do we shape what they're doing in a way that doesn't cause undue burden to local people? And so for the rest of the presentation, I'm just gonna be doing a really quick overview of all of the work that we're doing at the Chamber, but I'm gonna frame it in these key focus areas that we think of as the sustainable tourism focus areas. Um, you can see from my hastily made Venn diagram that there's a ton of overlap in all of this stuff. And so, you know, just because I put something under quality of economy doesn't mean it doesn't touch all these other areas too. So I did my best to fit things in into a category to make it nice and neat, but there's so much overlap in all of this work. And so let's kick it off with quality of economy. So this is the piece that people often think of when they think about what a chamber of commerce and what a visitor's bureau does. So this is marketing a destination, but you'll see in a lot of these examples, we're marketing destination in a way that is still encouraging <laughs> responsible visitation and really care for this place that all of us call home. These are just some examples of our different summer and winter marketing, how they have a different focus. Um, encouraging visitors to come without cars is really important. You can see that reflecting in a lot of the messaging. In terms of our international marketing, this is a really key demographic for us in Park City. One of the key sustainable tourism tenets is you would love for a visitor to come for a longer period of time to spend more money while they're in market. And international tourists do exactly that. Um, they also often have behaviors that we really like and want to encourage. So a European visitor might be more used to taking public transit. You don't have to teach them how to use a bus system. Um, and so we see a lot of these key behaviors that we wanna be happening more and more in our community coming from this international market, which is really cool. We also do quite a bit of work in terms of building content. That's everything from social media to blogs. And in the past couple of years, you'll see that we are folding in more and more of this idea of visitor management and responsible visitation into all of the work that we're doing. You know, we're still promoting local businesses. We're still encouraging um, like-minded visitors and travelers to come into our destination. But we're also explaining through some of this about how special some of our arts and culture is, how rich a lot of the history in Park City is, and making sure that we're highlighting and elevating those pieces that make Park City really special. Our group sales department is also, I think, a really important piece of the puzzle whenever we are talking about sustainable tourism principles. So in addition to having a visitor stay longer, spend more, so there's technically fewer visitors, our group sales helps fill in some of those need periods in our community to keep visitation at nice, moderate levels and keep the economy really churning. So they work with corporations often or kind of like incentive programs to bring in visitors during mud season because they're gonna be spending a lot of time indoors and they help fill those rooms during times when the other tourism assets might not be as strong. And then in terms of communication, this just generates a lot of buzz for Park City and more importantly, what Park City is doing to um, raise its awareness on sustainable tourism issues and impact for visitors. All right, and let's skip over to quality of life. 
So a lot of this is work that our partner services team does. And again, the first slide is more traditional what you think of when you think of as a chamber of commerce. So it's building out events, making sure that there's business to business networking opportunities. They started, I believe last year, doing something called Business University that I think is a really cool program. And it's teaching some nuts and bolts um, business skills to small businesses that might not have gone and gone an MBA. Um, it's accounting 101, things like that. So I think a really important asset for diverse people that are trying to build their businesses. And we also do quite a bit of advocacy at the local, state, and national levels. And uh, that's actually why you have me today instead of Jennifer, our CEO and president, because she's out of the Capitol doing advocacy work. We've also expanded into doing quite a bit of work uh, supporting not just businesses, but the people that work at those businesses. So uh, I guess about six months ago, we unveiled our Chamber Sponsored Employee Benefit Program, which is a really exciting package for small businesses of at least two or more employees to offer um, a really competitive health insurance option by pooling businesses into one network. We've also been developing quite a bit of resources for different seasonal workers, both English speaking and Spanish speaking. And we're looking at the option of expanding for other languages as well. And then we were happy to um, be able to support the WeRIP program with Mountainlands this year. Um, and that is a program that provides incentives for landlords or really just homeowners to offer rooms to seasonal and long-term workers rather than just short-term rentals. Um, so that was a really exciting program to be able to support and be a part of. And then lastly, you know, the Sustainable Tourism Plan, it covers all of these things, but we were happy to be able to create this plan with 22 community stakeholders a little over a year and a half ago. And um, it's just been incredible the way the community has taken off the tenants of the Sustainable Tourism Plan and really run with it. Um, that number is actually higher now, so it's almost 100 projects in progress to help support these main objectives of the Sustainable Tourism Plan. I also have a QR code at the end if anyone's interested in reading a little bit more about the Sustainable Tourism Plan um, with 20 minutes. Didn't quite have enough time to really get into the weeds here. And then, like I said, uh, advocacy is a big part of what we do, um, and we make sure that we're well connected with what's happening in politics on every level. Let's move on to visitor experience. So the obvious topic is the visitor center out at Kimball Junction. Um, this is a really key uh, asset for us to be able to talk to visitors and tell them the information that we think is most appropriate for them to know, make sure that they're aware of things like Summit Bike Share and our really great paved bike network, um, things like the bus system, um, trailheads that are used a little bit less often. This is a really great way for us to have and build a connection with visitors and still shape their behavior. We have a lot of really fun changes that are happening at the Visitor Center. Some haven't quite happened yet. It's gonna be an unveiling over the next year or so. But something that you can actually already see is some technology that's been introduced into that space. It's called True Omni. And it is both a large video screen that's really dynamic and we can put up different events that are happening or social media feeds, as well as some touch screens. There's a really cool mapping touch screen that I really like that you can go up and see layers of the trail system from our official Park City Trails interactive map. You can see all of the bus transit maps, um, just really cool interactive piece. And there's gonna be a lot more educational and interactive materials that are gonna be folded into that space over the next year or so. We're also working quite a bit with building more visitor products. So one of these that I would love to highlight is we did a guided audio tour with the help of Francisco Mountain Mining History and the Park City Museum that highlights early mining history in Park City walking through the Main Street area. But the thing that I'm really proud about it is that it doesn't just highlight the mine owners and um, you know, the glory of the mining economy in the early days. It talks about a lot of the people that made those mines run. It tells a really lovely story about women who worked in the community then. Um, it definitely highlights immigrant labor and how that was important to the mining process. 
Um, so I think it tells the story of our early history in a way that's really well-rounded and quite lovely. Also working on things like Trails Less Traveled with all of our trail manager partners to be able to highlight some of the trails that are underutilized in our area and try to disperse visitation away from those really crowded trailheads. Um, we also made sure to highlight ones that were able to be accessed with public transit so that as we're encouraging visitors to come without cars, they still have lots of options in any season um, of great things to do when they're here without having to have a single car. We also distribute sustainable tourism grants. So these are uh, grants that are given to community partners. They apply for them that help support the tenants of the sustainable tourism plan. Um, it definitely is all um, things that highlight our local history that help with things like visitor dispersion. Um, and these are just some examples of some projects that were funded last year, including Latino Arts Festival. Um, Alf Ingen was able to do a little expansion um, with some of these uh, grant funds. So some really lovely programs that we're able to support. And I think the most important part about this grant is not even just that we are providing some funds for community members to further the mission of the Sustainable Tourism Plan. It gives everybody a really nice reminder of those central tenants every single year, and it really helps point everyone in the same direction. Um, we see so much collaboration here in Park City and Summit County that this is just a great way to remind people that, hey, this is the direction that we're heading as a community. And then lastly, environmental stewardship. I'm nailing the time. <laughs> I'm doing a really good job. So, like I said, um, a lot of what we are producing with our normal marketing dollars isn't just come here, come to Park City, come to Summit County. It's come here, but this is the expectation on how you act when you're here. So while these are traditional marketing pieces and they're coming out of the marketing budget, um, it also falls under visitor behavior management because we're asking people to use the transit and you can learn more with that QR code. We're asking people to be kind to one another, to recycle, um, and making sure that we're integrating that messaging wherever humanly possible. We've also been developing the sustainability toolkits for different industries. So the first one that we unveiled was a toolkit for lodging partners, and it is a collection of assets to help our lodging partners communicate key messaging to guests prior to arrival and once they've arrived. We learned through a lot of survey work that uh, visitors that are here, even if they don't see anything that the chamber produces, they usually get a lot of information from whoever they booked their lodging with. And so that was a really key moment of connection that we wanted to be sure that those lodging partners had the right pieces of information. They had the most current link for Summit Bike Chair. Um, they knew what can and can't be recycled once they're actually in market. So this was the first iteration. Um, we developed some messaging that could be folded into the emails that lodging partners were already sending. Um, we created a little booklet for concierge that were full of QR codes and front desk managers so that when visitors come in, if they have any questions on, oh, hey, um, I would love to rent a bike, but like, I'm not sure where the bike lanes are. They have a QR code that's really easy to get to just right there. And then something that's in development right now, in addition to the Lodging Toolkit 2.0, is another set of tools specifically for event organizers and DMCs. And so this is gonna be a little bit more of an intimate program because there are far fewer of them. There's only six, whereas there's 100 plus lodging partners to be able to touch. And so um, we're gonna be doing on hand like, like a hands-on training series with those partners to be able to know how to design the most sustainable events possible, as well as doing some key messaging like we did with the lodging partners. We also support the, the trail programs quite a bit. We were really excited when Mountain Trails, Basin Rec, and Park City Trails and Open Spaces banded together for this mapping system. So in the before times, they all had their own individual websites that they updated with trail conditions, and now it all feeds into one website. So parkcitytrails.org, if you haven't found it yet, is really, really useful to see the winter grooming conditions, as well as seeing where there might be mud on trails, seeing trail closures. 
there's also quite a bit of trail etiquette education that's really cool. And then something that we've been able to help support with some funding is the introduction of, um, you see where Bloods Lake is, these trailhead cameras. So you can take a look at parking ahead of time and you can see what the trail conditions look like. You can see when I took the screenshot two weeks ago, Bloods Lake was quite snowy, um, but there's plenty of parking spaces. You can get up there. And then lastly, I wanted to highlight some work with the Green Business Program. So as you may or may not know, this is a program that uh, Recycle Utah has solely run in the past. And we've come in along with Summit County Municipal, I'm sorry, Park City Municipal, Summit County, um, and the Community Foundation to provide even more support and rigor to that program. And so we did kind of a soft launch of the new program and it introduces these five categories you see at the bottom that businesses must take action in to be able to advance in the program. We also introduced the idea of um, having different tiers of the program so that we can really celebrate the businesses that are going above and beyond in all of these sustainability areas. So that's our bronze, silver, gold badges. And we have a new website in development that's gonna be really cool once it's rolled out um, it's going to have a ton of resources for businesses to be able to um, make sustainable changes and have everything right at their fingertips. And then the other pieces of exciting information, uh, we wrote up uh, a story about creating this new green business program and the collaborative process that we use and submitted it to the Green Destinations Top um, Best Practices Story Competition. And I am excited to be able to share that we're in the top three for the business and marketing category. And in a couple months, we'll find out what place we received. So that was um, very flattering and very exciting uh, little, little cap on creating this new green business program. And that's the last slide that I have. Um, so just tying it all together, you know, as you can see, we are hitting this idea of sustainable tourism from a lot of different angles, but it all is trying to build around this idea of still having a park city in Summit County that is a wonderful place to visit, but it's still a wonderful place to live. Um, and it's not being diminished by just driving visitation. And at that, um, I know I went really quickly, but this is the sustainable tourism plan. Feel free if you have any questions, you can email me. If I don't know the answer, I can connect you to someone who has the answer. And do we have time for questions? We don't. We don't? Okay. Well, then I look forward to any questions you might have. Okay, great. All right. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. I feel like I was going 45 miles an hour. You were, but you did it. I did it. Oh, now we have uh, Dr. Jill. Jill, I haven't seen you in so long. I know. It's great to see you. Thank, Thank you for you. being here. Absolutely. Let's see. Daniel, I'll help you plug in over here. All right. I probably couldn't. Oh, look at you. Very and that, I hope you're getting a sense of the mosaic that makes up this town and all the people who work together to make everything work. So, uh, Perfect. is that going to work? I think so. Let's see. Let's see if I, I really like Morgan Square slides. Those were cool. You had people in the room that could do this presentation, Miles. You got oh, Megan here, doing... you got Matt here, they could do this. We're still looking at the wrong one. Okay. Let's see. Let I'm gonna let him do it. Yeah. So we can stay on time. You guys it's know I'm the minutes. only thing standing between you and lunch. That's right. <laughs> I realize this. I realize this. I didn't close out the other one. about six open right now. <laughs> yeah. um, I could grab my laptop if that's let's, easier. Would you see, rather how grab do I, your laptop? I'll maybe it. I'll just okay. slide it over He's here. Slide it around. <laughs> right. And uh, I think so. Well, can I pull screen this? Nonsense off of it. Okay. Borders to go away. Maybe not. Let's see. Is there a full screen? There we go. Is there a full screen? Okay. Oh, that looks so much better. And then, Thank you. So, I 
don't think they're going there because that's not even the pin. So you have to use this sort of. Is it? Yeah, I just did a PDF. So okay, like, yeah. So can you can the use these arrows here. The arrows. Yeah. Do it? I don't know if it'll do it. <laughs> yeah, it's it's doing it. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Okay. There you go. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you. Team effort. Always a team effort. All right. I know you've listened to three people at least or four before me. So let's do a really quick uh, stretch. Really quick stretch. Excellent. As you're stretching, if you are a parent or a guardian of a child, stand up while you're stretching. If you are an aunt or an uncle, uh, keep standing, keep standing. If you're a grandparent, if you're a neighbor of someone with little people in the house, stand up. We don't have everyone yet, but we're getting close. Excellent. Excellent. The visual of. We all belong to public education, right? We all have a stake. Awesome. Thank you so much. Feel a little better after that stretch? I love the stretch. All right. I see lots of familiar faces, lots of new faces. And Miles, I think this keeps getting bigger. Every year, it keeps getting bigger. I was thinking about this. I've been in education as long as Miles has been doing this leadership workshop, believe it or not. So lots, lots to learn, lots to reimagine, and lots to vision together. It's really a fun presentation. All right, here's my big questions for you to start. Did you know that the children born last year in 2022, the same year as ChatGPT, that those students are the graduating class of 2040? Just let that sink in for a minute. The graduating class of 2040. What is their world going to be? How are we going to set these young people up for success? It's a big question. When will we reach human level artificial intelligence? The prediction for that is 2029. Not so far away. How do we raise and teach our children during this era of exponential growth? And I think that's, those are the questions that kind of underlie what's happening with the schools. What do the future of schools look like? What does learning look like? At Park City School District, this is our why. Every single student on this day is a community celebration. The kids toss their hats, and you can just see the joy and excitement on their faces because they've reached a really a remarkable milestone. They have reached their um, end of their elementary and, middle and, high, middle and high school program of education, and they are, the door is open to them. They may go to mission, two-year school, four-year school, straight to work, military. The world is theirs. And this is, all of us just get so excited on this day, as the kids do. And when we think about, you know, why, it's this, this is the moment. Our school district, just like you've heard in the other organizations, we're really mission and vision driven. So our mission is to inspire and support all students equitably to achieve their academic and social potential. And this terminology came through a community uh, partnership, community visioning in 2017. So before anything became kind of political around these words, right before that, uh, the terminology, um, had you know, connotations that maybe are different than what the school system believes, but really this idea that we open the door for every child so that they can achieve at their greatest potential. Our vision is a whole child definition, also came from the same visioning group, and this is a national definition where our children are safe, supported, engaged, challenged, and healthy. And if we make our decisions around those five ideas, we're not going to go wrong. We want our students and staff to be safe. And we do a very safe environment. I went down to another school district for a meeting. I walked in, went to the desk. So I'm looking for this meeting. Person said, it's my second day. I have no idea where you go. Why don't you go through this hallway into the next building and check out over there? I'm thinking, oh my gosh, we have like the double doors and you gotta buzz in and someone checks with you. And you know, it, it's, it's interesting how there is kind of a variety, right, of safety um, throughout the state. Um, supported, what does that mean? That means academic supports, it means social emotional support. Um, it means that students are engaged in the content that they're learning and that they can apply what they're learning to their real world experiences, um, keeping them challenged at their level, and then healthy. 
right? We want uh, physical health, and we also want men mental well-being. And we're working a lot on that as a school district. We bring our values forward, and those are aligned to our strategic pillars, our strategic plan. But this is a quote that I think is interesting. We have so many cool companies in Utah, and structure is one of them. So look at this. We are living in the most transformative time in the history of education. We each have a chance to shape the future. And that's, I think, what really inspires most of us in this work. But all of you have that opportunity, too, because as a community, we can create the conditions for a really amazing future for our students. We do have a focus on equitable practices and equitable outcomes. Equitable is not equal. Equitable is every student reaching their potential because not everybody wants the exact same thing. And we have to be supportive and inclusive and help kids to reach their idea of success. So we really define work in equitable outcomes as the four Bs. So adults, we have a strong belief in our students and their success and their ability to achieve. We try to cultivate a sense of belonging so that when, when you come to school, you feel welcomed. You feel like you have a place where you belong. We try to remove barriers and obstacles, whether that is academic fees or you know, barriers to participation. So we take away things like prerequisites, right, so that kids can access what they have a passion or an interest in. And then we really try to broadcast student successes and student voice in reimagining the future. Our challenge as a community, right, our challenge in our schools is preparing our students to become architects of a world we can only begin to imagine. We see the future having grades, right? We still have our grades, we have our outcomes, but wouldn't it be great if kids also had badges as to the things that they've achieved, certification, so to speak, so that when you leave school, you may be a database specialist, you may be an aviation specialist. You may have earned your drone certification and be able to take um, aerial images. You will have some digital literacy. You'll know how artificial intelligence is underlying the work, you know, our world and our work in it. You'll know how to do computational thinking. You'll have a sense of logic. So this idea that the graduate of the future is a very well-rounded human. A future classroom is probably going to look a little bit, well, it'll be interesting. I'll show you an AI-generated image in a minute. We're gonna have some things that, that look and feel the same and some things I think will be very different and maybe some things that might finally make a teacher's workload a little bit easier. We'd all love that, I think. Um, what we're thinking about as a school system right now is how do we design the learning environment around the child? What can we do as we look at our facilities to modernize them and really make them much more flexible and adaptive, much like you see this space. You, know, you can make it different sizes, you can reconfigure the chairs and the tables, and really have that sense of joy and play within the student space. Our kids are coming to us. Um, I have a six-month-old grandchild, so I am now Gigi, Grandma Gilday. So it's kind of a fun thing, so a little six-month-old. And he reaches for that phone. I mean, he reaches for everything, right? Food, steak, tries to non-steak. You know, he reaches for things, especially those devices, right? Because what's happening on the screen? We have things moving and bright lights, right? And so kids, they seem almost wired, right, to really love this technological world that they're coming into. Our students are very tech savvy. They can do things that they can run circles, right, around. Um, most of the adults in the system. Um, they are going to be our most educated generation in history as we talk about Generation Alpha, but the kids don't play by the same rules because they have a different world that they're growing up in. They don't need to wait for a week to see the next series, the next episode in the series, right? They can go to Netflix, they can go to YouTube, they can learn things on their own. So schools have to constantly adapt and um, make it so that what, what kids are learning they can apply to a real world situation. So this is an AI generated image. If you ask AI, what does a classroom of the future look like in 2040? This is the image that popped up. Now remember, AI can only generate what has been put in. 
right? So it can't generate something that is unique or is out of its own imagination yet, maybe by 2029, right? But for now, it's taking those elements where you actually see you know, kind of wonderment stations, some holograms there. You definitely see technology, but you definitely also see that movable furniture. But it's not as spaceship-like or Jetson-like, right, as you might have thought. It still kind of looks like a classroom. So we are working on reimagining and doing some building onto our schools. We are moving from seven schools in Park City to six schools in Park City. So we'll have four elementary pre-K through fifth grade schools. Kids will then transition to the middle school years, six, seven, eight, then transition onto a comprehensive high school, nine, 10, 11, 12. Our high school, we have high school teachers here, former high school teacher and high school teachers. We have 250 plus courses. It's a shame to limit those to three grades, right? We really want to expand so that kids can access these courses, even as ninth graders. Right now, they're running across from Treasure to the high school to do that. So Treasure, um, Treasure Mountain Junior High will be decommissioned in 2026. It does not meet the current seismic standards, and it was about $37 million to bolster it, to make it seismic ready. It has no rebar in the building. So, and all the walls are load-bearing walls. So it would need a lot of work. So the community and the district decided not to refurbish that building. That will be decommissioned. And instead, there's an eighth grade wing going on at Ecker and really nice modernized um, CTE classes and ninth grade classrooms over at the high school. So you'll see we're doing additions to each of the schools. Parley's and Trailside will start this summer. But Jeremy and McPolin are well underway. And those preschool centers will be finished by this spring. So over the summer, we'll be moving the furniture in. And we are ultimately growing to a capacity of 325 preschool students that we can serve with a goal as a community of universal preschool so that every resident's preschool children, aged children, can come to the schools for three and four-year-old preschool education with that four-year-old program, you have a choice for a half day or a full day, five days a week. So we're expanding that program, really exciting. And we've come pretty far. We're already getting carpeting and nice bright blue paint. It's gonna be a really fun space for the kids and the educators. So at Ecker, we're bumping out um, two of the wings, so we will have, like I said, 6th, 7th, and 8th grade in that space. But because of our demographics, because of our enrollments, the schools will really only still be as big as they are now. Because for 10 years in Utah, we kind of have a decline in our um, school age kids. Families are smaller. We don't have as many families. So we're not having really supersized schools. We'll still have a high school of right up between that 12 and 1500. We'll have an LM, uh, middle school of about 800. So we're going from graduating about 425 to bringing in about 265 each year. And that's been for about the past five years. The pandemic kind of masked that a little bit. We have some beautiful imagery of what the schools will look like. Uh, beautiful concepts from the architects. So we're really looking forward to this will kind of be a CTE space. It's currently the cafeteria uh, with the carpeting there. I always thought carpeting and middle school cafeteria was an interesting decision. <laughs> so the high school uh, will be beautiful. It will have this really inspiring sort of angled wing that faces beautiful mountains gorgeous windows, and lots of great learning space. We'll also have a teen center. How many of you have heard of a teen center? Excellent, love those hands. Um, so teen center will help uh, students that need either you know, some additional support, some snacks, maybe a place to do uh, washing and drying of clothes, you know, kind of a safe space um, to be and, and to really help with those life skills. And we'll have some pretty open spaces. I'm still pulling on that learning center. Hopefully, we'll bring, bring that concept back. So 
When we look at the future, I do not believe that AI is going to replace our educators. You need the human inter interaction to really make schools effective. But I think we're gonna see a lot more AI-inspired um, supports and skills building and practice. So this image, once I saw it, it kind of haunted me. It looks Pixar, Disney-esque, but also a little frightening. Um, as we look at our programs, though, we also have a wonderful community ed partnership. And our after-school program, how many of you know about the after-school program? Excellent. That will also be for four-year-olds all the way up through the middle grades years. Our kids do really amazing extensions in this program. And this is a group of students that made night lights out of ping pong balls. Kind of fun. Um, I do think if any of you are watching the legislative session, about 800 bills this year and many still not numbered. Lots impacting education. And really it is kind of that time to really fight for public education um, as a community and as a, you know, as, as a cohort. So one of my favorite current songs to think about that is the Goo Goo Dolls and OAR did a remake of Tom Petty's song. Right, so we really don't want to back down. We want to keep fighting for all of the good work that's happening in our schools. Our students are amazing. I mean, the accolades that our kids win are kind of incredible. And we are, um, I'm really just so proud of all of the work of our educators and our kids. It's really quite amazing. Excellent, look at that. See, when you know you're before lunch, you keep it tight. <laughs> I've gotten so some practice at this. I was a little nervous about the one slide with the robot up here because I'm assuming that like next year that's what's going to be here. It's either for you or for me or both of us. Oh, it's quite amazing. Thank you. Right. Thank Thanks you. for doing it. Okay, before we break for lunch, we have uh, one announcement. And, and uh, we also, just so you know, we have uh, our leadership alumni here. Shay is in the back. He's a... Uh, He's raising his hand back there. He's got a table out in the hallway where the lunch is. So if you want to talk to him, if you're here as one of our alumni, want to join the Leadership Alumni Association, we'd love to have you. Karen, you, you got the floor for a minute. Hey everyone, now I'm the one thing standing in your way before lunch, but I'll be quick. Um, my name is Karen Bell, and I am class of 30, best class ever. And um, I'm also the founder of Kept Current. And for those of you who don't know what that is, it's a website and newsletter um, that's pretty popular with people in town, locals. And I kind of aggregate everything that's happening around town each week. And um, next week, we are launching a campaign for Random Acts of Kindness Week. And we've partnered with local businesses, with local influencers, and some nonprofits. Some of you are actually in this room right now. And um, we are just trying to spread good juju into the community. And um, so it's uh, if you ask what International Random, um, Random Acts of Kindness is, it's an internationally recognized week of spreading good positivity. And it's not just about doing the gestures. It's hoping that it will pay it forward and those gestures will continue to kind of um, expand within the community. So um, we want to create a ripple effect of, of goodness in the community. And so what does that look like? It can be something really simple like buying coffee for the person behind you, or maybe it's doing something like baking cookies with your kids and bringing them to a neighbor. It's, it's really simple stuff, saying hi. Why are we doing this? Um, it's because I love Park City. I love it here, and I'm always looking for ways to give back to the community. And this is a really simple and fun way to do it. So I'm asking for your support. And what does that look like? It could just be really simple, like gamify it with your kids and find simple ways to do something nice next week. Um, you know, do something with your colleagues, um, with your friends, whatever it is, and, um, and just try to spread some joy in the world. So we're kicking off, uh, there'll be a social campaign against this as well. Um, and uh, on Instagram, we'll be launching it. A lot of the local businesses have donated stuff. We'll be doing giveaways and just kind of trying to spread the word. You can say thank you to all the businesses that are involved for being involved and trying to spread that goodwill in the community. So I hope that you guys will play along and, um, and feel free to reach out to me and tell me your stories so that we can continue to tell those stories out to the community and um, just continue to to build on that goodwill. Thank you. 
Okay, I'm going to perform a, a mass act of kindness, break for lunch. So we have uh, 45 minutes, lunch is out in the, in the hallway. It's Bell here, okay. So we went on a city tour a couple years ago, and my good friend Wendy Jacob from Sun Valley, catch him, took us around with a bell, because she was a teacher originally. And uh, I said, I need something like that. And then class 28 gave me a bell and put their name on it and said, the best class ever. So they, immortal, they immortalized themselves, you know. And then I was so obnoxious with it on a trip that they took the ringer out of it and had to reclaim it. So this is the story. Now, we're going to get into the afternoon session. And I guess you're all wondering why there's like three hour traffic waits. And these people are going to explain it to you. <laughs> and, and they're going to give you their home numbers to tell you about it. But <laughs> transportation is a huge issue. So this afternoon, we're really going to talk about some of the practicalities that we're all facing now. And uh, it's important that we do. So I don't who's going to start out here? Oh, this is this was a teenager. She was in class 10 when she was in, in high school. Best class, ever. Best class ever, class 10. That's 20 years ago. She was in high school. Yeah, she was a five years old. True. <laughs> And she's now, this is Sarah Pierce, she's our uh, assistant city manager in Park City. So she's, she'll start out, but she has a, a cast of incredible people here, some of whom I've known a long time, some who are in the class this year, some of who, whatever they say, it's going to be good. Okay, Sarah, you're on. You have five minutes. Okay. Five minutes to talk about transportation. Let's do it. Um, first to start out, I'm Sarah Pierce, Deputy City Manager for Park City. Um, transportation is one of many departments that I oversee. Um, and I have joining me Alex Roy, who is our uh, Assistant Transportation Planning Department Manager. I also have uh, Caroline Rodriguez, who is the Head of High Valley Transit, and Brandon Brady, who is with Summit County Transportation Planning. So we are going to um, roll through a few things that we've been working on, but we, we wanted to be here together because we work hand in hand together all the time. We're constantly talking to each other. I think our staff is probably talking to each other every day with all of the things that we have going on. And we wanted you to know that because it's really important that we collaborate. Um, but before we get into it, I wanted to introduce to you Park City's new transportation director, who is in the house, Tim Sanderson. Will you please stand up? <laughs> um, Tim is a native of Canada. He most recently served as the general manager of Lethbridge Transit in Alberta. He graduated from the University of Manitoba with a master's of public administration. He has served in various leadership uh, roles in several prominent transportation and transit agencies, including Ann Arbor, Des Moines, and Nashville. So we are thrilled to have Tim with us. He's been here for one whole week, um, which is why he's not up here presenting. But next year, I won't be here. <laughs> Very excited to have Tim here. OK. Um, I am going to start talking to you about what we are doing right now. And I know it's hard to believe on a day like today. It did take, it took me two and a half hours to get here from my house and holiday. So I live it every day. I know what we're dealing with. Um, but we are working really hard on peak traffic mitigation. And if those of you that know Andrew Latham, he is the brainchild and um, you know orchestrator of all this work. Um, every day he's out there looking at the cameras and looking at the traffic signals and doing his best to navigate um, what's going on out there in real time. I wanted you to know exactly what we've been do doing uh, in the last couple of years. We have two new express routes from Richardson Platt Flat Park and Ride, one that goes to Deer Valley and one that goes to Park City Mountain. If you didn't know about these or you haven't heard about them, try it if, you, if that's convenient for you. We have gotten really, really great response. Um, I just wanted to quote, I looked up the stats this morning. Our average parking at Richardson since January is 200 cars a day. 
Um, so we, at, during Sundance, we saw a high of 482 cars out there. And on the weekends, we're seeing th about 300 on a daily basis. So that's, that's pretty good for the first year. And for a park and ride that is out in the middle of nowhere, as you know, <laughs> I'm pretty excited about that. Um, we also worked with UDOT this past summer. They were doing some um, repaving of 248. We worked with them in conjunction with that project and did a little finagling with line painting and some kind of building up of the existing shoulders to create transit priority on those shoulders so that when plowed, <laughs> the buses can bypass the traffic and make uh, transit a little bit faster and more efficient than being in your car. Uh, and it's working. We are also partnering really closely with Park City Mountain on all their base area circulation. We've done a lot of really great work there um, over the last couple of years. And for those of you that ski or spend time up there, I hope you've noticed a difference in the ingress and egress um, management around there. We also work really closely with Deer Valley, um, mostly on their overflow parking days, which are few, but when it, when it happens, it takes a lot of coordination and that's working really well too. Thanks, Victoria. <laughs> um, and then we're piloting some stuff. We're trying some stuff. Some stuff's not working, but we got to try it. So I don't know if you knew, but earlier in December, we tried a little, a couple things um, around the, we um, fondly call the intersection of Empire, Deer Valley Drive, Park Ave, the Box of Rocks. We tried a few things there. Didn't really work, but you know, we got to pilot some things and we're going to continue to do that. If you have ideas of things we should try, I'm all ears. And that is the end of me talking. I'm going to turn it over to Alex Roy. Thanks, Sarah. So as you mentioned, I'm Alex Roy. My field kind of works in the long range planning elements of the Park City Transit and Transportation Department. So in last fall, or a year and a half ago, we adopted Park City Forward, which is our long range transportation plan. Um, and within that, we developed six guiding principles and one overarching guiding principle to help us think about how we're looking at transportation every day. And I think, you know, days like today, we think like, oh man, the peak is so bad, but we've got to recognize we're building transportation for people who live here, who commute here every day. And so to that effect, we're really trying to not just look at one target demographic when we talk about long range transportation. So we want to look at people who are visiting maybe for cultural events, we want to look at seasonal or you know, resort employees. We want to look at people who you recreate and use the hills. We recognize that we are a ski town that comes with pros and cons. Um, a lot of the great bus service we get is directly from that transit, um, from that resort community. Um, Year-round employees, critical. You know, we understand there are more people coming up here every day than they are leaving here. Um, and so that's kind of one of the peak things we're dealing with too, is we get a lot of visitation from you know, Heber or Salt Lake. That's where a lot of the employees live. We want to understand them. And then you know, residents and then second or long-term owners, you know, probably the backbone of what we're looking for with transportation internal to Park City. So the six guiding principles we worked with council to develop were develop a park once community. Originally, this was kind of called a car optional community, but it was realized that you know, we're not that optional. Um, people probably are gonna continue to need to drive, but if we can recognize and capture them at lots and locations where they feel like, okay, if I drove here, then I can get around pretty conveniently by other modes once I'm in Park City, that's kind of what we're talking about with the park once community. And um, then we want to work with our regional partners on long range transportation solutions, UDOT, High Valley Transit and the county are all key partners, as Sarah mentioned. Identify and manage peak traffic during peak conditions. So this is kind of what Andrew Latham, that's like his uh, wheelhouse. He deals with that every day. Um, and then we want to expand biking and walking infrastructure. Park City and uh, the Valley um, are the only gold level League of American Bicyclist community within Salt Lake. So we take that very seriously. And we've heard from a lot of community members that biking and walking is a key, um, key reason they live here and very important to the community. So we want to expand on that. We want to look at new modes and new t technologies as they come available. You know, we, we recently did a project and some of the people who were in there, we, were, we looked at a whole bunch of modes that aren't ready to be built, but looked at the validity of what those modes might be in the future. So we've dedicated whole studies and times to that as well. And then, you know, we want to com continue and improve the internal Park City transit. You know, we understand that a lot of people get around by buses within Park City, and we want to understand and make that as functional as possible. So I mentioned regional partnerships. Um, 
we're you know, constantly trying to evolve and look how we think about how we look at transportation regionally. We understand that most of the traffic that people are concerned about is not directly people living within Park City bounds or even Summit County bounds, to be honest, but it's these regional trips and regional destinations that cause a lot of things. So to that end, um, recently we've worked with Mountain Land Association of Governments. That's the MPO that covers Utah County, but they also cover our uh, Summit County and Wasatch County. And we've created a Wasatch Back RPO. This just started last year. So it's a new look and a new effort in regional collaboration as far as transportation goes. And we also had the mayor uh, instigate or create a regional transportation convening group um, that is kind of not so government focused, but involves a lot of key partners to talk about what transportation looks like regionally and what they, uh, what they would like to see. So that includes resorts, the chamber, and other key players. And then finally, you know, working, um, we're constantly wanting to hear from the community and what their feedback is. So we have two surveys that are currently open. We have the bicycle and pedestrian master plan for Park City that just, the survey just opened this week. Um, so that'll be open for about a month. Um, it'll be advertised, it's on the PC Engage page, and we have an open house that's in coordination with the land management code later this month. Um, and that's really looking at what our infrastructure for the next 10 years are as far as biking and walking. Um, we also have the regional park and ride study. We're com uh, combined with the county on this. This is looking at both locations where future park and rides could be um, and how those park and rides are activated. You know, we mentioned the Richardson flat lot it has 700 and we're getting, you know, 300 to 500 cars there. So that's really great, but it is pretty far away. It's out of direction. So we're looking like, are there other opportunities to expand the park and ride um, system within Summit County and within Park City? So. The survey of that is open for one more week. We've already had 850 responses on that, so we're getting really good response rate. And we're looking forward to seeing what the, what the findings of that survey are. At the same time, we've been doing data collection, looking at travel times, and then we're gonna marry those together into like a comprehensive park and ride strategy for the county. So that's it for me, thanks. Okay, let's hear it for transportation. All right, here we go. I like the energy here. So um, I'm just going to try something here because the Super Bowl is coming up in a couple of days. So uh, let's hear it for the 49ers. Yeah, that's right. Okay, let's, uh, let's hear it for Taylor Swift. I mean, I mean the Chiefs, the Chiefs, not Taylor Swift. Okay, um, I just wanted to get you guys' attention and uh, wake everyone up after lunch before I dive into the important stuff of, uh, of what we're doing with the Summit County Transportation Planning Division and one of those big projects that we're doing is working with UDOT on the Kimball Junction area. And right now they are um, in the EIS process, the environmental impact statement that they're trying to do. And they are currently in this phase trying to um, look at different alternatives and the environmental impacts for those. And so I'm just gonna go over, there's, there's three different options that um, UDOT's looking at right now. Um, the county and city are working with them. To, to go through these options. And I'm just gonna do a high level kind of overview of them. If you guys wanna know more about them, you can talk to me afterwards, or UDOT is coming up to present to the city council and county council in March. So if you wanna know more about this, you can uh, show up to that meeting and they'll go into depth in, in all of this. So alternative A is what they're looking at. So it's, it's a split diamond. Um, what it is, is it's kinda, trying to separate the traffic from Kimball Junction to the rest, people just wanna go down. And so to simplify this, it's just an interchange before the interchange. So getting off, you can get off before and get into the Kimball Junction area, like the outlet malls, Walmart, Whole Foods, kind of all those areas over there. So if you don't wanna go down to Kimball Junction, you're just trying to go skiing or whatever, this is that option. There's a lot of things that go along with it. There still are improvements along um, 224 couple different lanes and stuff that, that they would need for that. But that's, that's alternative A. <clears throat> alternative B is a fly under where they grade separate Ute and Olympic. And so if you're trying to get in and out of, of town, just trying to get back home to Salt Lake or you work up here, you don't have to stop at Olympic or Ute Boulevard. And so you would just go right out and there's a bunch of frontage roads on the side. So if you do wanna access that, you just get off after you um, come to the Kimmel Junction interchange, you'd get off and go on a series of um, roads on the side 
to get where you wanted to go to like Smith's or, or Whole Foods or whatever you're trying to go. And the last one that they're looking at is just the traditional kind of what UDOT does a lot of times, just widening the road, it's just putting more lanes along 224. And with A and C, there are there is an additional tunnel that goes under because it's hard for pedestrians to cross that many lanes of traffic and it slows down traffic when there are pedestrians crossing. And so there is an underpass right there but this would just put in three lanes, through lanes going um, into town and out, and also double rights and lefts. And so there's just a lot more lanes with this one, but this is the traditional one that kind of UDOT looks at. So those are the three alternatives. Um, another big thing that the county has done is uh, we have taken over ownership of the bike share system. And so we're working with um, local companies and agencies to try to get more um, stations out there. So to give people more options with, with transportation. So not everyone has to get in their car and visitors get here, they can drop, they can get on an e-bike and ride it wherever they want to around town, around the county. And for people that live here as well, instead of getting in your car, you can just go hop on a bike. I mean, a lot of people have their own bikes, but if you wanna hop on an e-bike and take that around, it's just trying to give people more options for, for transportation. And there's a lot more stuff that the uh, Summit County uh, Transportation Planning Department's doing. We have hired a new active, AC, or new active transportation planner that is over our bike share system and looks at different trails and stuff. We're teaming up with Park City and a bunch of other um, organizations for Olympic planning. And there is a lot going on over at the Silver Summit Interchange too. And so there's improvements coming this year and we're designing for more improvements in the next three to five years um, there as well. So there's like kind of a lot going on that we're looking at trying to make it easier for people to, to get around. And that's, uh, that's it for me. I'll turn time over to Caroline. Thanks, Brandon. Hey everyone. So I can get a sense, how many people know High Valley Transit exists? All right. How many have ridden a High Valley Transit vehicle? How many of you have complained that the buses are dirty? <laughs> Knock it off, we do not have a bus wash yet, okay? <laughs> All right, just wanna see where we are. Okay, funny story. Um, does everybody know Scott Van Hardisfelt in the back corner? Raise your hand, Scott. So for those of you who don't know, Scott is quite literally the reason that I live in Utah. So if you love High Valley, you can thank Scott. If you hate it, also talk to Scott, okay? <laughs> Okay, so High Valley, we have been around for just over two years. Um, we were born out of a super successful partnership with Park City Transit, but it got to the point where, as you all know, outside of city limits is where the growth is occurring. A lot of the tax revenues are coming in. Um, we needed to expand transit service regionally. Uh, we needed to make a few different changes to make it work for us. So the two uh, elected bodies came together and decided, you know what, it's time to split off and focus on different things. We hit our two year anniversary in July of this year. How many Fair free public transit trips did we provide by our second year anniversary? Two million. Two million, yes. <laughs> two million fair free public transit trips in the first two years of service. Um, we were up 48% year one and 54% in ridership uh, year, year one over year two. Do you all understand how it works? You do, everyone? Okay. okay, I was hoping somebody would ask. Okay, cause you know, all right. So how are we different from Park City Transit and other transit agencies that you've dealt with? We are fully technology driven. We operate on an algorithm developed by a private company that dictates how, where, and when public transit operates. What we ask from our customers, tell us, where you are and where you're going, just like a Google trip planner. We then tell you, this is the most efficient route for you, for the other riders in the system, for the drivers, for the weather conditions. Can you walk? No, you can't walk. All of these different characteristics are pulled into an algorithm and we tell you exactly what your trip is gonna look like. You have your trip that you take every day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. 
on Monday, that trip could be, Scott, leave your door, wait for Bridget to pick you up in the Summit vehicle right outside your driveway, and she's gonna drive you to your destination. On Tuesday, that trip could be, Scott, leave your home, walk 15 feet to the bus stop, and the 101 is gonna pick you up and deliver, to, deliver you to another bus stop close to your destination, walk to your destination. So we call this dynamic routing, and it's always millisecond by millisecond optimizing what's going on in the entire system. That's gonna blow up on a day like today. Obviously, we are stuck in the same traffic you are. Let's be patient with our drivers. What are we working on? Everyone's heard about the bus rapid transit. You're really gonna start to see this project pick up uh, in the coming months. So what this is, is dedicated transit lanes on both sides of 224 from Kimball Junction to just past the White Barn. After the White Barn, we're gonna start to merge into mixed flow traffic. So by the time the transit vehicles get to the intersection of 224 and 248, they will run the west, rest of the way with traffic, but rely on technology improvements through the intersections to allow the bus to flow more quickly uh, and more efficiently than the cars on the road. What does that mean for you? Get out of your car, try the bus, try it once, try it twice. You'll be sitting in the bus, flying by everybody else while they're all sitting in their cars. One of the things I wanna point out is that a huge uh, majority of the staging for the construction and the construction occurs within the right-of-way but outside of the traffic lanes. So the plan is that the disruption to you all is going to be minimal. Construction is likely going to take two construction seasons because of the winter, and we hope that we will be operational by 2027 and of course remain fare free. Our new facility. Um, I've seen some pictures of our blasting on KPCW's webpage, so I know you all know it's happening, um, even today in the weather. We are building our new transit campus at Sago Lily Way. Um, another fun fact for you, I wanted to call it Kim Carson Way, or alternatively in second place, Rodriguez Way, but uh, the county manager at that time said that is not happening. So we settled, we settled on Sago Lily. So, we have an operations and administration building. Second floor is, oops. Second floor are nine units of workforce housing that are going to be used for our employees. Um, that's the building right there on the far right. Then we have a 28 bay bus barn, which will be all inside with charging and covered parking. We have space for a duplicate 28 bay bus barn that will be built in the future. Finally, we have our maintenance facility, which will encompass um, five full-size bus bays, plus room to service all of our micro vehicles. I also, one minute, okay, I'm gonna go real fast. I also wanna tell you that April 28th, start paying attention, listen for that date. There's gonna be a lot of changes coming up to the collective transit system. 10 white is being transitioned to the 10 X. Realtors in the room, residential realtors, anyone, anyone? Anyone who lives in Silver Creek Village? Are you serious? Come on, okay. Silver Creek Village likely getting fixed route service um, towards the end of April, so everybody be paying attention. We're gonna talk a lot about that. I wanna leave you with one thought. I know you've heard from a lot of really great agencies today and people who are working really hard doing amazing things. Who knows what agency touches every single thing you've talked about today? Goes into Wasatch County, Mida area, Olympics, Park City, down to Salt Lake, Summit County. Who is it? You know who it is. It's public transit. Okay, your public transit and collective transportation team, we impact everything that you have talked about today. And I say that not as a humble brag, although it totally is an outright brag because I think we're really awesome, but I say it because leadership can come in many, many different forms, um, even in public transit. 
And the first step for us is showing up, and you've all showed up today, and thank you so much for doing that. Thank you. I was remiss in my um, excitement about Richardson Flat and failed to mention really, really important partners in get it standing up those two bus routes. We could not have done it without the financial partnership of Park City Mountain and Deer Valley. So thank you to those two partners. Thank you. Okay, how about some housing? So while Jason's doing that, <clears throat> I should mention that Daniel's back there filming all this, and that's going to be on the city's website, parkcity.org slash leadership. So if you go on to leadership, this whole day is going to be on there. So if people couldn't attend today or could only attend part of it, want to see more of it, it is online starting tonight, tomorrow, next, next year, <laughs> 2027, along with the transportation. So I've got it up, but how do I get it? Okay, how do we get this changed here? I know you can start talking and I'll- Yeah, I'll start talking. Uh, so do we have mics besides this one? No. Okay. I can be loud. So I'm gonna, I'm, I'm like others, I'm gonna move over here. You guys have been sitting here listening to people sit there all day. So. That's transportation. Uh, Jason, I'm housing development manager for Park City. This one. Uh, I'm joined today with Megan McKenna and she'll be presenting in just a second. Um, I would disagree a little bit with Okay. We got you up here, buddy. Yeah. Uh, first, uh, so, uh, but there's probably there's good arguments. They actually intertwine quite a bit, uh, and they really rely on each other. Uh, I think it's chicken and egg. You know, we want fixed tra transit routes. Thank you. Fixed transit routes, uh, but they need the people to actually ride the buses to be able to do that, right, Hannah? So, uh, and so we, uh, we really work together on a lot of things. So, but uh, we're gonna try to make this really fast because we do want to leave time for questions. So if you can move to the next slide, Megan. Do you wanna do it? So I, I would say that um, affordable housing has been an issue in Park City for a long time. And we've actually been working on it for a long time. Uh, we, you know, really started producing affordable housing units back in the 70s. We started to pass, uh, policies uh, in the early 90s uh, that really helped to promote affordable housing. And you can just see this, as far as Park City's housing production, we really hit some um, pretty high production numbers uh, in the 90s, uh, in the 2010s, but it's kind of leveled off a little bit. Uh, we're actually about 651 units now uh, as total in, within city limits. When you go out to the county, you, can, you probably can't see that because it's so small. They're almost about 1,200 there, so. Um, but we had, in 2016, we did a needs assessment, and that needs assessment said that we needed to uh, produce 80 affordable units per year to maintain 15% of our workforce. Many people don't know that we have, I think actually the, the latest stat I saw from Jeff was like 12,000, 15,000 employees driving in every day. Um, so we have roughly 15% of our workforce lives within city limits. That means 85% of that number, that 15,000, 11,000, whatever it is, actually has to drive into town every single day. Our goal was just to maintain that 15%. Uh, most recent study that we've done, uh, just released uh, this past fall, was that we're down to 12.5% of the employees. So we're actually losing ground. Uh, and so, our goal is really to produce housing opportunities. We do it a number of different ways. Uh, we do it through uh, development. The city's actually worked as a developer themselves, uh, but we really have, are switching that focus more to public-private partnerships, where we're pub uh, partnering with uh, private uh, uh, organizations that build housing. Uh, in addition to that, we really focus on policy and how can we change things like land management code, zoning, uh, to help promote affordable housing as well. So, next slide. So um, the council made a goal, I forgot to say this, after that study in 2016, they made a goal to produce 800 units by 2026. So that's been our goal in the housing team uh, to really try to strive to produce those 800 units. So as far as progress made, um, as far as the policy side, we've uh, created a new section of code called the Affordable Master Plan Development. Uh, this is a code specifically 
uh, to incentivize affordable housing. And it's for any development that produces that half of it, half the square footage has to be affordable. If they uh, come in with a, pro a proposal like that, we'll give them increased height, we'll sit, reduce their setbacks, reduce the amount of open space that they need, reduce the amount of parking that they need. Those are all things that drive up costs uh, in a development. And when you can reduce the cost to the developer, that means they can charge less for the units, right? It's kind of simple math. So um, in addition to that, we're looking really a lot now at, at uh, ADUs, accessible dwelling units. These are units that can be, uh, be within a unit. So they're like little apartments within a house, uh, or they could be detached uh, accessory dwelling units. So uh, maybe in the backyard, they might, they might drop one of these down, like a little tiny home. Uh, these are great ways to produce uh, affordable housing very quickly and somewhat cheaply. So uh, as far as programs go, we uh, kicked off our pilot program, the light deed uh, restriction program. Uh, this is a program that's not necessarily f focused on affordability, but much more in community vibrancy, where we pay folks uh, to put deed restrictions on their homes that say that it's going to either be owner-occupied or it's going to be rented long-term. So really focusing on trying to reduce the amount of short-term rentals uh, or just vacant homes. Uh, Park City, of all our housing stock that we have, seven, over 70% of it is vacant, meaning that it's either a second home or it's a, a nightly rental. Only 30% is primary. Uh, moving on to the partnerships, we have some exciting stuff. Engine House, uh, that's the one down there on the left there. Uh, this is right behind the Boneyard. Uh, it's usually an easy landmark to tell people. You guys know where the Boneyard is? Right behind that. Uh, this is a public-private partnership with the city and Jay Fisher companies uh, that will be producing 123 units. 99 of them are going to be affordable at 60% of the area median income. Uh, that is under construction right now. Uh, the other one here is uh, Studio Crossing, which is actually gonna be right across the street. If you know the film studio, this is actually phase two. Uh, the Crandalls, the developer there, came to the city and said, you know, we know that the original plan was to build a big hotel and to build a theater and some commercial. We wanna change that. Uh, and in order for them to change that, they had to open up the MPD and some other things. It was gonna be really complicated, but they said it's worth it because we wanna build affordable housing. So they are going to be building 185 uh, affordable housing units priced uh, all rental. They'll be rented out at uh, 60, 70, and 80% AMI. They uh, started moving some dirt uh, this fall, but we'll be going vertical in the spring. So towards the goal here, you can see as far as the, we don't have a ton that are completed, but we have a lot that have been approved and are either in, that are in, under construction. So uh, we don't count ones that haven't been approved yet, meaning entitled uh, through the planning commission because they're still up in the air if they're gonna actually move forward. But uh, of the ones that have already been approved uh, and the ones that are under construction, we're about 656, so 82% of the goal of 800. I can tell you there are two to three more applications that will put us over this goal of 800. Uh, so we're really excited about that. And with that, I think, uh, are you next or do I have another slide? Oh, there we go, looking ahead. So these are the ones that we're talking about that are either uh, entitled uh, or on their way. Um, we talked, I hope it's been mentioned before, Studio Crossing is the one I just talked about. Engine House is under construction. We just put out RFPs looking for developers for uh, Clark Ranch, which is right next to Park City Heights. Uh, that's the property the city owns. And then the other one is Woodside Park Phase 2, which is located right in the heart of Old Town uh, where the current senior center is. We'll be looking to redevelop that site uh, to put uh, more units there. So that's it. Now I'll turn it over to Megan. Do you want to do that? Yeah. It's the enter button. All right. Uh, Hi, everyone. I'll come down here, too. Uh, my name is Megan McKenna. I'm the housing advocate for Mountain Lands Community Housing Trust. You can go to the next one. Uh, how many of you have heard of Mountain Lands in here? Probably most of you. Uh, Mountain Lands has been around for over 30 uh, years now. Um, and we are a, a local nonprofit. We're not the only uh, housing nonprofit. Um, Habitat for Humanity is also here. Um, but we, uh, we've, we've been around, as Jason mentioned, housing uh, affordability has been an issue in Park City uh, for a long time. Um, and if you go to, uh, well, including the HOPA redevelopment, which we'll look at in just a minute. Uh, Mountainlands has uh, created or preserved over 1,000 units um, in the Wasatch back. So uh, here are some of those. You may know, um, 
probably know someone that at some point has lived in one of these. Um, the Line Condos, Holiday Village, Richer Place, um, Elmbridge, uh, that's down in Heber, uh, Mountain View, uh, Washington Mills, Central Village. Um, so these are uh, lots of uh, our, or these are all of our mountain lands projects. Um, but of course, there, there's a lot more affordable housing in the area. Um, and, and Jason mentioned some of those. And um, this is what we have coming up. Um, Parkview Place, uh, we actually just finished um, that last year. Uh, we're really excited about Moneros, which is a deeply affordable apartment complex that will be uh, uh, housing people at the end of this month already. Um, so that's coming coming right up. And then HOPA, which stands for the Holiday Village Parkside, uh, that's going to be the redevelopment of those uh, apartment buildings. Um, those are those are mountain lands projects. If you go to the next one here, um, it's not everyone knows who owns what apartment buildings or, or who rents what or who maintains a, a wait list. Um, and so uh, a couple of years ago, uh, my former boss um, had this vision of creating a, a housing resource center. Um, and that's where uh, myself and, and Angelica work. Um, in 2022, uh, Pat Matheson, who I presented here uh, with last year, um, he, he had this vision because people were, were so confused that the affordable housing uh, world was so complex and with the need rising, um, he, he uh, really saw this need and said, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna start a housing resource center for the whole Wasatch back. So not just for mountain lands projects, but we wanna be a resource for um, all affordable housing. And so that's what um, Angelica and I do. Um, Angelica is the housing navigator. Um, and so she helps people navigate that complex system. So whether they want to um, get, get into an a affordable apartment that Mountain Lands owns or maybe um, a, a home that Habitat for Humanity is building or something in the county or, or in the city, um, she helps with the uh, application process, with uh, lending opportunities, with training, qualifying. Um, she also stewards the, the deed restrictions in Summit and Wasatch County. Um, she has a, a really big job um, and she's really helping uh, break down barriers. She's helping people access um, affordable housing in our, our communities. Um, she also uh, has a background in, in real estate, and some of you may know her from the People's Health Clinic, too. So she has a, a healthcare background. Um, amazing, amazing uh, human to work with. I'm really lucky. Um, I am the housing advocate, and so my, my work is in advocacy. And I do want to just say really quick, I know we want to save some time for maybe a question, but um, the reason I have this job is because of leadership. So I just wanted to give my shout out, um, just like Pat Putt did earlier, um, to Miles and, and to this program. Um, I was a high school teacher, Park City High School, when I did the leadership class, uh, class of 28, which I'm seeing some of my classmates uh, here today. Um, and I was actually in a leadership class um, and, and sitting next to one of my classmates. And she said, um, I heard you on the radio. I, I made a comment at a Summit County Council meeting. Um, there was a, a temporary moratorium on uh, nightly rentals um, on the agenda. And because of leadership, I, I had been more engaged in, in uh, local government and what was happening. And uh, I made a comment. And she heard it on the radio and she said, hey, I, I heard about this new housing resource center and this advocacy job. You should consider applying. I was not looking for jobs. Um, I, I, you know, thought, well, I might as well look at it. And uh, it, it was instantly, I was like, this is the job for me. This is, this is what I want to do. Um, I was so excited uh, with the, the vision Pat had. And, um, and it, it's been a, a really exciting year and a half um, in that role. Um, what I do in, in advocacy is um, looking at housing solutions, increasing inventory, um, policy, uh, code changes, transit-oriented development, a lot of this stuff um, we heard from earlier presentations. Um, and I think if there's a theme for today, um, I would say, I've, I've been here um, all day, I would say change is inevitable and, and the solutions are gonna be regional and require collaboration. Um, and so that's a, a big part of, of all of these presentations. Hopefully you're, you're feeling that theme too, um, is, is gonna be collaboration with transportation, you know, with our, our local government, with our um, staff and with our um, elected officials. 
And so uh, regional solutions is gonna be a, a, a really important one. And, and like Jason mentioned, housing um, is, is really um, so closely connected to, to all of those things. Um, and, and I really became a housing advocate when I got into affordable housing. Um, as a, a teacher at the time in the school district and someone who grew up here um, and, and could no longer afford to live here, um, seeing family and friends uh, displaced over the years, coworkers moving further and further out, um, this, uh, this was personal to me. Um, I live in the neighborhood just right across the street in the Park City Heights neighborhood in an affordable townhome. And, and it was, it was life-changing, and um, I want other people to have that life-changing opportunity. Um, and so we, we try to address the, the misconceptions that come along with uh, affordable housing. Um, we, we do different programs. We partner with, with pretty much everyone that, that you've heard from today. Um, we did the We RIP program. We partnered with the city last year, and this year par we partnered with the chamber um, that Morgan mentioned earlier. Um, that stands for the Workforce Employer Rental Incentive Program, um, and it was uh, really successful. And we're, we're looking forward to even improving that for next year. Um, we partnered with the chamber on, um, actually, and Jason too. This is kind of a this is a really exciting one. So save the date, May fourteenth. Um, the the chamber is doing the uh, Wasatch Back Economic Summit. Um, I applied for one of the sustainable tourism grants uh, that that Morgan talked about earlier, and we're doing an economic impact study on affordable housing, and it's going to be a regional study, um, so it'll include Wasatch and, and Summit County, and we're really excited to present at the at the economic summit. It will be one of the the breakout sessions, so hopefully, we'll see some of you there. Um, just like Angelica, we're always working on um, uh, bringing equity um, into the equation, um, breaking down those barriers, um, and also supporting tenants um, and homeowners that live in affordable housing. So uh, we are the Housing Resource Center. Um, hopefully we can be a, a resource um, for all of you. Whether you want to help advocate for, for more housing, or um, you need housing, or uh, want to refer someone that, that needs housing, um, definitely reach out to us. Question. Very short Yay. Answer. Yes, very short answers. Questions? Uh, yeah, we did actually, and because of High Valley Transit, we included it. We didn't um, the year before that, but because there is transit now um, between the, the two that we did include Heber, yeah. And next year, actually, we're, we want to work with the Heber Valley Chamber um, in incentivizing ways in the, the Wasatch One Valley too. Una más. You got it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I have fun with these folks. I'm proud of them. Now we're talking the basics. <laughs> Turn the faucet, flush the toilet. We're going to find out who's starting. We're going to flush the toilet. <laughs> You're going to flush the toilet first. Okay. Here, Daniel will help you there. These guys are the unsung heroes. If you add up what the two of them have spent in the last <laughs> in the last couple of years, you're going to be amazed when you hit the numbers. I'm sure, I'll tell you. Okay. Hey, Daniel. Daniel, is there? A, uh, uh, I was in class eight. eight. So my name is Mike Lures. I'm the general manager of the Water Reclamation District. Uh, Clint and I are going to talk about water and wastewater and uh, what all this growth has uh, impacted uh, those type of resources. So fire away, Clint. Next one there. So if you, have, if you have used one of these today, we appreciate your business. Uh, go ahead, Clint. So uh, next one, you just go scroll th through these. So, you know, who are we? The Water Reclamation District is a special district, much like the fire district or the recreation district. We don't put out fires and we don't, uh, you know, support trails. We collect and treat what you flush. And that has a big impact on our local environment. Uh, we're governed by an elected board uh, that have done a very good job. Good. 
So we service uh, all of the Park City area in western Summit County, commonly referred to as the Snyderville Basin. So we have everything from Summit Park to Promontory to you know Deer Valley to, to Glen Wild. We operate two uh, wastewater reclamation facilities. We call them reclamation facilities because we are reclaiming the water that you use and that water goes back into our local streams to support the native fish populations. And I'll talk about that a little bit, good. This is a, another facility over here by Home Depot. You probably don't even know it exists. Uh, it's kind of hidden back over there. You might see it if you uh, use the uh, rail trail. Okay. One of the things that uh, we are required to do, and Clint will say the same thing, is we are a basic service provider. So when growth is approved, we have to provide service. We do not control growth. I've had people say, well, Mike, why don't you just stop expanding the wastewater treatment plant and you'll stop growth. And I said, that's true. It would stop growth, but it would also end my career. So we, don't, we prefer not to do that. Okay. So talking about growth, uh, we currently have a project underway uh, over here at Jeremy Ranch. It's for new growth only. And it's about $120 you know, million. And my point to you is that growth pays for all of it. We do not charge you, an existing customer, to subsidize growth. And to kind of put it in perspective, if you are building a six-bedroom home, just to connect to the system is pushing $27,000. If you build a starter castle, obviously it's more. Good. So going back to the East Canyon facility, in the foreground there is East Canyon Creek. Good. East Canyon Creek is the home of some native trout species. East Canyon Creek at one time was a blue ribbon trout fishery. Uh, the Bonneville cutthroat trout is one of the uh, species that's uh, is having a difficult time because it requires lots of water that's very clean and that no longer exists. This is a result of us moving here, all of us. At one time, as I indicated, East Canyon Creek was a blue ribbon trout fishery. We all moved here, we needed water, so the water departments diverted water out of the streams, dug wells, tapped the springs, and collected all the water coming out of the mine tunnels. This is East Canyon Creek a number of years ago because the various water diverters, including golf courses and other, exercised their legal right to collect water and it dried the creek up. Now. Clint will talk about this, but Park City, in essence, ran out of water many years ago. And the only reason growth is taking place is because water is now imported from Rockport Reservoir to supply water to new growth. So it's not like we have extra water or a reservoir here in the Snyderville Basin area that uh, that water is coming from. Okay. And when the creek dries up, the fish die. Okay. Now I'm going to touch on a couple things that uh, we all contribute to, and these are issues that we are dealing with at the Water Reclamation District to protect our local environment. And the first is a whole cocktail of pharmaceuticals coming down the sewer pipe that ends up at the treatment plant that we have to deal with. Currently, there are no state or federal regulations requiring us to even look at this stuff, much less uh, think about how we might want to remove it. Go ahead. Pharmaceuticals are coming into the system because people flush pills, but about 92% of the pharmaceutical cocktail that we see comes from your urine because most of these pharmaceuticals just don't disappear in your body. They come out in your urine, they end up in the wastewater, and they go to the treatment plant. Good. I don't want to get into the science of this too much, uh, but if you would like to get a detailed presentation on the impact of pharmaceuticals on local fish populations, we can do that. But one of the big uh, items that we're really concerned about are estrogens because they feminize the male fish. And if you have all females, that's not good for the population. Okay. So over time, we've con uh, conducted quite a few uh, research uh, studies with Baylor University in particular. And... Uh, We've looked at all kinds of fish, and I can get into uh, you know, the results of all that, but let you know that we are 
looking into this, and we kind of, uh, not kind of, we do have a very good idea of what the estrogens are doing to the fish. I cannot tell you what the Prozac is doing other than the fact that they seem to be real happy. But uh, we have lots of Prozac type drugs in the wastewater, just so you know. Good. Yeah. Next one. Next thing you need to be aware of, what can you do to help the environment? Do not flush flushable wipes. Go ahead, next slide. This is what happens. They wrap around all the pumps and motors that we have. They stop up the system. And what can happen is it can overflow and pollute the local environment. So when you flush a flushable wipe, you have to pay us and pay some of our guys top dollar to take all this stuff off. And it's a big, big problem. And I might tell you that our industry has been suing the makers of these. And uh, we've come to some pretty good uh, resolutions of that. And you'll see these being repackaged as not being flushable. So what you do with them is you put them in your trash. You don't flush them down the commode. I want to talk about a uh, microplastics initiative. Uh, we collect, obviously, everything that's flushed, including laundry water. And that's a big problem when it comes to microplastics. Good. So when you get into microplastics, and again, if you want a detailed description, uh, presentation of microplastics, plastics, give me a call. But just uh, for the purpose of today's discussion, fibers coming off of synthetic clothing is the largest group of microplastic particles that you'll see in our environment, including the ocean. Good. A typical load of ski clothing will produce about one and a half million micro uh, plastic fibers per load. And that goes into the sewer system. So that's something that we're dealing with in addition to all the pharmaceuticals and all of those kind of things. Okay. The other thing that, and I'm sure Clint's gonna talk about this a little bit, are PFAS compounds. Uh, they come from all kinds of things, including the ski waxes, and uh, those get into the system. They don't break down in the sewer treatment plant or wastewater plant, nor do the pharmaceuticals. The good news is we do collect uh, most of the microplastics in our treatment system, but even though we have very advanced, some of the best in the state of Utah, advanced wastewater treatment facilities, these facilities were never designed to remove pharmaceuticals or PFAS compounds. That all takes a whole different set of technologies. Good. Got all kinds of PFAS compounds. And what's interesting, and again, we have presentations on the science of all this if you want to get into details, but due to the nuances of the biological action, we actually will take some PFAS compounds and they will be, uh, I'm going to say, they increase in strength within the treatment plant. And that has to do with uh, biodegradation and all kinds of fancy terms. But it's, again, something we're dealing with. Good. The good news is we do, in fact, know how to remove the whole cocktail of pharmaceuticals. And we also know how to remove all the PFAS compounds. There are no state or federal regulations in the way of limits that have been established yet. PFAS uh, regulations will be coming. Uh, There'll be something that Clint will have to deal with first, and then keep in mind that anything in the thing like PFAS compounds that are in the water, they end up in the wastewater, so we have to deal with them before they're discharged into our local streams. But what I want to tell you here is that we've conducted quite a few studies, and we know how to remove all these pharmaceuticals and uh, PFAS compounds, but it's not cheap. And one of these days, you'll be seeing uh, us on the radio and read about us in the newspaper, uh, needing to raise your monthly wastewater bill, probably about 10 bucks a month to remove these compounds, which is a huge, huge increase because the average uh, wastewater bill right now for a residential home is about $45. When we'll be doing that, we don't know yet. One of the issues we have is that we discharge into these small little mountain streams that have very little water left in them because we're all using the water. Uh, but we don't know what standard, what, what level we need to treat down to. Uh, that's still being worked out. Uh, but the good news is we know how to do it. Good, next. 
Uh, last thing I want to touch on is water reuse. I get a lot of uh, questions, and they say, well, Mike, you know, you guys really clean up this wastewater really well, uh, other than the pharmaceuticals and the PFAS compounds, but we know that you can take that out as well. Why don't you use it for snowmaking? The bottom line is, in the wastewater utility, we don't have a legal right to use the water that we treat, meaning we don't, we don't own it. Only the original water right holders have a legal right to use our treated waste, I say our well, treated waste, the water that we treat for snowmaking. So we had a, uh, one of the local ski areas come, come to us not too long ago, and they said, we'd like to capture some of that water uh, that you uh, have treated very well before it goes back into the creek, and we want to use it for snowmaking. I said, great, we'll be happy to work with you, but you'll need to talk to the water companies, um, uh, you know, to get permission to do that. And that's being discussed. Lastly, we are not your water provider. I get this question all the time. A lady asked me the other day, she says, why do I get two water bills? And I said, well, the one water bill is for the water that comes out of your faucet when you turn it on, and the second one is to pay to us because we have to collect and treat and get rid of what you flush. And then she understood. But anyway, that's a little about the uh, Water Reclamation District. Um, please feel free to give us a call. We encourage people to take a tour if they, where it all goes. And we give, lots, we give lots of tours, and we get into all the science of all this if you'd like to, to hear more. Any quick question real quick, anybody? Right. Clint, it's all yours. All right. Where's Daniel? Yeah, we got to change. I should know how to do that. Yeah. <laughs> Back there filming, and he runs up here, he's missing that door. I have to eject this. Yeah. Try again. Oh. So, oops, I don't know. What we got about what like 90 presentations up here. Yeah, <laughs> This one right here. It's the only one on there. That's yours. You can put down. Uh, yeah, left and right, I think. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Clint McAfee, the Public Utilities Director for Park City. Um, I've been with the city for um, about uh, 14 years, and in, in my current role as director for about 13 of those years. Um, this is the team, uh, most of the team anyway, um, who provide water 24-7, 365 days a year to, to Park City. Next. Um, so a quick overview of the services we provide. Um, we provide water quality, I, I mean, so we're, we, we deliver water to every uh, connection in city limits. Um, and, you know, to most people, what that means, I guess, is water comes out of your tap and shower and you don't think about it too much. You take it for granted and then flush it and Mike takes care of it. And you probably take that for granted even more. Um, but there's a lot that goes into it. Uh, we have uh, four divisions. Um, so we manage um, eight different water sources. Um, and then we... Uh, we're making sure those waters are producing enough water to meet current day demands and future day or future projections. Um, we treat all that water to drinking water standards and then we distribute it. Um, we have a very complicated water rights portfolio in the West. Uh, you can't divert and use water unless you actually have a, a property right to do so. Um, and it's, it gets complicated, um, especially when there's limited resource. We manage uh, two abandoned mine tunnels, and I'll talk about that a, a little bit more, but the Spiro Tunnel is about three miles long that we keep um, open and maintained, and the Judge Tunnel uh, is about two and a half miles that we keep open. Um, we have customer service, em emergency response is a big part of our service that we provide. So when a water line breaks, rather than just let it continue and drain a tank and destroy a bunch of property, we react to it very quickly. Um, at any given time, we have three operators on call um, ready to respond to, to any emergency, whether it be a, from a treatment plant, a water break, or just a customer that's having a problem 24-7. Um, 
Uh, we are self-funded um, and we are like uh, Snyderville Bay, the sewer district, we are entirely funded by the, the fees we collect. So we collect service fees by selling water to customers and then impact fees uh, that are paid for by new growth. So like the sewer district, um, growth pays for itself. So if a new house is built or a new co uh, hotel, they pay and buy their part of the water system and pay their impact. It's not p passed along to customers. Um, our current budget is about $30 million a year, um, which is a very large budget for a town this size. And I'll get into a little bit why that, that cost is so high in a minute. Um, a big, huge part of what we do is infrastructure management. Um, next slide. Um, so we get a lot of questions about whether or not we have a, enough water. Um, you know, every new growth that happens or, or is per, or slated or in the permitting process is like, where's the water coming from? So to be clear, this is just, um, I'm just talking about water inside of Park City's boundaries, not the Snyderville Basin or over in Jordanell or the Heber Valley. Um, this is purely Park City limits right here. Um, and the answer to the question, do we have enough water? Uh, as long as nothing changes, the answer is yes. Um, you can see the, the bottom squiggly line is the the treated demand, so that's what we serve to households and hotels, and it's used in restaurants and front lawns. And then above that is creek, our creek flow demands that we provide to the creek um, and two golf courses. Um, and what you can see is it's, it goes up and down every year. Um, the biggest drivers are weather and the economy. Um, you know, the wetter it is, the less water, and the better the economy is, the more water people use. Um, but another observation is it's trending downward. Um, and in 2011, we were out of water. We were operating above our reliable capacity. Um, and that's when Rockport was built. Mike mentioned this, we ran out of water. So we had to tap Rockport Reservoir. There's an intake over at Rockport Reservoir. We pump it over the hill. There's a big storage pond up in Promontory and then it comes to Park City and we treat it right across the highway over here. Um, but again, water demand is decreasing. Um, and so part of what we're using that surplus for is to add more water to the creeks when we can. And we're also selling it. Um, we're in a, in agreement with the regional water providers with Mountain Regional and Summit Water in the Snyderville Basin. And their projections don't look as good as this. And so we've physically connected our our systems and we actually use our surplus capacity and lease water and sell water to, to Summit Water right now. Next. Um, so this is kind of a, uh, the graph on the right kind of shows you what our demand looks like throughout the year. Um, so the, the bottom blue is resident indoor. So that's permanent resident, just constant use indoor throughout the year. It doesn't, doesn't fluctuate a, a whole lot. Um, and then we get winter visitors is kind of the next layer up, the kind of yellowish color. Um, these are the hotel demands, increase commercial, restaurant, things like that. Um, the big red or maroon, whatever color that is, is uh, summer visitor, vi visitors, but it's mostly irrigation. So this is people irrigating their lawns and the golf courses and parks and things like that. And then unlike other depart, uh, cities and water districts, we have a second peak in the winter time um, where we're providing water to Vail Resorts and Deer Valley Resorts for snowmaking. So all the water that Vail uh, uses to make snow comes out of the Spiro Tunnel and is managed by Park City. They own a water right for a portion of it but we manage the source. And Deer Valley um, receives water from Park City as well. Next. Um, yeah, I mentioned a big part of our job is to manage infrastructure. Um, you know, that's, that's the costliest part of what we do. Um, you know, our workforce and labor and trucks and tools and things like that are relatively low cost compared to what it takes to, to run a, a uh, water system that's valued at well over a billion dollars. 
um, a very complex system and it takes a lot of money. All the infrastructure is just kind of degrading in place and we have to slowly replace it and maintain it constantly. So here's a list of our water sources. Um, a couple things to point out. Um, we have a very diversified portfolio. Um, there's, we have wells, springs, mine tunnels, and uh, a, a connection to Rockport Reservoir. Um, so we're uh, somewhat protected in terms of diversifying our portfolio and risk allocation. You know, if there was an earthquake in one location, it wouldn't affect uh, other sources or a for forest fire in the upper Weaver River shed that, um, or watershed that could take out the Rockport source wouldn't affect our wells and the mine tunnels. So um, the other big part of this is almost half of our water supply comes from abandoned mine tunnels. So we own a thousand acre feet out of the Ontario drain tunnel. That's a drain tunnel that drains into Jordanelle Reservoir, but kind of goes towards Stein Erickson and Lodge and under that lodge and under Deer Valley. The Judge Tunnel entrance is above Main Street. If you go up Main Street and up Daly and keep going, you're gonna run into the Judge Tunnel and that extends under Bonanza Flat and the mountains. Um, and then Spiro Tunnel, daylights over in Silver Star by the Park City Golf Course. And it, it goes straight um, right up Thanes Canyon, kind of into the Jupiter Bowl area. And so if you imagine the mountain range and then these under, uh, these tunnels act as basically under drains for the mountains. So all the snow melts and the rain infiltrates into the ground and there's these tunnels and it, it all just drains into these tunnels and then flows out and we collect it, treat it and distribute it to our customers. Next. Um, so we have three water treatment plants um, that we manage. Quinn's water treatment plant is located just right across the highway over here off Richardson Flat Road. Um, it treats water pumped over from Rockport Reservoir. Next. Uh, the Creekside water treatment plant is um, by the off Holiday Ranch Loop Road in Park Meadows by the fire station. Um, this treats two of our wells that have issues with um, surface water, water infiltrating into the wells. And so this is a facility that uh, treats for pathogens in, in addition to, to other things. Next. Um, this is the big project that has been going on forever over on the golf course. Um, this is the biggest project that the city has done that I know of, and I'm pretty sure it's, it is the city, biggest capital project the city has ever done. Um, the construction of co cost on this alone, Miles wanted some numbers, is gonna be about 82 million. Um, however, all the infrastructure that we had to, to complete before we even started this um, is about 80 million as well. And in 2020, and 2021, we issued two bonds worth $142 million to help pay for this and a bunch of other improvements to um, solidify and um, kind of enhance our treatment capabilities for drinking water. Um, we got very favorable interest rates. Um, I wish I could get this, 1.8% for 20 years on 142 million. So we, we timed, we got lucky when we timed the market uh, on that one. Um, but we also sort of bonded for more than we thought we might need, um, or as much as we, kind of the outside edge of what we thought we would need. Um, so it was a good decision to maximize that opportunity. So the old Spiro treatment plant only treated Spiro tunnel and only removed um, the metals shown in green right there. It didn't take out thallium, zinc, cadmium or antimony, and it could only treat t about 3 million gallons a day. Um, the new Three Kings state-of-the-art facility will treat Spiro Tunnel and Judge Tunnel and Theriot Springs, and it will remove all the metals that we're concerned about, almost to, to trace levels. And it is capable of easily producing uh, 5,000 gallons a minute. So uh, 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 this is a significant improvement in Park City's water um, quality and in, in our infrastructure. Next. Um, a big part of why the consumption is going down is because we have a very robust co water conservation program. 
um, kind of some of our key programs. Um, one is our pricing structure. So the more water that's used, the more expensive it gets to the point where it's punitive. So if you have a big lawn and in a month you decide to use 50,000 gallons, you know, for that, for 20 of those 30,000 gallons, you're gonna be paying um, probably about five times what you're paying for the first five or 6,000 gallons. And that's just a way to send a customer a pricing signal um, to use less water and it's worked. Um, another thing we do is every meter, um, every connection is metered, and most meters have a radio on the meter that transmit all the usage data back to our database. And then we have a customer portal where customers can log on and see their usage, they can set alerts, budget, you know, they can say I only want to spend this much on water a month. And the other thing it does is if you have a toilet running, you'll get a text and say, hey, your toilet's running. Um, you know, we've had people call us when they're out of town and they're like, hey, my, I got a leak. And, you know, it turns out their kids were partying at their house or something. I mean, but, or they, they have a leak. It, it, it's a very powerful tool. And then we have a cash for grass program um, where we offer $3 uh, per square foot um, under certain conditions to remove turf and replace it with water efficient landscaping. And if you're interested in that program, you're gonna to talk to Susan Cordon right over here. She'll be the one answering the phone and visiting your house or business and helping you through that program. Next. Yep. Okay, next. Um, yeah, I kind of touched on most of this, but serving water in Park City is very expensive, um, mainly due to the mine tunnels and the water quality that's coming out of those and the requirement to treat them not only for drinking water, but stream water. The other is that we're at the top of the watershed. Unlike the Wasatch Front and Salt Lake, we don't have these big reservoirs that collect all the snow melt that we can live off all summer. We have to produce what we need on a daily basis because there's no upstream storage. Next. Next. Um, this is a cool picture. The two pictures on the right um, are the kind of the same picture, same angle, I guess, perspective. Uh, the one on the right was taken kind of in the fall, and the one uh, just of the big snowpack was in March of last year. So, you know, things like that, when your buildings get totally buried in snow, it makes it challenging. Go ahead. Um, we have complex water quality. Uh, I, talk, I, I touched on this a little bit next, touch on it a little bit more. Uh, and like every water system in the world, we have rusty pipes that fail, that require replacement, and it is extremely expensive to uh, replace that infrastructure. Next. Uh, we'll next. Um, so, yeah, I just kind of wanted to highlight what Mike said. The PFAS uh, is an emergency, emerging contaminant that we're actually seeing in our wells right now. And we've linked it back to Nordic ski wax, um, primarily Nordic ski wax. Um, and the, we're picking concentrations up in all three of our wells that are above the proposed maximum contaminant level proposed by the EPA. And so we're minimizing the use of those sources and blending those right now, but we're in the future, we're gonna have to do something about it. And like everyone, it's hard to find people that can afford to live here and pay them enough to, to stay. We, you know, we can't do our job without a, we have 34 full-time employees in this department um, and we need every single one of them to operate and it's getting harder and harder. So that's it. Yeah, that was, that was great. That's, uh, I like your water pricing, soak the rich. That's, <laughs> soak the rich. Uh, that's great. Diego, you're, are you want to plug into this thing? Here, all right. Yeah, that's a flash drive right there. Hey. Presentation. All right, terrific. Thank you. 
I know I had a water bill last year that was so big. I had a, a little teeny clay pond in my house. So I really got a water, water bill last year. We had a fish fry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Miles, for warming them up. Um, I thought Miles liked me up until I saw that I was in the coveted mid-afternoon on a Friday spot for Leadership 101. So thank you, Miles. Uh, afternoon, everyone. My name is Diego Zagara. I'm the Vice President of Equity and Impact at Park City Community Foundation, uh, Leadership Class 20. It's been 10 years. Can't believe it. I know, right? Um, I should have asked. There's no clicker by chance, is there? It's like, I'll stand right here. No way. All right, come on up, Frank Lynch. Let's give him a hand. All right, next slide. Sorry, on this computer. Oh, there you go. Thank you. Um, as I mentioned, I work with Park City Community Foundation. And um, at the Community Foundation, we have been tasked with uh, addressing our community's most pressing challenges. And the way we do that is by bringing different stakeholders to the table, whether it's government, elected officials, um, philanthropy and donors, the private sector, community members that are really close to the issues that we're trying to solve. Uh, that's how we work in this community. Some of you may know us as the owners of Live PC, Give PC, an annual fundraising day, uh, or through our nonprofit education roundtables and otherwise. But uh, this is our bread and butter, really, bringing community members together to address these big challenges. Um, one of those challenges is um, early childhood education and care. Um, it was in 2019 that some donors came, approached us and asked if we would be positioned to help address this community challenge that was only getting worse. And since then, it's, I would say it's gone from problem to national crisis. Um, up on the board, you, you'll see our, what I call our North Star, why we do this work. Um, and the Early Childhood Alliance was born out of that, those conversations back in 2019. Um, the Early Childhood Alliance, led by Kristen Schulz, their director, she's not here today actually because she's down at the legislature. Uh, it was Early Childhood Day on the Hill and she's been working trying to uh, advocate for these children. How do, we, how do we work at the Early Child uh, Alliance? I would say that the three key things that we do is our grant making. Last year, we made about a little over $450,000 in grants to different organizations, organizations you probably know, like PC Tots or Holy Cross Ministries, um, Dolly Parton's Imagination Library, providing books for kids zero to five, um, the Utah Diaper Bank, those are some of the grants and organizations that we partner with to increase services. Um, sometimes the grants take a form of childcare subsidies, and uh, that's one way in which we've been able to help direct dollars to <clears throat> nonprofits and organizations doing work in this space. Advocacy is another way. You may have heard over the last year about some government investments in this space. We're going to talk about them a little bit later. And then finally, as I mentioned, um, the community foundation exists to bring people together, to bring communities, uh, to bring community members together and help us address these big challenges over the coming year. So I'd say that those are the main three ways in which the Alliance has operated. And again, the Early Childhood Alliance is part, is an initiative of the community foundation. So why now, why is this happening now? Why is this so timely? Um, over the last few years, we've seen costs increase across every sector and more so within this sector. Uh, the burden on families and parents has increased exponentially and we felt compelled to do something. You may have heard about this again at a national level. Um, there is a statistic that I saw the other day I found very compelling, which, which is that 20 years ago, about 30% of households have both parents in the workforce. As of 2020, over 60% of households have both parents in the workforce. And that means you gotta make some decisions about where your child's gonna be during the day, and that carries costs. So in Summit County, we have about 400 babies being born each year. 
um, and there's nowhere nearly enough seats to take care of those kids. So families have to resolve, have to make some financial decisions. Either a parent has to stay at home and they can't go to work because it doesn't make financial sense anymore, given that childcare at times can run up to $2,000 a month or $24,000 a year, uh, or leave them with a neighbor or perhaps an unlicensed center, uh, an, um, friends. But there aren't enough high quality and affordable childcare centers in our community. So we are working on supporting organizations that are trying to provide more services in our community. And I would say that Kristen Schultz has been successful at doing that. Um, a few years ago, this Nobel Prize winning uh, researcher found the, core, the return on investment on early childhood education and there was a massive return on investing dollars earlier in a child's education career versus, let's say, in high school. Um, I think it was the Minnesota Federal Reserve Bank that found that, or Reserve Bank of Minnesota that found that the return was like $13 to one when invested in zero to three versus when invested in high school. So we know there's a meaningful economic argument to be made. Um, lately, we've seen more private sector organizations, the chamber being involved in this because we can, we can make the economic argument for why it makes sense to invest in early childhood education and care. The US, among, among developed countries, the US is one of the ones that invests the least amount of dollars per child when it comes to childcare. And um, we're seeing that the free market has now been able to step up and address the lack of services that exist. Without government support, we feel that there's no way we're gonna be able to dig ourselves out of this hole. And it's going to make it increasingly harder on families to be able to place their children in um, high quality childcare centers. Um, I want, this is an opportunity to celebrate for a moment because we see, one more time, thing. Um, last year, we saw, one more? One more. Um, we saw investments from local government, which is amazing and worth mentioning. So if you see, where are, do we have any electeds in the room? Okay. Thank you to our elected officials for allocating dollars to childcare subsidies. The city dedicated a million dollars for families um, primarily at 100% of AMI and below to be able to access these child care subsidies. The county allocated 280 with a distribution uh, of 150 for employees and 130 for community members, still to be determined how that's gonna happen. And this, this was a result of the advocacy that the Early Childhood Alliance led with Kristen Schulz. Um, I gotta give her a lot of credit because she reached out, invited families. There's a lot of people in this room actually that went and gave public comment in support of our local governments um, investing in this space. And to my knowledge, this is the first municipality in Utah that has invested money in childcare subsidies. So congratulations to our community. This was a one-time deal. As of right now, there's no sustainable long-term investment or promise that this, that this will continue to, to occur. So, um, we, we need help. We, we're looking at philanthropic measures, of course. We're looking at donors to invest in this space, and that's not enough. We are looking at federal and state, but frankly, it's not looking good at that level. We really rely on these local institutions, both the city and the county, to, to do something meaningful like they did in the last few months and make this investment in our community from an economic standpoint. And um, we're really hopeful that this can continue, this can um, happen again in the future. And there will be opportunities to advocate again for this, uh, but as of now, this is where we stand. Again, I don't wanna undermine the investment. I think it's a really meaningful investment by our local government. And I, I wonder what opportunities exist to move forward with more. Um, so with that, that was my best Kristen Schulz impersonation. Um, 
Frank, you did amazing, A plus, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, I, want, I would love to hear a question or two about childcare and, yes, hello, hi. What are the laws around in individual families providing childcare for friends? Uh, so there are, sure, there are licensed care centers that are home-based and they're amazing and there are unlicensed care home centers that are also amazing actually. Um, they are, I call them unlicensed and um, because they don't have a business license, but because of the need, the great need that exists, we see folks in apartment complex having to, complexes having to open their doors to their neighbors and operating, yes, without a license. So not the standards aren't necessarily there, but that is at times the position in, that we're putting these families in. Operating a business without a license, Margaret Plain? No go, right? Okay, no go. So technically, not legal. At the same time, incredibly necessary. And this is the gap that the market has left open and that we're having to fill in ways informal and otherwise, because families don't have any other routes. But no, I appreciate the question. Does that help? What are we doing to make it easier? Yes. So there have been conversations around uh, reducing business fees for anyone that's wanting to start a center. And I think the state gave it a go. And here's the catch. There's a ton of liability in taking care of children. It's kind of a thankless job and the returns are minimal. Marginal returns, it's not a money maker. So I think we ought to look at going beyond those incentives of just, okay, you don't have to pay a, a business license fee and we're gonna train you up and figure out what other economic incentives we can look at because just w baseline, there aren't a lot of incentives for folks who say, I wanna open a childcare center. And I think there are opportunities for us to look at that. Helen Nadel. how businesses and the chamber can step up. Yeah, um, Jennifer was here earlier, right? Morgan was here earlier, that's what I meant, thank you. Um, well, there are different ways in which the private sector can step up. We are seeing stipends from organizations to their employees. Uh, given the difficulty in hiring, we're finding that there is some success in using those as incentives. Um, we've heard of a case in Provo of a company, this is a whole different ballgame because it was Provo and I, I guess they could afford to buy a house and create their own childcare center for their employees. This is a large company, of course. Um, the other way is grants. The, the private sector has at times opportunities to drive philanthropic dollars and, or sponsorships to entities that are operating the childcare space and we've seen the chamber do some of that. Um, and then just raising awareness, recognizing that you know, we have um, some existential challenges ahead with Mayflower coming along and folks from Wasatch perhaps not finding as many incentives to drive all the way into town. I think many of us have heard that argument. And the question is, how can we shore up our workforce? And what we're hearing is that childcare might be one of those areas in which we can do a better job. Thanks, Helen. I recognize I stand between y'all y'all in a break. So if there are no more questions, Miles. Thanks, thanks, Diego. Thanks, Vanna. Appreciate that. Um, why don't we take a 10, 15 minute break at the most and uh, I'll ring the bell again. There's food out there, some more snacks. And uh, then we're gonna come back and finish off the afternoon with some pretty interesting stuff about what's happening in Park City proper and also on trails. Uh, do you want to do it? I can put this in. No, it's no, I know. This is um, remote if you want. Oh. If you want to do this, you can just... You can just, we turn on that mic then? So I, I don't think I can't so. Hold, hold. So this, see this little wheel? You just pull it back like that. Just real soft. Yeah, it's just a little roll. Do you want me to start? Are you going to do the bell again? Yeah, I mean... Okay.
Okay, we're, uh, we're coming to the uh, final things here today, and we call this the changing face of Park City. We talked a lot about regional issues. We talked about uh, everything here, but now you're gonna hear about what's going on in some of the major developments uh, in our community here in the Park City area. So I'll let Jen, you're gonna introduce everyone? And I'll stop reading the job. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Miles. Um, good afternoon. I know it's late in the afternoon. I hope that we can keep you awake for uh, a few more, few more minutes. Um, my name is Jen McGrath. I'm one of two deputy city managers in Park City. Um, I'm joined today by Rebecca Ward, who's our planning director, and Eric Danitz, who is our director of economic development and analytics. Today, we are going to talk to you about three planning efforts that are underway within the city. Eric's gonna start us off by talking about Main Street. Uh, then I will come back and chat with you about a couple efforts we have going on in the Bonanza neighborhood and Rebecca will bring it home by talking about the general plan. So Eric? <laughs> hey, we're done. Questions? <laughs> uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for your time. And as Jen mentioned, I'm gonna kick it off with respect to Main Street. So, um, at, a, at the recent council retreat in September of the previous calendar year, the council asked us to investigate the possibility of a Main Street area plan. You may have seen some other headlines associated with Main Street, water line breaks, things of this nature. So it was sort of a catalyzing opportunity to revisit conversations that have happened over many years. So what I said at the time and I would repeat today is there's some things you have to do and then there's some things you can do. So the have to do is the infrastructure on Main Street that needs to be uplifted, it needs to be maintained. But at the same time, when we're making big changes in our key commercial core, there's also an additional opportunity to investigate other improvements. So that is the opportunity that the council has tasked us with, and that's the opportunity we'll be chatting with you about today. Before I get deep into the process of the Main Street Area Plan, I wanted to give you some insights about current conditions associated with Main Street and the Main Street economy. So since COVID, the visitation to our Main Street core has been going down. There was a huge bump, of course, during the COVID pandemic, especially in 2021, and in particular in the shoulder season. So the winter was actually strong right up until the resort shut down. And then there was a lot of quiet, maybe for about six weeks. And there was then actually a flood of people into Park City. So the visitation to Main Street during that period was significant and, and outsized for the shoulder season. However, it's concerning when you have conditions post COVID, when visitation to the street kind of continues to decline year over year, that doesn't exactly mean that revenues have tracked the same pattern. So one of the things to keep in mind is that because inflation was running hot over that period, Main Street businesses were actually able to price up their customers and use that kind of differential experience that they provide to increase the dollars per transaction. So despite the fact that visitation has been declining, revenue has been relatively flat and stable. However, now that inflation is decreasing and also kind of, I mean, still high relative to recent history, but a lot lower since 2021. That kind of lays the groundwork for some concerns. So if you have declining visitation, flattening top line revenue, that eventually leads to lower profitability. In addition to that, there are developments happening like you've probably heard about today on our, in, in our core and also on the periphery of the city that are designed to pull that high dollar visitor away from Park City. And so those are some of the questions that have arisen internally and also with our Main Street businesses. To give you a few more insights about Main Street, the number one customer of Main Street in the winter months, the, the winter months make the year, but the shoulder seasons have also helped improve conditions. So if we look at this recent December, the number one visitor is from California. Next up, you're talking Wasatch Front, and then you have your like Florida, Texas, New York. So California, Florida, Texas, New York are the core customers of Main Street and the Wasatch Front. Park City itself and Snyderville Basin, if you combine those two, that's 8% of the visitors. So 92% of Main Street's business is not coming from Western Summit County. The next thing to be 
The next thing I wanted to offer, this is just some additional information that I think has helped illuminate conditions for Main Street businesses, is once people are in the city, what are the key locations that they go to and leave to after they visit Main Street? So th this is the virtuous cycle that a lot of the other assets in the city create for Main Street. So Deer Valley is the number one. Park City Mountain Base is number two. It kind of makes sense. Like the two big ski areas, they drive a significant volume into the city. People leave from them, go to Maine, and then go out, etc. Salt Lake City comes up big on there. And then mostly assets in Park City's entryway. So it's the visitor that they come, they, they, they come down from the hotel, they recirculate to Maine, they go back to the hotel. And that, that is the sort of symbiotic nature that the resort bases play with the Main Street core. So moving back to the Main Street area plan itself, we heard a few values expressed from the council in, in their September retreat. And a lot of it is like, number one, this is an irreplaceable asset. So you have to preserve the character of the historic core. That's number one. But we also want to develop other opportunities for business improvement and also potentially to keep the, that virtuous cycle going, recirculate dollars through the core, have those dollars touch more hands. And so we believe that we can do that. And also if we're willing to accept certain changes, we can also improve the quality of life for residents. Um, that sounds like a win-win that's impossible, but I actually do believe it's possible. And I'll talk how you, how, about how you likely achieve something like that. And then also we wanna stabilize access and enhance the economic vibrancy in Park City's commercial core. So how to go about that? Through a lot of internal research, coaching from people who have a long legacy in Park City and who took some time advising me, we looked at the 1998 Downtown Action Plan. And this is a plan that really did pave the way for the improvements that you see on Main Street today. It was, pre, it was preceding an Olympic, an Olympic bid or during an Olympic bid, you could say. And it was run by a relatively small group of people that had a high interest in stakeholding in, in Main Street. So at the time, constituents of this group were people from the Planning Commission, actual city council members, um, people representing the historic district, and then a lot of city staff. So looking at that model and how successful it was, we thought that may be a possibility for the future. We've learned some lessons from area plans that Jen and Rebecca are going to talk about. And those, those methods for those plans, I believe are appropriate and valid. But we also have an opportunity to maybe do something a little more iterative and rapid. So we recommended to the council to let the, let a, the community be participants in the advisory committee but also have it be kind of like a staff run method. So again, looking back to the previous model, it's almost a copy paste, but we, will, we haven't formed the committee yet, but we will invite members from these key groups and also have residents and staff members. The areas of focus that we would like to emphasize, these are the big bullets. So I mentioned utilities. We'll revisit the land management code, but I don't think any material changes will likely be recommended. Because again, the overarching, one of the overarching values is to pres preserve the historic character, economic enhancement. And then if we want to do anything, we have to address the impacts of traffic. So in more detail, these are probably the key questions that the committee will investigate. If I had to pick one out, or I'll pick two out that are likely to be the biggest points of con conversation and controversy. It would be economic enhancement opportunities associated with Sweet Alley and the idea or possibility of pedestrianization of Main Street. So when I speak about the redevelopment of Sweet Alley, what I'm actually talking about is the fact that Park City Municipal owns a significant amount of land area in the historic core. That has always been envisioned as a parking asset and that has certainly produced value for the businesses over time. Having said that, there's also changes that have occurred in the global economy since those assets were built. And now those parcels are worth $50 million an acre unimproved. So that is an opportunity to unlock a lot of additional economic value if the businesses and if the community so chose. It's not gonna be an idea that gets mandated by a staff member, 
But if there's an interest and a willingness to evolve those assets, there is a significant asymmetric opportunity to do so. And I believe that you can add a lot of demand base to Main Street while also preserving, again, that historic character. Okay, so then number two, pedestrianization is an idea that has been under investigation in every one of these plans since they've all happened. So we will just revisit that as a part of due diligence and see if there's an appetite for that among the businesses and among the residents. I think it can create a quality of experience that is beneficial to the businesses and retain people on that street longer, but we'll see what the, what the perspective is and that'll be one of the other big questions. So when we invite the members of the committee to the advisory group, the major, th the major theme that I will communicate to them is that you are here to support the efforts of the group. That means that we're acting in good faith. You're representing your, your own, your own uh, member, membership within whatever it is, HPCA Lodging Association. You're serving as a conduit to that association communicating efficiently with them and communicating efficiently with us and relaying the information as accurately as possible. Having said that, the staff members will be available to all of these people all the time to help communicate and provide information and data. So it's not like just because someone is representing their group, we won't talk to them. That's not the case. And then the last thing is once we arrive at a recommendation for the council, we also expect these individuals to support the implementation of those recommendations. When we brought the question to the council about the area boundaries, I intentionally included the Park Avenue as an option for investigation. They gave us the answer that Park Avenue is largely a residential street. This is focused more about on our commercial core, so that is not part of the plan. So the future area for the plan will cut off that long leg, just to be clear. And the last thing I'll say is that this work is also being done in the context of, again, these two of, of a lot of other area plans and initiatives that the council has already set in motion. So, so we will take that context into account. And the main, main manifestation of how these things interact together is, again, through transportation and traffic. So I know you've been through a transportation and traffic conversation. I won't repeat all of that to you now. And I think I'll hand it off to Jen. Thanks, Eric. Um, okay, so we are going to transition now from Main Street to um, another very important area in our community, the Bonanza Park neighborhood. As many of you already know, we have two efforts currently happening in this area. Um, and um, I'm gonna talk about both of them. So you can go to the next slide. Um, we have a consultant team on board. It's being led by uh, MKSK. They come to us from multiple states across the country. Um, we also have Farron Pierce, who's doing transportation work for us, Future IQ, who is helping with public and stakeholder engagement, and development strategies, whose emphasis is on economic and market analysis. So this is, um, the, these are the study areas for both of those efforts. So the orange outline is the 200 acres of the neighborhood. Um, it's, it's, an, it's an area of town where we know there is going to be redevelopment happening in the near future. And I can't emphasize enough how important the work that's being done for the small area plan is relative to that fact. The work that we do as part of this plan, um, the regulatory environment that we set up, the decisions that we make regarding connectivity, those things will be applied to the entire 200 acres, including the city's five acre site. But um, so, so that work is really critically important. And today we have a mix of uses in this neighborhood. We have commercial, we have residential, but we also have light industrial uses. Um, another thing we have a lot of here is uh, surface parking. There's a lot of surface parking lots you can see here. And you have a roadway network that was de designed around historic rail lines. What this means is, and any of you who've spent any time in this neighborhood know this, connectivity is a challenge here. Um, it's a challenge if you're using your two feet. It's a challenge if you're on a bicycle. It's a challenge if you're riding a bus. And it's a challenge if you're in a car. 
Um, and then you can see uh, within the 200 acres, you can see the dash line shows the city's own five acre site. We're doing a feasibility study on that as well. Um, and that is at a really prominent corner within our community of Kearns and Bonanza. So throughout this process, we, um, we've done a lot of engagement. <laughs> um, we have, we've done um, media posts um, on social media. We have sent postcards. We've hung up flyers. We've done email blasts. We've had community meetings. Um, We've done surveys, so we really have done a lot to try to reach as many people as possible throughout the process. Um, some additional examples of the engagement that we've done, and I'm gonna look at some notes here because these numbers I think are really impressive. So we have done um, two community meetings so far. Um, we've done four surveys, two for the small area plan, two for the five acre site feasibility study. Um, and collectively, we saw almost 400 people at the in-person meetings, and we collected and analyzed responses from almost 2,200 surveys. So kudos to this community for being incredibly engaged and helping provide feedback through this process, and we're going to continue to ask you for that feedback and hope that you'll provide it. Um, through this process, we've had two advisory groups, um, one specific to the five acre site feasibility study process and one specific to the small area plan process. We've met with these groups both um, a number of times and we actually, we will continue to meet with them. We have um, a meeting set up with the small area plan advisory committee next week. Um, and as we progress on the feasibility site work, we will meet with that group as well. So um, this is the draft vision for Bonanza Park. You can see that um, we really tried to focus on joining what is this neighborhood today with sort of this aspirational future for the neighborhood. Um, the team also worked to identify project goals and you can see those listed here. I won't, I won't go through each of them individually, um, but this was culmination of the work that was done um, and the engagement and the, the feedback that we got from the community. Um, connectivity is a critically important issue, specifically in this neighborhood and specifically as part of the small area planning process. Again, I mentioned how important the work that we're doing in the small area plan is, um, and this is a critically important component. And what we heard loud and clear from the community is we want a well-connected neighborhood, and we want the focus and the priority to be on people who are walking and biking and taking transit, and we wanna deprioritize the car in this neighborhood. Now, that doesn't mean we wanna eliminate cars, um, but it, it means we wanna prioritize people who are making those different choices and who are helping us not contribute to the congestion that we see in our community. So for the five acre site, um, the work the team provided um, really focused on some examples of different development scenarios. And we wanted to show how different uses um, drive outcomes, specifically related to if you, if you have a lot of uses that have um, high market value, um, you're able to contribute in a different way to financial feasibility of a project. However, that has trade-offs. Um, if you focus more on community benefits and the kinds of things we heard from the community that the community wants, um, so that also has an impact on the financial viability of a project. And the point of these exercises was really to help us gauge um, the community's tolerance for these different approaches to building and presenting a financially viable option for this site. So um, just want to share a little bit of the key findings with each of you. We're going to go through the key findings starting in the phase one of the project for each of the studies and then move on to phase two. So I won't read all of them, but I do want to highlight a couple of them for you. Um, we heard loud and clear, Bonanza Park is a neighborhood for locals. Um, this is a place where locals live, where they work, where they want to spend time and critically important for people that we do everything we can to preserve that local feel 
and the opportunity for people to continue to live and be active in this neighborhood in a way that is accessible to everyone. Um, we heard a lot from people about how important it is for us to have spaces to be together that are outside. Now that's, it can be green spaces, it can be parks, but also plaza areas, um, places you can listen to music, um, a place where you can go and sit and have uh, coffee with your friend or read a book. Um, that was something that we heard from people they wanna see woven throughout the neighborhood. Um, we also heard that uh, Bonanza Park is the right place for um, building height and density, but in that same process we heard that there's some trepidation about what that means and what that looks like and wanting to understand more about the look and the feel and the design if we are gonna have an increased density and increased heights there. Um, the other thing that I wanted to point out because you'll see this on the next slide too is there was a real understanding from the community that the city's five acre site can't solve all of the community's desires and needs, that they have to work together um, symbiotically for us to be able to achieve our goals. Um, phase one, a key findings for the feasibility site, you're gonna see a lot of things that are consistent um, in both of these. Um, this is a place where people wanna see mixed use development. Um, people told us that they wanna see arts and cultural elements, not just on the five acre site, but actually woven throughout um, the neighborhood and the community. Um, we did hear from a lot of people that a permanent home for the Kimball Art Center was something that people wanted us to look at and prioritize. And again, um, looking at things like making open space and outdoor community spaces a key component of anything that the city does in this area. The other thing I wanna point out here that I think is really important that we heard over and over again is Park Heights are ready for action. People are ready to see this site developed. There have been previous planning efforts on this site. There was sort of a pause during COVID. People are ready for us to do something here, and that's exciting. So these are the key engagement findings from the second phase of our engagement, and you're gonna see a lot of common themes here. This is really just distilling down what we heard um, originally and through the second part of the process. Um, so for the small area plan, again, additional density is supported. Um, park I expect to trade off those things with community benefits. Um, we didn't hear from anybody, hey, build all the tall buildings. Um, we're fine with that. What we heard is we're open to the idea of additional height and density. If the trade off for that are community benefits and the inclusion of things that we've said that we want to have in this neighborhood. Um, again, prioritizing connectivity particularly for pedestrians and bicyclists. And then again, this idea that this is a place for locals, we wanna maintain that local feel. We want it to be a place that locals feel like they can still afford to live, they can afford to go out to eat, they can go with their friends and hang out there. And we heard a lot from people, you know, we want a place for our kids to be able to meet up with their friends um, and have activities in a way that we feel safe. Um, and for the five acre site, again, very similar themes. Again, I, this gives me actually a lot of confidence. When you hear the same thing over and over again, you start to feel like you might be getting it right. And so that's a good sign. Again, uh, a permanent home for the arts community. We did hear specifically about a desire for Kimball Arts Center to be on the site in the neighborhood somewhere in town. But we also heard the importance of art and cultural elements woven throughout the site and throughout the neighborhood, that this is an important part of our local culture and people really want to celebrate that. Um, the second thing is probably not surprising. This, this really makes us human here. We sort of want all of the things, but we don't necessarily want to pay for them all. We're not sure how we want to pay for them all. So um, that's it's probably one of the biggest challenges that our team has is to try to find that balance between all of the desires of the community to have those uses that they want so much with their desire to be prudent about the way that we spend our money. Um, and again, sort of mixed use, affordable, transit ready and supportive, um, very community focused ideas. Okay. So in terms of next steps, um, we are entering into or are in our third and final phase of this work. 
Um, we will be developing a recommended land use and transportation strategy for the entire neighborhood. Again, critically important. The city is not going to uh, be special with our own property. We will apply the same rules and regulations um, and ideals to the five acre site that we do to the entire neighborhood. So moving that forward is really important for us. Um, we will, per council's direction, develop um, an outline for either a request for proposals or request for qualifications for the five acre site. The point of that, trying to move us closer to uh, actually getting a shovel in the dirt on this property, hopefully sometime in the reasonably near future. Um, we still have upcoming meetings with our advisory committees and um, then we will be sharing final details and materials um, at both a community meeting and then also at a final council meeting. Um, that's all I've got on those two efforts. I'm gonna hand it over to Rebecca to tell you about the general plan. Great, uh, thank you, Jen, and thanks for the opportunity to be here this afternoon. Uh, looking across the room, I see a lot of familiar faces of um, that you've come to the community meetings, you've been engaged in these planning processes, you've participated in the surveys and provided input, um, and we really appreciate that. And there will be many more opportunities to continue to do that as we undertake the comprehensive update to the, the general plan. And just out of curiosity, because we have such an engaged room, um, has anyone read the 2014 Park City General Plan? I, hands, yes, <laughs> great. So, and if you haven't, that's okay. It's 370 pages. Um, there's two volumes, there's a lot to it, but I would encourage you to go to parkcity.org and download this document. Um, there are some really incredible goals and visions and priorities that were established by the community. Um, and it's exciting to see how those things have been implemented over the last decade and how they've helped shape the community that we have now. Um, so who is the general plan for? It's for us as a community, it's for our stakeholders, uh, business owners, uh, residents. It's, um, it helps us envision the future built environment and the infrastructure planning and transportation planning and ways that, that we can really look ahead and um, envision what this community will and could look like in 2034, 2044, 2054. So um, the general plan right now breaks the, the community into 10 different neighborhoods. And what we'll be doing is starting the comprehensive update to the general plan at the neighborhood level uh, and engaging the, the neighborhoods and then moving out to the community at large. So um, in 1884, when Park City was founded, the boundary of Park City was really small. It was old town and parts of Prospector and Bonanza Park. But the population exceeded the population that we have now, even though we've continued to expand and grow. Park City used to be a dense, vibrant community with people. And over the decades, that's become a community where um, in some ways we've prioritized cars. As uh, Jen mentioned, Bonanza Park is primarily surface parking lots. If you've tried to go north and south, you know that journey includes going through those parking lots, whether you're on foot or on car. Um, in cars, I guess, <laughs> rather than on them is probably safer. Um, but in, in the 1970s, as Park City really started to annex um, properties and to grow and expand, uh, and the city transformed from mining to skiing to the Olympics to where we are now, uh, there have been a couple of visioning um, initiatives and plans. We had a general plan in 1985, 1997, here we are at 2014, and then looking ahead uh, this year to prioritize that. So in 2014, when the community was going through the general plan process, that followed a 2009 community visioning um, process where the community identified the four values uh, that really shaped the 2014 general plan. And that's a small town, um, sense of community, natural setting, and historic uh, preservation, historic character. So with this small town, some of the principles that 
uh, that the plan establishes is this idea of protecting undeveloped lands and creating this buffer of open space around Park City and leading, um, guiding infill into already established neighborhoods uh, like we're seeing with the Bonanza Park neighborhood. Um, and we've seen this implemented as voters approved the $25 million bond for the uh, purchase of the 1,500 acres in Bonanza Flat, the $48 million bond for the 125 acres of Treasure Hill, and then th this small town um, value, the implementation strategies, encourage the city to look at the annexation expansion area, how the city wants to continue to grow. And um, that led to the annexation of 1,200 acres at the Southeast Quinns Junction area. And that was brought in as recreation open space to help build that, uh, that buffer around town. With the sense of community, Jason Glidden talked about this earlier, that in 2016, the city council established this goal to keep 15% of the workforce here in town and to build 800 affordable units. And he also talked about some of the code changes that have been put into place to help incentivize that development so that um, the sense of community that Park City can be a place where people of all incomes um, can live. The natural setting, um, this is really guiding the sustainability goals and also the protection of sensitive lands like steep slopes and wetlands um, and shaping our development, clustering it in areas where it makes sense. And then historic character, as uh, Eric mentioned, the goals of the general plan is to really preserve Old Town as the heart of Park City uh, for locals and tourists both. Um, so the general plan gives us these really big ideas, but it's it's not until we actually go through land management code amendments and implement these ideas that they start to uh, shape the community. And some of those um, <coughs> that have been enacted, I mentioned the, the code amendments to incentivize affordable housing. We also have um, amendments that have helped protect the historic character like uh, vertical zoning guiding really active uses like restaurants and, and bars and retail to the ground level and um, having residential and office uses in the upper levels. Also, um, as Eric mentioned, helping achieve a balance of businesses on Main Street and establishing a cap for conventional chain businesses to allow local businesses to continue. Um, so, since 2014, a lot has changed. Um, and the city went through the Vision 2020 process to um, initiate these conversations and will continue to initiate these conversations as we go into the general plan. The outcome of Vision 2020 um, was really to embrace bold action. And uh, what that meant through this study is that we have 8,500 people um, in our community, but we have millions and millions and millions of visitors every year. So creating um, a balance, um, making sure that there's housing for uh, many different incomes, really uh, being creative in imagining what's possible with our transportation network and um, improving free transit connectivity, our bike and pedestrian uh, network. And then to continue to protect our open space and our historic districts. So what's next? Um, as I've mentioned, we've seen that a lot of change over the last decade. And one of those changes is the Quinn's Junction neighborhood. As I mentioned, there's the 1,200 acres that was recently brought into the city. That's our eastern entry corridor now. We have McPullen Barn to the north. We have Bonanza Flat to the, to the south. And now we have this new entry corridor into our, our community. And there have been many changes in this neighborhood just in the last few years. One of those is the film studio, which was, um, it was approved, invested for transient uses. But over the last few years, that has been modified and changed and approved as a, as a new mixed use district where there will be uh, new housing units, new commercial and retail uses uh, where it's creating 
kind of a new core, a new neighborhood. And part of that project incorporates um, 185 affordable units and it provides connections to um, the rail trail and to transit. We also see in the Quinns Junction neighborhood um, the partnership with Deer Valley and the city to imagine um, where an intercept lot uh, could go to help uh, improve the, the transit connections into town uh, on our free transit system instead of in single occupancy vehicles. Um, we also have uh, the Deer Valley Snow Park and Park City Mountain Resorts uh, redevelopment of parking lots that we will see in the coming years. Um, and then we have that infill in town, imagining what that's going to look like and how to shape that through neighborhood plans like the Bonanza Park neighborhood plan. Um, and then all of this in the context of this extraordinary regional growth that's happening all around us that Eric talked about, that um, we, we have our little community, we have 8,500 uh, people living here, we've created this open space buffer around the community, but there is this extraordinary growth um, that provides a lot of opportunities and provides a lot of challenges. And it's um, an exciting and important time to really envision what that's going to look like and how people come into the community and how we get from point A to point B. Um, so we also, the 2034 Olympics, uh, it's not just envisioning what will look like then, but uh, in the decades beyond. So this is a really exciting opportunity. And um, I, as I mentioned, really appreciate seeing a lot of familiar faces of those who have taken time to come and engage and participate. And I, I encourage you to please continue to do that. Help us spread the word, help us get the community involved and engaged, not just in the general plan, but also as we move forward with the Bonanza Park small area plan, the feasibility study, um, and also the Main Street area plan. So thank you. Uh, Miles is saying we have time for a few questions. I haven't gone into the daily data associated with that quarter of Jan 23, but um, I was actually looking at some traffic data earlier today with Sarah and um, Andrew Latham. And one of the things that we are seeing is that number one, when the holidays fall is highly influential on where that volume gets booked, if you will. Um, so this year, the holidays fell such that a lot of national school districts were not in session. And I don't know if that was a policy decision by those like California and Florida school districts. I, don't, I can't comment on that. But we saw that impressions in Deer Valley on the Marsac Circle, for example, which also feeds Maine, were highly loaded on California, Florida, and Texas. And they, that came a week after New Year's. So the, the New Year's holiday was actually lower than the week after. And so I, I don't have a strong explanation for you, but part of it is an, the effect of noise, calendaring and where holidays and weekends fall and what's going on with people's kids. That's, that's our hypothesis, I guess I could say. More than that, I don't have a strong opinion. Um, other, and then the last two comments I guess I would offer is like in the two recent January since Sundance returned to an in-person festival, that first weekend of Sundance is significantly higher, of course, than the previous um, two years associated with COVID. Right, yeah. So I'm speaking about 23 and 24, yeah. 
Uh, my question is also for Eric uh, about maintaining pedestrian evasion. Uh, I, I feel like I've heard before, kind of what you said in your presentation about, it seems like pedestrian evasion is a conversation that has always been there. And uh, I'm curious kind of what your take on is on where it is now and kind of what hasn't changed over the past while. Like, believe it or not, it's still just a lot of cars on Main Street. And so where, where that conversation is now, maybe where it's going. Yeah, so Matt, Matt is asking about some of the historical context of, of the concept around Main Street pedestrianization, and then maybe some of the current market pulse. Is that fair to say? Like, what is the current conversation? So I would say that I can't offer knowledge going back to 1998, because I was in school with you. But um, <laughs> the, the story, uh, I'm, I'm relaying some of what I've been told by my elders, and then I'll also just say what the current conversations on the street are today, okay? So number one, the, there's, a, there's a volatility when you introduce a massive infrastructure uplift to the most prominent street in the city, and all roadway projects have a tendency to put some businesses out of business. Like that is an unfortunate reality of massive infrastructure uplifts and, and the volatility associated with it. I think that that's always been a present a fear in the minds of the merchants. I, don't, I can't speak for all of them, but if I was a merchant, I would be afraid of what is that gonna do to my quarter when it's under construction and what can the city do to help me mitigate that? There may be ways where the city can supplement businesses in terms of marketing and things like that. And I can talk about that more later. But to get to the current day, I would say the phrase pedestrianization calls, into, calls the image of just only a pedestrian mall into mind. And I think that two things have developed. We've seen other cities implement something that is between everything dedicated to vehicle parallel parking and pedestrian friendly. So there are implementations where you imagine instead of it just being pet only, it's one lane of vehicle traffic flow. The roadway is elevated such that there's no abrupt curbing. Parking is not permitted per se, but vehicle traffic is. And that there's also a significant amount of green space and, and um, pedestrian friendly space and activities to engage with. So that's an intermediate step between today and full pedestrianization. One of the challenges also with Main Street is the angle of the slope. So it's inappropriate to build a solution that prevents certain people from using it. So there has to be, I, I just can't see that you could shut it down completely. There has to be some mechanism for getting people up and down that street who may not otherwise be able to walk it. So the last answer to your question is, Again, we'll find out more when we start the committee, but from the merchants on Main Street and some of which have a significant and lengthy uh, stakeholding in the street, I have never heard as much appetite for entertaining the possibility of this change as I have heard in the last like six months. So I, I'm just, you know, that's my read on the, on the current vibe of the, the market right now. We'll see what we come up with. I, uh, we'll have to figure out how to deal with deliveries. That's always been a pushback. Right. Thank you. <laughs> Nora, are you here? Where is she? No? Mountain Trails? Come on, young lady. You're on. You're on. You look like a deer in the headlights. <laughs> oh. Well, we want to hear uh, about one of my favorite uh, organizations, Mountain Trails, because I think trails and open space have helped make this community, along with its uh, skiing heritage and historic preservation. So, um, Laura's been doing this for a long time, and I've been using those trails for a long time. So let's see. Do you want to 
stay there and yeah. do this or yeah this this might work better you guys yeah, can hear me you can push this to move it forward all right all right you got it lady well it looks like you guys have all been here for a long time i'm wondering how many in the audience would like to stand up and go through a visualization with me for just a moment let's stand up <laughs> Okay, uh, I would like you all to sit for just, or stand for just a moment and imagine Park City without trails. Fenced, gated, keys thrown away forever. 30 years ago, that could have been what, was, what would have happened in Park City, but there were some land trusts and also um, a group of visionaries who decided that maybe uh, trails and open space would be a better idea. So Mountain Trails was founded in 1993. We are a nonprofit. Uh, what does that mean? So to be a nonprofit means you are held to a pretty high degree of uh, accountability, but also it means that you can leverage private donations and grant funding for public benefit. Community partners are what make trails possible in this town. Uh, we have trails organizations all over the West who are looking at mountain trails uh, as a model of how things can work in their communities. Mountain Trails works with local government. We uh, advise on policy, we help to identify opportunities and problem spots or just by lending a hand. We also have a five-year contract with, uh, for backcountry trail maintenance with Park City Municipal. Uh, Mountain Trails is not an enforcement or regulatory or organization. Uh, we leave that to the pros and government. We do work with local land trusts, like I mentioned, uh, to build and maintain trails and also uh, protect, protect conservation values. A lot of these uh, open spaces have conservation for uh, the land and the animals and the, you know, the forest, uh, the flora and fauna. So. Um, a good, a good uh, example of how Mountain Trails was helping to uh, preserve conservation values was up in the Bonanza Flat open space, uh, where we helped to decommission a bunch of social trails that were out there. Um, they were going through wetlands and birthing grounds, and so Mountain Trails uh, helped uh, to decommission trails, and we put trails where we wanted people to keep them out of the places we didn't want them. Uh, Mount Trails works with Deer Valley and Park City Mountain, and I just wanted to put a plug in for the resorts. Let's not ever forget that it is because of the um, access we have to that private land that we have the free, open, public trail system that we have. Uh, Mountain Trails uh, does a lot of uh, fundraising to for the benefit of public trails. Uh, we are the Epic Promise um, uh, community partner here in Park City in every town in which there is a Vail Resorts, there's also a community partner. Mountain Trails is that partner here in Park City. And the funding uh, from the Epic Promise uh, Fund flows through Mountain Trails um, into other tra uh, trails organizations throughout the Wasatch Back. So South Summit Trails Foundation and Wasatch Trails Foundation benefit from this funding. Um, it was kind of seen as a... Uh, uh, a greater benefit, a benefit to the greater community of the Wasatch Back. I'm, I'm sure that many um, conversations today were had about, we're not just Park City and Heber Valley anymore, we're kind of all one, the Wasatch Back. So we've started to focus a little bit more funding uh, toward trails in those areas. We do work with the Utah Division of Outdoor Recreation. Um, they are a major funding source for us through grants. Um, for example, one of uh, the most recent grants we have is a, is a restoration grant for a bunch of the trails that are um, just up out of the uh, first time parking lot. Uh, if you were to stand in the parking lot and kind of make a V with your hands, it's all the trails within that space. <laughs> um, they're all getting revamped and uh, that's, a, it, that's an area of very heavy use. So we saw fit to put a lot of uh, maintenance money into that. We also, uh, will be this coming spring, Mountain Trails will use a $225,000 WRAP grant, a WRAP recreation grant from Summit County uh, to improve the soft surface and double track in Round Valley. Uh, last year's spring runoff really did a number on those trails. So um, 
it's going to be a you know pretty hefty job to get those back into good shape. Uh, they are really important for the Nordic uh, grooming in the wintertime in Round Valley. And of course, there's our favorite Live PC, Give PC, biggest fundraiser um, of the year for mountain trails. So uh, I think that everybody would probably agree that Park City's way of life is closely tied to ta the trails uh, in the summertime. Everywhere you look um, in advertising, lifestyle and publications, uh, real estate brochures, and you know even across government and and commerce, we see trails are highlighted. So we know that they're a really important part of our community. They're also an economic driver. So there are folks in this room who could speak much more eloquently than I can on this topic, but uh, suffice to say that uh, Park City's summer economy has inched up uh, closer to the, um, to the winter economy. So we are becoming a more well-rounded year-round community. Park City's trail system is special for many reasons. It was first off the, the world's first ever gold level ride center. So the International Mountain Bike Association has a designation. We were the first ones ever to receive it. And you might wonder, you know, what, what does it take? It, it takes a lot to, to get that designation. And uh, Park City's really got, got its act together when we talk about, you know, a world-class uh, ride center. Uh, the first thing that makes Park City's trail system so uh, unique is that it's mostly on private land, which again, we can thank the resorts and also Park City Municipal um, for allowing access to that land. Um, and there is consensus above the, uh, among the private landowners that, um, that trails are important and access to open space is important for our community um, and for the economy. Park City's trails are uniquely non-motorized. If you go to many other resort towns, um, you'll find that, that they have great trails, but they're also shared with motorcycles. Um, we don't find that that's the greatest mix. Here in Park City, we've been able to maintain a non-motorized trail system. Also, the train is friendly and varied from high alpine to high desert. Um, Park City's train allows for year-round access. And with all these unique qualities, it's a very popular trail system. So um, the way we manage trail user um, experience and behavior is by building uh, directional trails, for example, like the one you see here. Uh, this is a uh, Porky Climb, actually that's a Downward Dog Trail in Round Valley, and it is directional. And you can see our friend here who's on the adaptive cycle that we are starting to build uh, more and more trails with with an eye toward being adaptive friendly. Uh, so it just so happens that every uh, neighborhood in Park City has immediate access to trails. That's a very unique uh, designation that we have here in Park City. Um, Mountain Trails focuses a lot of its work within city limits. Um, our jurisdiction, so to say, is from roughly the White Barn out to Bonanza Flat, we do Round Valley, Lost Prospector, Gamble Oak in the Airy, and all of, this, uh, all of the trails on Park City Mountain, many of the trails on Deer Valley, we do not manage the tidal wave, the big, big flow trails, tidal wave, under, undertow, uh, tsunami, those, those are all managed by uh, Deer Valley's pros. And we have about 200 miles of trails within our responsibility. Here we've got some uh, building of trails. Again, like I mentioned earlier in Bonanza Flat, you can see the center here is, uh, we're building a bridge here to keep people out of the, out of the wetland area. Um, that's up in Bonanza Flat. Um, when we build trails, we have a really, we're looking for a very specific use. So is it going to be directional? Is it going to be user specific? So is it hike only or bike only? Is it an up trail or a down trail? So there's a lot of thought that goes into the type of trail we're building, and also where we're building it. Uh, maintenance is a huge job in mountain trails. We uh, do, here on the left, we've got uh, one of our crew members doing blowdown removal. So every spring, we kind of chase the snow up the mountain, clearing the blowdowns. The center here is actually uh, showing tread work. Trails do have a lifespan, and when they start to wear out, we have to re 
you know, reconsider like where is that that alignment going to go and how are we going to protect it here we've got you know a down this is on a downhill flow trail and we've armored this trail so that it's um, going to hold up over the years and then here is the uh, looks like Derek given the uh, last prospector trails a haircut there are many hundreds of miles of trails that need need trimming back every year and that doesn't just happen in the in the middle of the night by nobody it's our, actually our team that gets out there so mountain trails also grooms 50 kilometers, around 50 kilometers of Nordic track. Um, we have about 25 miles of groomed single track as well. Uh, Round Valley, Clark Ranch, uh, Bonanza Flat are kind of the main areas. Um, this happens, I want to give a special shout out to the Trails and Open Space Department at Park City Municipal. They make this happen. They fund mountain trails. Um, we, have a, we have a budget with them that helps us get our people out on the groomers. This groomer is uh, the new baby that was recently purchased by the city with a, uh, in part from a, uh, a grant from the Division of Outdoor Recreation. We've got, it's like our Mountain Trails A team there up in Bonanza Flat. <laughs> uh, Mountain Trails also buys a lot of its own grooming equipment. You'll see this. Uh, we've got the rail trail here in the upper right and then some Round Valley uh, footage. Um, some of the equipment that we run and, and you know buy on our own with donations and maintain. Uh, so Mountain Trails grooms every day. Like I said, we've got Bonanza Flat, Round Valley, Clark Ranch, and the In-Town Rail Trail. Uh, here's a before and after. Uh, it's it's uh, this is what it looks like before they get out, and then on the right is a perfectly usable trail. Uh, so in cooperation with Park City Municipal on their property, Mountain Trails is responsible for the upkeep of the trails, uh, tra trail signage and trail heads. Uh, we also manage uh, hundreds, <laughs> many hundreds of signs out on the mountain. So Park City Mountain and Deer Valley, uh, we've got a bunch of Carsonite signs uh, that are, you know, wayfinding uh, tools that have to uh, be, be placed in every spring and they come out every every uh, fall before uh, the, winter, the winter operations start at the uh, resorts. <clears throat> uh, Mount, Mountain Trails also produces an annual map, which again is sponsored by Park City Municipal and also by the Chamber and Visitors Bureau. Um, it kind of helps people get around. I will mention that on the way out, you guys can grab a map set. We have a duo map set for the summer and then um, one winter map. So if you'd like a map, we've put them out there for you on the tables outside. Mountain Trails has several community engagement programs. We have an ambassador program. We have uh, regular dig days. And we also have an Adopt-A-Trail sponsorship program that is 91 sponsors strong. So 91 trails out there are sponsored by people in this community. This is what it looks like to be on a volunteer dig day with Mountain Trails. If you ever want to set something up with us, just let us know. And again, we are in the business of fun. This is what we do. <laughs> and if you need any proof of that, this is... Uh, our crew after the tour de suds. If you can't, you cannot get any more fun than that. <laughs> um, I, I, uh, I hope that that is short enough for this group. Visit us at mountaintrails.org, and if you have any questions, raise your hand or forever hold your peace. Here's time for a question or two. Okay, all right. Boss says I've got some time. Any questions out there? No, oh, Miles, they just want to go home. <laughs> <laughs> All right. well, thank you, thank you Laura. Okay, uh, as we end up here today, we have uh, our managers giving their thoughts on the day. Thank you all for being here and staying and being kind and paying attention, staying awake. Uh, at this point, you can fall asleep. It's okay. <laughs> we, we have... Park City Manager, and we have Summit County Manager, and who's going to go first? Let's probably go together. You're going to go together. Does this work? Uh, yeah, all right, all right, good. Since, yeah, that works. since we're in the city, we'll, we'll maybe start with the city. How about Sounds that? great. All right. Um, good afternoon. I, I was thinking that we're at the point where maybe we're at like a family wedding and we're between you and the buffet line to get out of here. 
Um, so we won't take a long time. Shane and I um, had a conversation before this, just thinking with the weather and everything, we would try to get, get you out of here. Um, our task today, I guess originally it was for closing statements, but that sounded too much like a judicial process or something like that. So it's really to wrap it up and get some feedback um, from you folks. But before we did, I wanted to just acknowledge Miles for a second. Um, I've worked with Miles for 10 years, and I think many of you have heard he has a 30-year history in this community. I realized uh, several members touched on it today. But this program and the leadership Park City program were really his brainchild. And um, they can't be all things to all people. There's things we could do differently. There's likely different topics that we could cover. But uh, you know, no one does it better than Miles. And so I just want to give him a round of applause. This may be his last one, so thank you. Thank you. And the other one is the Alumni Association for the Leadership Park City. I saw a bunch of folks in here, and I think that's an indication of that this is still a really valuable program. The fact that we had folks that went through our leadership program, some of them 10, 15, even 20 years ago, and I'm still seeing bits and pieces of them in the room. And I think that's an indicator that you know, this is a program that still provides yield and a positive benefit to the community. I also have a couple council members in the room. I saw the mayor in the hallway, so I wanna make sure I acknowledge folks. Chris Robinson from the county's back there. But um, so we'll just do a quick introduction and then maybe we'll try to do a little Q&A. Um, I will let Shane go first. You just wanna introduce yourself, a little bit about your background and how you got here? Uh, sure, thanks. Yeah, this is probably better, yeah. <clears throat> I'm the um, older, shorter, less handsome, less articulate uh, Matt Dias of Sonic County. <laughs> um, uh, I, I hit uh, my one year mark yesterday with Summit County, which was really exciting for me. In fact, this meeting last year was one of my very first uh, opportunities to introduce myself. Um, been uh, in the job one year, uh, uh, have the opportunity to live in uh, Silver Creek, which is a, a huge uh, opportunity for me and a huge blessing uh, to be this close. I was on the 40 this morning, just like everybody else, but uh, boy, it was sure nice to not have to come up from Kaysville, which is where I was living before this, in the middle of Davis County, uh, where I was the city manager for uh, seven years. So great, grateful to be here. And uh, I think this, uh, well, I think maybe we should start with Q&A after Matt maybe introduces himself a little bit more. Everybody probably knows Matt, but uh, once we do that, maybe after q and I, I think this is a, a good chance to uh, talk about what we talked about today and, and hopefully uh, wrap that up from the county and city perspective. Thanks, Shane. What, what Shane uh, isn't telling you is that Shane could work anywhere. Um, I mean, he could work anywhere. He's been a city manager for well over a decade. He could work in California, he could work in Texas. He could make a lot more money in a community that has a lot, a lot less friction, a lot less going on, but he chooses to be with us because Summit County is so dynamic. So we're very, very lucky that Shane chooses us and he's here. Um, it's my ninth year, almost 10th year with the municipality. I'm originally from Boston, Massachusetts, but I started coming out here when I was about 15 years old. So my family's always had a long uh, love for Park City and everything um, that it embodies. Um, I had spent probably 10 to almost 15 years in Washington, D.C. and in Boston, Massachusetts, working in various levels of government. So I've worked for a United States Senator, I've worked for a Congressman, I've worked for the executive branch and the administration. Um, after getting a master's degree, I decided that local government was a little bit more appealing to me. I, I was able to be closer to the constituents, closer to action plans and capital projects, and less just in a cubicle in Washington, D.C., moving around money, moving some paper. And I had a career in politics too, so less time in politics, more on the administrative side of things. Um, and so I was very fortunate 10 years ago, I had an opportunity to come back to Park City. They were recruiting a deputy city manager and I got that position about five years ago. Um, I moved up into the city manager position and just feel really, really lucky, obviously, to work for this community, a place that I've been coming to since I've been 15 years old. I work for a wonderful mayor and counselor and we have a really, really strong team. Um, I'm thinking what you learned today in terms of wrapping up and closing statements is that uh, this is easy, right? It's easy. All of these complex problems, all of these challenges, solving housing, solving for transportation, solving for equity, solving for education, uh, these are easy, right? The, the, these things are simple. We talk about them in the coffee shop, we talk about them in the supermarket, and um, hopefully what we demonstrated today is, although they're daunting, although they're incredibly complex, 
although they're very expensive challenges, we are the beneficiaries of having an incredible community of vertically integrated nonprofits, partners, stakeholders, local government, state government, and just individuals, quite frankly, that are moving here from around the country and bringing their talent with them. And so I would think at times, um, living in such a beautiful, amazing place, it can also be frustrating because everything looks beautiful. We have unbelievable recreation, unbelievable amenities, nightlife, music, culture, skiing, you name it. And it's very easy to sort of see problems and diagnose them as extremely frustrating. The traffic, the lack of affordability, trails get crowded. Um, I could go on and on and on. But the point I'm trying to make is, uh, in our community, the problems are so challenging. They are so daunting because we have such a love for this place. And so we are using this inclusive style of government, which can be slow. It can be deliberate. It's methodical. I mean, every day I come home and my wife yells at me why she's in traffic or why she had to wait and drop off for the kids or things are so expensive at the grocery store. But I'd argue the strategy in Park City is to work together, to be deliberate, to be inclusive, and that's the form of governance that we've created. Whether or not that's the right form of government, I think you're the judge of that, and the public's the, the judge of that, ultimately. But Park City's strategy has always been inclusion, communication, collaboration, and I imagine for you at times, that can be frustrating to be in such a beautiful place and have these hangnails from time to time of some of the challenges of living here. Um, what, what Shane will tell you about his former government, our former government is a mayor council former government in the city. And they have delegated some authority to me as the manager to be the day-to-day -day administrator. And um, that is an inclusive style of government. When I was back in Boston, I worked for a strong mayor. The mayor and council have all sorts of boards and commissions that they've delegated authority to. Planning commissions, historic preservation boards, recreation advisory boards, library boards, where this style of government is incredibly inclusive compared to other styles of government. Um, Shane's is a little bit different at the county level, and maybe you just want to talk about that for a second. Um, it's, I, I guess it's similar in that uh, the, the, the council has also delegated a lot to the, to the manager from an administrative perspective. Um, I've been used to working in cities, so I always had a mayor, even though there was often um, a, what they call a weak mayor, which didn't usually didn't have a, a vote on the board, uh, was still somebody who really set the direction of your community. And so, not having that in Summit County, we do we do defer a lot to um, our council generally, and also the um, the county chair specifically, which is Councilmember uh, Melina Stevens this year. So uh, we look we look to her this year as we did to Roger Armstrong last year to to lead a lot of our efforts. And um, for the most part, it works very well. We have a, a little bit unique you know, a lot of unique things in the county, just in the nature of counties. We have elected officials like our treasurer and our recorder that are independently elected that do not answer to the council or the, ma the manager. And with those, we just make a, a lot of effort to collaborate and work together. Uh, our county clerk is also in a part of leadership this year. Eve is here, so, um, and, and she's wonderful to work with. And for the most part, that works, works very well. So a lot of different nuances. Uh, this is a uh, 360 employees. Uh, how many does Park City have? Same. I think I think it's a, much more than that. But um, and we could start talking about budgets and things like that too. But uh, you guys like that have that conversation. But um, maybe the only other thing I would like to add is Matt just kind of alluded to, it, and I appreciate him mentioning that. Uh, if I have a takeaway from today, it's that we are talking about some really challenging things: housing, traffic, congestion, um, water. Um, you know, whatever it is, it, it can be really daunting. And I th we're all busy in this room. We all get, uh, we can easily get bogged down. And, but I wore uh, ski boots or ski shoes or snow boots to work today. And I went skiing last week for work. I mean, that, I mean, this is a really wonderful place to live. And, as, and I, I know we all know that. And I, but I think sometimes I take, it, take that for granted. And just being here recently, just this last year, has been a real... Uh, a wonderful opportunity for me. I'm, I'm very grateful for it. So when I get worried about things, I, I'm one that can really shut things off at night, I, five o'clock or whenever I get home. I'll maybe still work. Don't, don't get me wrong. My laptop's open at my house a lot, but uh, just ask my dog. But uh, I am one that can go to bed and go to sleep and, and not think about these things and then wake up in the morning and do it. So, and I, no? 
Um, I was going to ask Jana what she thinks, but uh, we'll, we'll leave the save that for another day. But yeah, and that, that's hard. So I'm grateful for that. So you know, to sort of wrap things up, our thinking was the things that you heard today that you have some additional questions about, are there items that you want to advise us on next year that you think next year's group should learn more about or hear more about, or something that's kind of hanging on the tip of your tongue that you said, what about or what if? And I think Shane and I are here to take any questions that you might have as we try to wrap it up. You want to maybe? Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to ask, uh, not on any of the leadership stuff, just a direct question to you guys as managers. Um, you guys talk a lot about collaboration, and I'm just curious, is there any one particular thing that actually is a really big challenge? Like, oh, compared to how we collaborate on transit or we collaborate on all these other things, this one thing for this weird, obscure political reason or for some reason, is there anything that's just tough between Park City and Summit County? Good question for the county manager. <laughs> Well, when you said that, I wasn't thinking between Summit County and Park City because I think we do collaborate quite well. My first thought was the differences that Summit County specifically, including Park City, have with maybe the rest of Utah. So maybe legislatively we might have some challenges there. We maybe don't agree on a lot of philosophical or social issues that might sometimes get us in trouble with the, trouble with the legislature. Um, that's, that's you know one thing that came to me. I also mentioned specifically as a county, we work to collaborate together internally with with our elected officials. So maybe I just reiterate that too. That's it's it, it can be challenging. I think right now we have really good elected officials that we're are a pleasure to work with. But that can be something that's really challenging. It's easier when I work with somebody. If I if I if they work for me, I can say, "Will you do it this way?" And they get to do it that way. And there there are repercussions or there are rewards for doing it that way. When I work with elected officials that, in, that are independently elected by, by the populace, they have no incentive to work with me except for collaboration and doing good things and making good decisions. So that's, that's really important for me too. I don't think I can answer that question better than that. So I won't, you I have agree, hundred percent, I agree. You have the history of Summit County and Park City that when they maybe, have they always gotten together? Yeah, no, I, I guess well? I would say maybe I'm gonna, we should come over here that way we're just not in the corner, I would think. But uh, perhaps historically some of, I think the historical growth issues might've been areas that there's been friction in the past. You know, the county is the size of what, the state of Rhode Island and a quarter of Connecticut. Um, so the county is this huge area of unincorporated land, and within the county you have these incorporated areas like Park City and Camas and Francis, and sometimes there's friction between this organization that's managing tens and thousands of acres of land and these small incorporated areas that are providing an elevated level of service. Um, and I would say it's a constructive tension or friction, and so there have been times in the past where the city and county have agreed about development and growth and our goals have been a little bit different. But I would say in particular in my decade or so here, our goals have really been aligned because we're working on you know, mitigating a lot of these challenges together and we've realized that if we're not together on them, then we're working against each other. We don't wanna be under the whole divide and conquer that will often happen in land use games and business games. And so for the last decade or so, we've really been tied at the hip. Good question. Anything else you heard today? Yeah. Uh, on affordable housing, how or what are you guys looking to determine what is affordable? Good question. So um, I think both the county and the city have traditionally used AMI. It's, it's a national measure of affordability in cities and towns. Um, and to be fair, we've started considering some other metrics because Park City's AMI is so high. You basically take all the average incomes and you say, generally, this is an affordable rate. You'd say 80% of that, of that income is an affordable rate in a community. I have some experience back east being in a large city, and that was a very fair metric of an affordable way to live through the community. In Park City, we're learning that may not be the case. The... Um, the, the, the difference in incomes in our community can be so grand and so great that the higher incomes really screw, skew this number. And so we're thinking about workforce wage is another measure. Um, there's a lot of different ways of looking at it. Traditionally, both of our organizations have used AMI, but we're, you know, I think everything is on the table at this point because we understand it's a challenge here in particular. It's also a challenge in a lot of the resort towns across North America. We're not the only one. If you look at the Breckenridges, if you look at Crested Butte, communities in the Tahoe area, they're also looking at whether this AMI is an accurate 
indicator of affordability in their community moving forward. Anything else on that? I guess the only other thing I would add is, um, and I don't want to pop, you know, pat ourselves on the back too much, but this is, we are uniquely um, making an effort to address affordable housing in Summit County, in my opinion, based on what I've seen in other cities and communities in Utah. I think some would say the way that we get more affordable housing is just in increasing the housing stock. And that's probably going to do something. That's probably going to move the needle somewhat. But, but deed-restricted affordable housing, and we can talk about what affordable means. If it's 40% AMI or 80% AMI. Deed-restricted affordable housing is, is an extra effort that I think we really, really uh, prioritize here in our, in our community that's, that's very, very important. And, and I think that's a, a real positive step. And, and hopefully they told you today, Park City Municipal has the longest running housing authority in the entire state of Utah. It's over 30 years old. Park City and Summit County have led the way. Whether we're caught up, no. I mean, just to be perfectly clear and accountable, we are not caught up, but we were there in the beginning, sort of leading the way in the state of Utah. There's another question back here. What is the AMI? Oh, help me out. What is the AMI? Well over 100,000, probably 140s, 130s, 140s. I don't have the number offhand, but so clearly these higher incomes, what is it? That sounds really high. No, I think that's right. Family of four, one, $142,000. So those upper incomes are really, you know, just meddling with this metric that most communities use with a fair level of, of uh, stability and predictability. Anything else? Good question. Yeah. Good question. So the question over here was about child care initiatives. Um, you want to take this one? <laughs> All right. So child care. Child care initiative. Lately, um, this is an issue that I think both in Summit County and Park City in particular has really elevated its profile. There was um, certain elements that happened at the federal level with the feds that were providing through the COVID crisis, a bunch of stability money or stabilization money. That money has... Um, is no longer coming to the state of Utah and is no longer coming to local cities and towns. And so uh, both the county and the city have been contemplating ways to step up and try to stabilize the industries here in, 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 where, you know, in our homes and where we live in our neighborhoods and provide more seats. So it's one thing to stabilize the existing providers. It's another thing to try to create more space and more room and more seats. And there are initiatives underway, I think, with both of our organizations. Recently, the city allocated a million dollars where we have a child care subsidy program. It's a pilot program, but it's controversial. I don't, I don't want to oversimplify. That sounds great. It is great. We're working hard. It's the right thing to do, but there's not a day goes by that someone doesn't knock on my door and say, you have no business subsidizing child care. Government doesn't belong in that. That's not the role of government. Get out of it. Let the market provide this service. So this is a very controversial issue. We made a pilot program for that reason. We wanted to test the market, see if we could make a difference. We want it to be measurable. We think it'll work. We don't know if it'll work. We've emulated some of the things that they're doing in other communities. But it's a fairly controversial issue. Anything you want to add on that? Just, just from the county perspective, we also have tried to just dip our toes in the water. We just barely adopted our fiscal year 24 budget. We did allocate some funding, uh, not a million dollars, but some to this to this effort. And we would like to work with Park City on meeting that need. We also took an, a, 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 trying to address the child care needs in our internal organization, in our within within those that work for us. So we've tried to help uh, that as well and hope that other businesses and organizations will also take that child care mantle up in their own uh, organizations as well. So. That's something we probably could talk about all day, though. All right, you're the proctor now. That way all you right. get the next question. I think there was a, I think Betsy, said one. yeah. So uh, today was just really outstanding. I can't thank you enough. I'm going to have the conference was really great. Uh, the one that um, really struck me the most was that the um, Utah I think it's I think it's good feedback. Ironically, I was with Phil 
uh, Bondurat just a, a couple of hours ago, and I said, do you participate in Leadership 101? And he said, Miles has had him come in here before, and, and that's been a, a, something they've done in the past. So maybe, or at least from our health department perspective, maybe something we could do. Is there another one over here? So one more. Last chance. All right. Appreciate you. Thank, well, thank you for being here today. Thanks, guys. Okay. So as we wrap up today, thank you all uh, for everything. I learned that the, um, you know, make a few announcements at the end, but on March uh, 18th, we're going to have this panel, and we're going to advertise it widely. It'll be at the Santee Auditorium in the evening, 7 to 9. So if you want to hear about what other resort towns have been doing, how they're coping with things. I'll have friends of mine, all of whom I've known 50 years or more, from Aspen, Telluride, Jackson, Ketchum, Sun Valley, and here in Park City, talking about their experiences and how they're dealing with the very same issues we're dealing with. So I want to do that. Uh, so that's in, in March. Uh, I want to say again that we are videotaping this session today. So if you want to look at it or if someone missed it, wants to see it, it'll be on the city's website, parkcity.org. And uh, if you click on leadership, is that right, Daniel, leadership? Okay, we can do that. Um, you know, the leadership program is, is a partnership program. So we've housed it in the city all these years because I was the planning director. I started out as the planning director in Park City, hired in 1986. So it's been a great home all these years and it'll continue there. But the partners have been the county, the city, the ski resorts, the chamber, a lot of the nonprofit organizations that exist in town. So it really is a partnership organization, and I want to thank all of them. Certainly, uh, the lesson I've learned in leadership more than about anything else is that you should always end by thanking people. So I want to thank the hospital, which has been really kind to us all the years that they've had the center here letting us use it. And, uh, and when I got here seven this morning, they were already setting up the food and everything. And with the snow, they made it here. And, they, and the, some of the people drove up from Orem to be here that early. So I don't, maybe they went up to three in the morning. I'm not quite sure. Uh, I want to thank um, Daniel, who's been here taping. And thank God, you need somebody in their like 20s or 30s to do the computers. I, I don't care, you know. Every time I do it, I screw it up. So I want to thank them. <clears throat> I certainly want to thank all the speakers. Um, as I said, I've been doing um, this program for 28 years, but the, the leadership program is 30 years old. I think the first time I did it, <clears throat> I was the only one that knew how to do a PowerPoint show. So you could see, I mean, probably by next year, <coughs> with Jill Gaudet teaching all this stuff at the school, there'll be like holograms up here or robots here or something like that. Um, most of all, though, um, I really want to thank Paige Galvin, who's in the back. Who... <laughs> she, she, along with, in the city, it's, has been my partner and administers the, the program and makes sure that everything works well. And she does an outstanding job, and she's going to continue. As was mentioned, uh, this is my last year of directing the program. And we will be hiring uh, a new director for the program. And hopefully, we'll have that person on board in the middle of March so that we can spend a number of months. I'll finish out this class, which will end at the end of September. So there'll be a, a nice, smooth transition. And this, this kind of thing, Leadership 101, will continue. Um, I can tell you it's been a tremendous honor for me over the last 30 years. And I've actually worked for the city 36 years. And my career goes back to 1970. So it's a, a long career. And it's time for me, you know, I, every time I watch the television, I say, oh, look at Biden. He can't remember who he's talking to. Look at Trump, the old guy, you know. And they are. <laughs> and so am I. <laughs> I'm older than, than Trump. But I'm a little younger than Biden. You know, you just, and guess what? You can't remember stuff anymore. It's just the way it works. So any of you think you're so smart, just wait a few years. <laughs> you'll, you'll see how that is. Um, it's been a great day. And really, the, the quality of the speakers um, has just been fabulous. Someone saying something nasty back there or what? 
<laughs> write me in. <laughs> Chris, yeah, you can write me in. <laughs> no, uh, no, my son, my son, I have a grown son, and uh, this year I got Uggs. That was the final straw for him. <laughs> that, that did it. He said, Dad, you shouldn't be here in the winter anymore if you have to wear Uggs. So uh, I'm taking that to heart. Uh, thank you all for coming. Don't leave anything here. And uh, hopefully we'll see you. And for the class, please leave your name tags with Paige in the back. But you know, we don't like to recycle those. We like to give them out at each thing. So thank you. Be safe going home. I don't know what the traffic's like out there, but be safe. <laughs>